Audiobook title Vampire Reincarnation, 01-28, by Fabio Kuhn. This work belongs to author Fabio Kuhn. Source Scribblehub.com. Chapter 1. What is there to protect? Screams of pain and agony resounded in the wheat field. Its once golden brown color was now covered in the crimson of red fresh blood, and a nauseating stench of decomposing bodies and coppery iron lingered on the corpse-littered battlefield. The sound of crushed bones echoed in the distance as the ground shuddered under the footsteps of a horde of orcs, advancing slowly towards a fortress city besieged by hundreds of different monsters. The fortress's southern walls were surrounded by spikes made of wood and metal, the only free space was the front of the tightly shut wooden gate. Beyond it was a city filled with villagers, farmers, carpenters, salesmen, smiths, and hunters. Dust filled the empty commercial streets as every one of them rushed towards the northern gate, hoping to escape the claws of death. The soldiers outside the walls did their best to push back against the ravaging army of monsters, in hopes of stalling for a bit more time so that their families could escape. Among them was a young woman wearing iron armor, her brown eyes burning brightly as she killed a goblin with a swing of her iron sword. The creature's purple body quickly turned red before its explosion sent blood and organs flying everywhere. The girl let out a grunt of displeasure with a disgusted expression. I wish I were allowed to fight the orcs and demons as well, these things, they're so disgusting even after they die. She voiced her thoughts as another goblin lunged at her, casually swinging her sword at the creature. Master is too protective. She said as her head turned upwards, her short brown hair fluttering as her eyes fixed on a man in one of the lookout towers. The man wore a black cloak that accentuated his sapphire blue eyes, and his black, long hair was tied into a ponytail that swayed gently with the wind. Soft rays of sunlight bounced off his beautiful pale skin, and his left hand held the hilt of an exquisitely crafted purple sword tied to his waist. He was talking with a burly old man whose short stature complemented his well-built body. His natural white hair was cut short, and a patch of baldness already started to appear in the center of his head. He wore simple linen clothes, damaged by the river of time as they were covered in cuts and holes. Their expressions were grim as they watched the battlefield with worry. Sometimes they would bring a transparent ring close to their mouth, giving out orders in an attempt to change the course of battle in their favor. However, things looked bleak. The young man's hand stopped midway as his eyes widened. He ran to the edge of the tower and jumped off, his dark boots glowing with a faint blue light as he kicked up dust when landing. The young woman's pupils widened as she watched the sudden turn of events. Master? A scream of terror made her turn her head towards the battlefield, where a few dozen figures of the gigantic orcs made her step back as her body jolted in fear. The orcs infiltrated our back line, magicians, what are you doing? A deep voice rang in her ears, her eyes quickly dashing towards its source. A man dressed in black armor yelled commands from atop a horse, his hoarse voice amplified by spells. Magician, fire! As he gave the command, dozens of fireballs shot toward the orcs, instantly burning half their body as they turned to ashes. The orcs were quick to act, and as the fire raged they cut off a limb and threw it forward. The limb would then dig itself into the ground and a new orc would reappear in a matter of seconds. Commander, there are too many enemies. We can't keep up. One of the magicians told the black armored man as he took a deep breath. At this rate, we won't be able to. My and mom. My sister. What will we do? He stammered as his voice rose into a shout of panic, his doubts remaining mostly unspoken behind his clenched jaw. Lad, we'll be fine, just keep dash. His sentence was cut short by a shockwave in the middle of the battlefield. His head snapped towards the source and his pupils widened, reflecting a huge hundred-meter barrier, connected to the ground and the monsters by hundreds of red threads. His breathing became ragged as his throat dried up, his agape mouth unable to utter any sound. He tightened his grip on the horse's reins and pulled out his wand, sending a red beam of light high into the sky. The hundreds of human soldiers looked up at the sky with terror before retreating towards the gate. That's the signal for the retreat. Have we lost? The young girl bit her lower lip as she cut down another goblin, her hand trembling as she held the hilt of her bloodied sword. The red barrier trembled once again, its red hue accompanied by a blue fiery storm that rose into the sky. The blue flames dispersed as soon as they appeared, revealing a huge hole in the red barrier. The hundreds of crimson threads pulsated wildly as they absorbed the blood from the thousands of corpses and fed it to the barrier. Is that master's magic? 
she said. Her brown pupils trembled as dozens more spells bombarded the barrier, turning the sky into a polychromy of different colors. A sharp swishing sound rang in her ears as a huge sword of light appeared in the sky, falling towards the red threads, instantly severing them. Hundreds of fire-covered rocks shot towards the bloody barrier, creating another hole that the young man tried to push through. Just as he was about to pass inside, a small demon that stood in the middle of the circle let out a sudden, sharp screech that made him pause briefly. The demon exploded at that moment, its flesh, bones, and blood mixing into a red goo that shot toward the barrier, instantly closing the passage. At the same time, the severed threads joined back together, resupplying the barrier with energy. He bit his lips, causing fresh blood to fall down his chest. He suddenly stepped back as the magic circle inside the barrier suddenly grew brighter, sucking all the mana from the surroundings at a rapid pace. The young girl's hair stood on end as she felt her blood flow backward inside her veins. Master Kai! A low cry for help escaped her lips as she, along with a dozen others that were closer to the magic circle fell to the ground, convulsing as blood sipped through their skin, rushing towards the magic circle. All the goblins, orcs, lizardmen, magical beasts, dark elves, and demi-humans fell to the ground, their bodies exploding and transforming into a red goo that similarly rushed at the barrier. Kai's head snapped back as his ears twitched, his blue eyes trembling as he saw the young girl fall to the ground. The fiery red wand adorned with six prismatic crystals trembled in his hand, a sharp screech escaping from within its body. He let out a low sigh and swished his wand, the dark ring on his index finger glowing slightly as the wand disappeared from his grasp. His hands clenched into a fist and his long hair flew wildly about as a strong gust of wind circled his body, kicking up dust. A dense amount of mana slowly escaped his body, creating an oppressive aura that sent shivers down the spines of the remaining demons. His black cloak tore into pieces as his muscles expanded, shiny silver scales covering his body. A morbid sound of tearing flesh resounded on the battlefield as a pair of wings grew from his back, as well as a tail with a sharpened tip. His fingers transformed into sharp claws, his long hair turned a similar silver color as his skin, and his blue eyes became a dark crimson red. A pair of sharp fangs grew in the place of his canines and he let out a loud, primordial roar that echoed into the distance as two horns sprouted from his head. The wind came to a slowing lull as it calmed down and his extensive draconic transformation was completed. The dust settling, his loose hair now released from the constraints of its band, running down his unblemished silver back. He raised his right hand and his claws arched upward, trembling violently as a huge amount of mana gathered at their tips. The mana exploded silently and a small, invisible sphere that increased in size little by little, cementing its place and disturbing the light around it. His muscular body trembled as it resisted the sphere's gravitational force. Kai shot up into the air, his wings creating a strong gust of wind that blew the corpses backward and disrupted the magic circle's blood absorption, freeing the human soldiers from its grasp. The invisible sphere at the tip of his claws grew larger and larger, the light around it bending unnaturally as he fed it increasingly more mana. His cold eyes closely examined it measuring every little bit of energy absorbed by it until he flicked his hand, the strange spell dashed towards the barrier, the space around it bending as it traveled in the air. It effortlessly passed through the barrier and shot toward the middle of the magic circle, partially destroying it and absorbing any stray demon it came into contact with. He pointed at the spell with his scaly finger, and he commanded in a language long forgotten. Shimosi! He instantly dashed back towards the soldiers grabbing any that could still be saved on his way to the fortress gate, where most of them gathered. He swiped at the sky and several black barriers surrounded him and the humans, as well as the front of the fortress. A deafening explosion appeared in the distance as the spell released all the energy, dirt and debris flew everywhere due to the shockwave. The bloody field of wheat was overturned by the explosion, and what remained of the monsters rained down from the sky in a morbid spectacle. The soldier girl stared at Kai with widened eyes, her mouth agape as she barely let out a question, her voice barely above a whisper. Master, who are you? 20. Chapter 2. A White Speck of Light. The pouring rain drowned out the sound of his footsteps, and water splashed everywhere as his fatigued legs stepped into the muddy puddles. Any trace of his steps was long washed away by the rain. His right hand was glued to his face, 
and blood sipped through his fingers before being washed away. The young man rushed through the dark alley, adrenaline coursing through his veins, feeding his muscles with much-needed energy. He grunted as he stumbled on a pile of trash, falling face-first on the ground. A group of three men gave chase behind him with relaxed expressions, their slow and rhythmic footsteps ringing in the young man's ears as he got up, his frightened face decorated by a freshly cut wound. Salted rain fell down his cheeks. His terror-filled eyes reflected the dim light from around the corner. A relieved smile manifested on his lips as he turned the corner with a soft sigh. He raised his head, his relief cut short by a sudden realization there was no escape. The light in front of him came from a long pole, situated behind a tall and moldy wall. He snapped his head back to the three men walking towards him as if they were strolling in a park. His face darkened and countless thoughts rushed through his head. Was I being led around this whole time? The men's footsteps echoed in his ears like a church's bell at the hour of dawn. He felt death's cold grasp approach his neck. Helplessness, terror, and regret all mixed together with the desire to live that burned in his soul. All of these emotions manifested on his face as it twisted unnaturally. His widened pupils stared at the three men that would send him to meet his mother. He clenched his fists and took on a fighting stance, as his eyes filled with determination and his muscles with rage. One man let out an involuntary scoff and another pulled out a short switch knife which still had some of his prey's fresh blood on its rusty blade. He stepped forward, brandishing his knife as his emotionless eyes stared coldly at the young man. One step, two steps, three steps. Just two more. The young man counted his attacker's footsteps as he waited to be within range. His fists trembled, and he gritted his teeth as the fifth step appeared. He punched with all his might in an arc, like a crescent moon, towards the attacker's face, whose eyes followed the trajectory. He stepped back, the punch passing by his nose as the young man fell forwards. Without hesitation, the knife pierced his neck, and blood gushed out everywhere like a leaking pipe. Why? He closed his eyes and let out a last silent breath as the man pulled out the knife from his lifeless body, wiping its blade with a crimson-dyed napkin that he threw on the ground. The sun rose and fell as the body lay in the remote alley, and the nauseating stench of its decomposing flesh finally caught the attention of the authorities. The boy was quickly identified and a small funeral was held, the sobbing of a single woman echoed in the empty church. Just above it, high in the clouds stood a mass of calm white light, blending perfectly with the soft clouds. It lay motionless, small bits of its body breaking off and drifting into the distance every time it pulsated. Huh! The speck of light jolted awake, faint images flashing inside its rotund body. Images of a woman and a man, of blood and death, and where am I? Didn't I? Is this heaven then? The images stopped as the speck of light moved about as it tried to make sense of the cloudy surroundings. This feels weird. It walked to the edge of the cloud and found itself surrounded by a white void, unable to see the mortal world. Hmm? It looked into the distance where a multitude of colors slowly approached its direction. Most of them were white but there were some green and red ones mixed within. They dashed toward the cloud it was in and seamlessly passed through its watery mass. However, once they touched the speck of light, it vibrated violently as it absorbed the color. Hundreds of color fragments bombarded its body as all of them entered its rotund mass, mixing within, turning the terrified white speck darker. Aya, what is this? It hurts. It hurts. Who are these people? Who the speck's thoughts died down its rotund body trembling violently as the last of the wave passed it by. It stood motionless once again, the dark color slowly disappearing as it turned to darker white. After a few minutes, a bright light shone upon the speck, and a white, humanoid figure landed next to it. It circled the rotund speck as it played with its fingers, its blank face covered with worry. Crap, I fucked up this time. He will be so angry. It picked up the speck and flew upward, the light disappearing along with it. Oh? The pain, it's gone. The white speck of light's consciousness slowly awakened, and the deep voice of a man and the soft voice of a woman rang in his mind as its vision slowly became clearer. In front of it stood two white silhouettes. One resembled a tall and slightly fat man while the other resembled the slim and sexy figure of a woman. Their loud voices echoed in the empty void. Come on Lumi, please take this one as well. How am I supposed to explain this to him? The man pleaded with the womanly figure, his deep voice trembling slightly as he finished his sentence. The woman let out a long, 
exasperated Saya as her hand flew to her forehead. Yerman, how many souls have you given me so far? Not only that, but the other gods are getting tired of your lazy angels as well. Our worlds are advancing too rapidly because of this. But Lumi, the man paused briefly, thinking carefully about his next words. He said he would lower my faith energy. If the population diminishes now they will never be able to explore space. Please, just take this one too. You said that last week as well. Her yell rang in the white speck's mind, who silently watched the exchange between the two godlike figures. Ahem. It let out a low grunt, and the two gods' heads snapped toward him. Oh? The woman stopped her yelling and her head snapped to its location. He's awake! She said as she approached him, picking him up effortlessly. Now what? The man asked, standing next to her. I guess I'll take him. She sighed, feeling defeated. She turned her attention toward the boy, bringing him up to where her eyes were supposed to be. Well, there is no nice way to say this, you're dead. The boy, as if rolling his eyes, said, No shit. The two silhouettes moved their heads slightly backward, feeling surprised by the boy's lack of respect. Kid, do you even dash? The female raised her voice as she started berating the boy, but the man stopped her mid-sentence. She let out a grunt before she continued. I'm sorry kid, your guardian angel made a mistake and now your soul is incomplete, you will need to be transferred to another world. Do I have a say in this? He asked, his tone slightly hesitant. No. The female voice answered instantly. No. She continued. You can choose between a variety of races, humans, orcs, goblins, demons, elves, demi-humans, lizard men, dwarves, mermaids, nymphs, ghosts, ancient beasts, eons, and vampires. I have to warn you though, vampires are like playing a game on hard mode. Did you put the whole RPG genre in there? He asked jokingly. And no. The goddess's voice cracked as she replied anxiously. So I hit the nail on the head? Enough with your comments, tell me which one you chose so I can get this over with. She commanded hurriedly, in an attempt to hide her embarrassment. I want to be a vampire, how bad can it be? The two gods stared at each other, and then at the boy before the goddess asked. Are you sure? It's not the fantasy you may think it is. Yeah, it could be interesting. I just want a simple life though, nothing too complicated. The goddess shook her head but in the end, she flicked her hand in front of the boy and he disappeared, her voice echoing in his mind. Fine, but don't regret it later. Also, you won't remember anything, hopefully. A short moment later her and Yerman's figure materialized in the white void. She wore a white robe that accentuated her form and her perfect skin sparkled under the halo of light behind her. She had long flocks of blue hair, and her golden eyes shone with intense holy light. A look of surprise manifested on her face as she murmured under her breath. Hmm? That family. He should be fine, hopefully. I. Why is everything hopefully when it comes to Yerman? She gave the guardian angel a stern look of displeasure before her body disappeared, without even saying goodbye to the other god. The angel didn't notice her behavior. However, as his eyes lingered on the boy's soul until he disappeared, that soul was really weird. Despite how many memories it should have lost, he was way heavier than any other. And usually young souls are pure white, for some reason he had a lot of colors mixed in. 8. Chapter 3, Reborn Deep in a remote corner of a vast and vibrant continent lay a land unlike any other. It was shrouded by dark clouds and its only source of water was a black and murky river that flowed through its heart. This was the Vampire Kingdom, a place devoid of life and lush vegetation. The only sign of greenery was a massive forest that stretched across one side of the continent to the other. Beyond that lay the Kingdom of Aravaya, home to the human race. Hundreds of derelict houses covered the dry land, and most of the occupied buildings lay between the walls of a massive city fortress. Wooden brick houses were densely packed together, and the roads that were barely wide enough for a carriage to pass through were silent and empty, save for a few shops. A lone house stood in the southern corner of this fortress, the area around it clean of any houses. A stray bird wandered into the area, and once it got within 1,000 meters of the house, it disappeared, reappearing on the other side. Inside the house, in a room on the first floor, a baby lay motionless in the arms of a woman, whose eyes were drenched in tears. His open eyes had a blank look, and his breathing was slow and uneven. Ray, our son, he... A man embraced the woman tightly, his red eyes filled with worry as he assured his wife. 
Dear, don't worry, our son will be alright, isn't that right, Ellie? He said with a doting smile creasing his lips, his head turning toward the woman standing next to them, her emerald green eyes focusing on the unresponsive baby. She approached the bed, kneeling in front of the baby, touching his forehead, her delicate hand emitting a pale green light as it ran down his body. Her pointy ears twitched briefly and she let out a frustrated sigh. His body is healthy, there isn't any problem at the neurological level either, I. I'm sorry I don't understand what's wrong. She stood up, avoiding the other woman's gaze. I will need to bring my mother, please wait a few minutes. She excused herself and left the worried couple as she rushed out the door. The woman holding the baby turned her head toward her husband, her crimson eyes reflecting the pain in her heart. She bit her lip as tears dripped down her cheeks. The man brought his hand to her face, wiping her tears away as he kissed her forehead and whispered, Don't worry, he's our son, I'm sure he'll be fine. The woman's face lit up slightly as she nodded softly, waiting patiently for Ellie to return. The reincarnated boy's eyes opened with difficulty, the world around him blurry and difficult to make out. It looks like it worked, and I retained my memories. He thought as he tried to move his head and hands. Huh, why can't I move? He tried looking around but his eyes were unresponsive, the only thing meeting his eyes being the wooden ceiling. His ears buzzed as three voices rang in his mind, barely hearing their foreign language. What's going on? His thoughts raced in his head as he struggled to make sense of the situation, fear taking over his consciousness. It was then that the voice of a woman echoed in his ears, she spoke in a language that he didn't understand. But the worry and love in her tone relied on a feeling that was beyond words. Mom. Next, he heard a man's deep, confidence-filled voice that spoke to the woman with a tender tone. The boy couldn't see this man's face but just hearing the hidden feelings of love, pride and worry in his almost shaky voice told him everything he needed to know. Dad. Before he could process these new feelings, however, he felt a slight pressure on his forehead, accompanied by the hazy figure of a woman. Her long and pointy ears passed through her blonde hair that reached down to her waist, a pair of short bangs covering part of her emerald green eyes that looked at him with worry. An elf? A faint green light dashed past his blurry vision, and he felt a burning sensation spread over his body. Her soothing voice entered his ears as she removed her soft hand, her panic tone lingering in his ears before he heard a loud thump. A few moments later he felt a sharp, soul-crushing pain fill his entire head, then spread swiftly through his body. His blood vessels pulsated violently as his whole body turned red. This pain, just like back then, the minutes passed as he silently endured, his body is unable to yell or scream as much as he willed it to. The only things helping him fight the pain were two pairs of voices and a gentle light that gave him the slightest bit of relief. Eventually, his mind went blank and his vision went dark. The pain stopped. He couldn't feel anything anymore, nor could he think, Calmness overtook his soul as images flashed in his mind. Mother. He blinked, his heavy eyelids slowly letting light touch his red irises. A soft light from a lamp touched his delicate skin as a subconscious smile manifested on his face. Am I awake? His eyes closed once again, his exhausted, pain-free mind falling into slumber. A few hours later, his eyes opened once again, and his hand twitched as he managed to move it in front of his eyes. I'm awake. The pain is gone and I can see clearly. His thoughts exploded into a loud cheer before a sudden realization hit him. I'm a baby. Dear our, our son, he moved. The stammering voice of a woman entered his ears, relief, and excitement clear in her shaky voice. Tears ran down her red cheeks as she looked at her husband who was staring at the boy, his white teeth shining through his bright smile. He did. Ha ha, our son is healthy. He said as he rushed to pick him up, tears escaping his trembling eyes. The boy's head flew slightly backward before being caught by a rough, large hand, and his vision blurred as he found himself being held by a big pair of hands. What's going on? He moved his eyes around as he tried to make sense of his surroundings, his vision fixating on the man that held him up. His little pupils expanded slightly as he inspected the man's appearance, and he quickly recognized him as the owner of the voice. Dad? His mind shook with emotion as he fixated on the man's face, warmth spreading all over his body as he saw the tears flowing down his cheeks. A shiver ran down his spine as memories of his past life flashed in his mind. Was that man my dad? Or the other one? Both? 
He couldn't remember anyone that showed him such fatherly love, care, and worry. But the man in front of him showed him all of those things, felt pain for him, and cried for him. When was the last time? His father had black, short hair, and a raspy beard of the same color. His watery eyes shared the same color as his a dark crimson red. The man's smile revealed the small pair of sharp fangs between his pearly teeth. Look, honey, he's looking at me. He shouted in happiness as his wife wiped her tears with a handkerchief. Despite not understanding the language, the boy smiled back at his father, whose eyes beamed with excitement. Ha ha! The father laughed loudly, his eyes filled with pride. Look at how handsome my son is! His wife smiled with embarrassment, but laughed together with him before he handed the boy to her. The woman's long and straight silver hair fell to her chest, and it reflected the faint light of the white crystals fixated on the yellowish stone wall. Her long eyelashes trembled as her big crimson eyes tenderly looked at the small baby in her hands, and her plump lips formed into a hearty smile. Unfiltered tears of joy flowed down her cheeks like a waterfall as she tightly held the baby to her chest, and her entire body trembled in happiness as she tried to calm her breathing. Her lips trembled as they parted and her soft voice rang in the boy's ears as she said with a shaky voice, My baby, mother don't cry. The boy tried to raise his hand to wipe her tears but his short arm couldn't reach her tears. She smiled and brought her face close to his hand, taking it into her own, completely covering it. It's so small. Her thoughts escaped her face as she let out a light chuckle that eventually turned into laughter. His father joined them, and he took them both into his embrace, his large stature casting a shadow over the both of them. The door opened with a loud thud, and two people barged into the room causing the couple's hearts to stop for a second. 8. Chapter 4. A New World The couple turned around to see Ellie and her mother rush nervously through the door. Ellie, has the professor arrived? The mother asked after her mind cleared. Yes, Elena, my mother called him over as soon as she could. Ellie said, her flushed face covered in sweat. This is Professor Arthur, the dual class mage. She pointed with her trembling hand toward an old man wearing a midnight black robe decorated with golden stars. Pleasure to meet you, he said in a husky voice as he took off his comically large wizard hat. His disheveled hair was painted in a natural white color, and his long and stuffy beard adorned the same sign of old age. He approached the couple, the floor creaking under his weight and inspected the boy. I say, he looks quite healthy to me, he quipped as he took out a long wooden stick its color akin to that of ash, decorated by six small crystals of two different colors. The wand glowed with a faint light as he hastily murmured something under his breath, and a gentle blue light enveloped the boy. Arthur's green eyes lit up slightly as they inspected the baby. His pupils widened slightly and a small smile manifested on his dried lips. Interesting. He flicked his wand and the light disappeared, the room returned to normal as the boy glared at him. Arthur chuckled slightly before he turned his attention to Elena. He is as healthy as can be, and he will continue to be in the future. Now, he looked at the couple eagerly. What will you name him? Elena and her husband glanced at each other as they nodded with their eyes, turning their attention towards the baby as she said with a loving smile. Kai, his name will be Kai. The old magician's lips formed into a wide smile as he laughed heartily. That's a fine name. Six months have passed since Kai was born and his facial features started resembling his mother more than his father's. His hair grew to be a beautiful silver color, just like Elena's but his eyes and eyebrows were sharp, more like his father, Ray. Come on Kai, you can do it! His father called out to him from a few dozen centimeters away, beckoning Kai, who rolled his eyes internally, to come toward him. He stood up from his crawling position and did his best to walk forward, his body wobbling from side to side as he balanced his weight on his noodle-like legs. One, two, going well so far. He counted his steps as his eyes focused on the ground. Three, four, I'm almost there. Ray's arms were within his reach. All that was left was one more step and he would have done it. However, thud, his fifth step failed and he lost balance as he fell in his father's arms. I failed. His face reddened with shame as he failed at something he had been doing for 16 years. A large hand rustled his hair as he jolted in surprise. He looked up to see his father's bearded face smile brightly at him. You almost did it son, good job. He praised Kai as he lifted him in the air. The boy, taken aback, 
didn't know how to respond, and he couldn't either as he didn't understand the language. He just smiled back at his father, something which would always make him beam with joy. The door creaked open and the two looked at the figure leaning against the frame with a wooden spoon in hand. All right, you two, dinner is ready. Stop playing and come eat. Elena called them to the kitchen, where a bowl of soup and a plate of vegetables awaited them on the round table. Ray rushed to the kitchen, its walls made out of the same yellow stone that the rest of the house was made of. The walls and ceiling were supported by a few thick wooden beams and the gray stone floor reflected the light of the magic stones from the chandelier. He placed Kai on a taller, wooden baby seat and sat down next to him, eagerly waiting for Elena to finish setting up the table. The boy let his eyes wander around, inspecting the surroundings and furniture with a curious gaze. Kai was surprised to find that the house remained warm despite the lack of insulation, but he wasn't quite sure why. The kitchen wasn't fancily decorated but still had the usual equipment, a stone stove that doubled as an oven powered by a fire magic stone, a fridge-like object that used an ice magic stone to keep food fresh, and a sink. The entire house was illuminated by light magic stones that were either carved into a chandelier or placed like a torch on the wall. At night his mother would turn them off with magic or his father would simply cover the few of them located in the bedroom. It seems like they replaced electricity with magic. Kai concluded after inspecting these weird inventions for a while. However, with this answer a new question formed in his mind. How did these modern creations end up in such a medieval house? Could more people have retained their memories? As he sat on the wooden chair and after inspecting everything, he came to a conclusion that excited him more than anything else. We must be rich. The house was made out of thick black wood and a beautiful yellow stone with a window in every room. It had a ground floor, where the kitchen, bathroom, living room, and a back door to an immense garden were, and the first floor where two bedrooms and a shower were located. Come to think of it, how does plumbing work in this world? His eyes dashed toward a locked door that his parents never used, his hands itching with anticipation at the thought of finding out what hid behind it. A sharp thud broke his train of thought, and his eyes snapped at the source his mother who had just finished setting up the table. His stomach growled as he looked at the food neatly arranged on the table. In the middle was a large, crisp, and brown pork-like leg, except it was much bigger and fatter. Around it were fried horns, weirdly shaped vegetables, orange grains, boiled potatoes, and bread. Somehow the bread and potatoes look normal. Ha hey, sure's I assess delicious. Ray complimented Elena's cooking as he stuffed his face with food his expression plastered with satisfaction. Kai stared at his parents as they ate, a small amount of drool leaving his mouth as he subconsciously reached for a piece of meat. His panicked mother pulled the plate away from his reach as she berated him. Kai, you can't eat just yet! His face lowered in disappointment upon hearing those words, however, it lit up as his father spoke up. Why not? A few boiled vegetables should be fine. His teeth are going to start appearing soon. She raised an eyebrow as she looked at her husband, who didn't seem to be bluffing. Are you sure? He nodded, picking up a small piece of boiled potato. He turned to Kai and started making some weird sounds as he moved the potato around. Here comes the carriage. Come on Kai, open up. Kai died a little inside as soon as he heard that, feeling second-hand embarrassment. Stupid goddess, what kind of interpretation is that? Are you mocking me? Who would want to eat a carriage? He opened his mouth and chewed on the potato, despite his disdain and lack of teeth. His pupils widened as a tear fell down his cheek, his taste buds exploding with joy. Despite being only a plain boiled potato, why does this taste so good? It feels so soft but it's not sticking to the top of my mouth, and at the same time it makes me want to eat more, it doesn't even seem to be seasoned but yet, it's so good. Memories flashed in his mind as he enjoyed the taste of the plain potato which tasted better than the instant soup he was used to eating or the occasional bitter home-cooked meal made by his aunt. Elena smiled at the sight of her beaming son. He looks so happy. How did you know he could eat? She faced her husband and asked him curiously. I took care of the other children while their parents were at war. Some of them were babies so I learned these things naturally, he said as he looked at his son with nostalgic eyes. Her face suddenly darkened, and she could only let out a low. Oh as her lips parted without a sound coming out. Splat. A sudden sound broke the tense atmosphere between them, 
and they turned their heads to the source of the sound only to see Kai face first in the bowl of boiled potatoes. God damn it! He thought as he tried to lift his head from the now mashed potatoes. That's a bit much, even for him. His father joked as he picked him up and cleaned his face with a clean towel, revealing a small cut on his forehead. He's wounded, his mother said and she quickly put her hand over the wound as she chanted. Heal. Huh? Heal? Does she know healing magic too? In a few seconds, a multitude of green particles appeared over his mother's hand, creating a green light that healed his wound in a few seconds. His eyes widened as he watched all this happen, a single thought echoing in his mind. It's beautiful. 8. Chapter 5. The Secret Library. Ray and Elena sat down on a white carpet around a small, brown coffee table, where Kai was struggling to write using weird symbols. He lifted his pen from the paper, and his father picked it up in that same instant, his face beaming with joy as he read the text. Haha, our Kai is so smart he can already write a letter by himself. He laughed loudly as he said in a deep voice, Elena nodding along as she said, of course he is, he is my boy after all. He he, it's not that amazing. Kai laughed awkwardly as he scratched the back of his head. Nonsense, look at how beautiful your handwriting is. I will frame it and hang it on the wall. Ray praised Kai a little more as the latter dropped his head in embarrassment. That's right Kai, we should celebrate. Your birthday is coming up soon. I'll make sure to prepare lots of sweets just for you. He nodded excitedly his long silver hair jumping up and down as his sharp crimson eyes sparkled with anticipation. Look at how handsome he is. I don't think I need to dress him up for next week. Elena hugged him tightly and praised him endlessly. Of course he's handsome. He's our son after all. His father erupted into laughter as he disheveled his hair. Kai smiled brightly as he felt his parents' endless love for him, and his face turned as red as a tomato. A wide smile plastered on his face gave away the happiness he felt in his heart. Is this what a true family is like? He asked himself as memories of a cold hand and hateful glare appeared in his mind. Kai! His father's voice rang in his ears as he awoke from his memories. We will go outside for a bit. My friend Tom is going to come over and look after you again. He's bringing his daughter with him so get along. Okay. Yes dad don't worry. He nodded as he replied with a smile. However, a small question appeared in his mind. How come the two of them are leaving at the same time? Although Tom babysat him now and again, his parents had never actually left at the same time. He put this puzzling thought to the side, and instead, focused on a more important matter. This gives me the chance to see what's hidden behind that door. He bolted to the kitchen the moment his parents left, and cast his gaze onto the mysterious door. Its appearance was the same as the others in the house. Even its brown color didn't stand out. He inhaled deeply and readied himself to enter the room. His gut told him that there was something special about it. I never saw them enter, but I'm sure the key is in the drawer somewhere. The door had an old skeletal type lock. Unfortunately, all the doors in the house had the same type of lock. He rushed to open the drawer and before long the soft jingling of keys resounded in the room. A dozen skeletal keys tied a metal wire scraped against each other as Kai ran to the door with them. If I'm lucky one of them will open it, hopefully. He tried the first key, nothing. The second and third keys had the same result. Oh, come on. He inserted the fourth key and, click bingo. The door creaked open and scattered rays of sunlight leaked through the widening gap. So bright. Kai blinked rapidly as the light bounced off his widened crimson eyes, and he flinched at the warm sunlight that slightly burned his skin. Whoa. He exclaimed out loud taken aback by the interior. The room wasn't big, it was even smaller than the kitchen but it was different in every way. His fingers ran across the surface of the dark wood wall, and he winced in pain as a splinter pierced his finger. In the middle of the ceiling hang a chandelier that sparkled with red and white light from a dozen different magic stones, and below it lay a round wooden table with three chairs surrounding it. He approached the table and looked around at the large number of bookshelves filled with hundreds of books of different sizes. The thinnest one was no thicker than his pinky finger, and the largest one could fit his entire head inside. He turned his attention to the large window, which looked to be placed so that the light would only shine on the table but not the bookshelves. He scooted closer to the window and looked outside. His eyes widened as he took his first look at the new world. There wasn't much to see, however. Dark soil spread as far as the eye could see, and after it lay a forest, 
with trees so large it was difficult to estimate their size. He also saw a huge tower far into the distance, and what looked to be hundreds of little houses packed together. His ears twitched as the sound of a singing river rang in his mind. However, he could not see it, regardless of how far he tried to look. He closed his eyes and let the warm sunlight crash against his skin, enjoying his first time in the natural light. He felt his pores open up. Then a sizzling sound rang in his ears as a burning sensation, like an erupting volcano, spread all over his face. Waves of heat ran across his skin as his whole body started convulsing and the smell of burnt meat spread in the room. His breathing became ragged and uneven, and very little oxygen reached his brain. His veins dried up as his blood felt like it turned into hot mercury, stiffening his muscles as it coursed through his body. He opened his eyes as his mind started to go blank, and alarms started ringing in his head. His muscles tensed up as he jumped to the side, away from the direct sunlight before he retreated into a dark corner. What the fuck was that? His heart threatened to jump out of his chest as the burning sensation on his face slowly faded. He inhaled deeply as he did his best to calm down, his mind slowly returning to normal. Was it because of the sun? He rapidly came to the only logical conclusion as he recalled the intense pain he experienced a few moments ago. Hard mode, huh? He sighed and chuckled at the same time as he recalled what the goddess had told him. And here I thought my life was going to be this simple. But how can my parents leave during the day? He shrugged off this thought as he retreated further away from the window, his body shivering at the idea of going into the sunlight again. He turned towards the closest bookshelf and scanned the few books in front of him. They were ordered in alphabetical order, their subjects ranging from biology to history, math, linguistics, and of course, magic. Looks like they are arranged depending on the subject. He picked up a book from the magic section. Its cover was old, void of any text and dusty with burnt and torn corners. Dust flew everywhere as he flipped it open, and he coughed lightly as he read the text on the yellow, water-damaged page. G.R.S. Maalda. I can't even read the title but I'm guessing it has something to do with magic. He flipped over a few more pages, his eyes tearing up as the dust forced its way into his lungs. After a few minutes, Kai closed the book as he came to a jarring conclusion. I don't understand anything. What are Incos and Ancos? Seven star? Big core? He put it back and moved towards the beginning of the shelf, from where he picked up a thinner book. Its pages were white and the smell of fresh ink still lingered around it. The title of the book was written with sloppy handwriting with black ink on a brown cover, making it difficult to read. Kai squinted his eyes to read the title and felt that he recognized the handwriting more and more. Beginner's Guide for Dummy Beginner Mages. This title and handwriting. It couldn't be. He inhaled deeply as he sniffed the book as is customary with a new one. Definitely fresh off the printing station. The pages fluttered as he flipped it open, his fingertips pressing on the fine pages as he read its contents. Hello and welcome to a new book dedicated to teaching you, the stupid mage, how to perform magic. Today's first lesson is, boring but someone keeps saying that you need to learn this first so. Kai stared at the first page with bewilderment, his agape mouth letting out weird sounds as he tried to think through the shock. No way. Dad actually wrote this? He continued reading, and the second paragraph was written differently from the previous one. The style and handwriting changed and Kai immediately recognized it. Did mom write it as well? Why are they even writing it? Are no books on the market? Mana an intangible energy that exists everywhere in our world. As long as there is life, there is mana. From the tallest mountain to the wildest river and to the smallest pebble, all objects and beings have mana. By using it, Anyone can become stronger, faster, tougher, more resistant to the elements, and many more such things. Those spells are called Incos because they happen inside your body and affect you directly. There are also Anko spells, which are performed similarly to Inko spells except that they manifest outside your body in a multitude of different forms. Fireballs, earth walls, wind spheres, and many more such spells can only be performed via a catalyst, a magic stone, or a magic crystal usually embedded in a wand. The people who can use those spells are called magicians. Kai blinked rapidly as he suddenly understood a bit of what that old book said. He raised an eyebrow as a thought appeared in his mind. Why haven't I felt any mana yet though? Am I? What's the word? He shook his head before he continued reading, hoping to find an answer to his dilemma. In order to use magic one would need to form a mana core. Before that even feeling the magic around you would be difficult. 
so don't feel down. Kai facebound after he finished reading the sentence, feeling more stupid than down. Just keep reading next time. A manacore, however, isn't easily formed and there is a prerequisite needed for it, that being mana veins, something that you are born with. The manacore has seven colors which determine their quality, aka talent. From worst to best, black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and white. The colors only show how fast mana can be purified and controlled. So even if your mana core isn't the best quality, you would only advance a bit slower. If you aren't, then there is a way to artificially create them. However, Anko's spells would be out of the question until you reach a higher rank. Do I have mana veins then? How do I know? Sweat dripped down his forehead and into the book as a nervous thought appeared in his brain. You can check if you have mana veins by focusing your mind on your body. The mana veins are located in your arms, legs, and neck. If you have them, the mana within will react to your will, and you will be able to feel their rough outline. It is recommended to use this simple spell to expel the mana as well, as unpurified mana is poisonous. Focus on your mana veins and imagine the mana leaving them, and guide it by saying, ye feel. Huh, is it that easy? But didn't she say that I wouldn't be able to feel mana without a mana core? Or did she mean the mana outside? He jolted awake from his thoughts and put the book down. He followed the instructions and almost immediately he could feel tiny particles moving about in his body in an uneven line. Is that mana and my mana veins? He smiled with excitement as his heart raced in his chest and immediately tried performing the spell as indicated. A sharp pain spread throughout his mana veins as the mana within them circulated backward, and his body shivered as he felt the mana leave through his five extremities. So cool. Speaking of, I wonder what color my core will be. Green? Blue? Maybe even, white. Picking up the book again, he wanted to continue reading. However, in his excitement he forgot about one thing. Kai, are you there? A deep yell rang in his ears and he jumped up, visibly anxious. Crap, I forgot about that. He hastily placed the book on the shelf, not bothering to arrange it properly as he rushed out the door before locking it. He threw the keys in the drawer and ran to the living room, where Tom and his daughter waited for him. Hello Uncle Tom, sorry for the wait, I was uh, upstairs. He quickly made up a lie as he greeted Tom, his dad's friend. He was tall, very tall taller than his father by about two heads. His hair was short and black, much like his father's except that Tom had a cleanly shaven face. He wore simple linen clothing that hung loose around his thin but muscular body, and he also had a pair of crimson eyes, although their hue was a bit greener. No worries, he said as he ruffled Kai's hair, before pushing out a tiny girl from behind him. This is my daughter Kana. Kana walked forward, her head lowered as she fidgeted with her fingers. She opened her mouth a few times, however, no sound came out of it. She had long, blonde hair that complemented her blue dress, and her eyes were of a deep and dark crimson color, in contrast to her father's. Hello, Kai greeted awkwardly, not sure of what to say in front of this shy girl. Kana nodded in response before hiding behind her father once again. Haha, excuse her, she's quite shy. She only turned five last week. Speaking of which, your first birthday is coming up soon, right? Yeah, next week actually. He replied with a faint smile. Excitement plastered all over his face. I'll celebrate my first birthday after five years. Just what's up with that? He found it weird but put it in the back of his mind as he walked toward the living room. Come on, let's sit down then. He invited Kana and her father onto the couch, and he brought out his writing utensils. Tom taught him more complicated words. Kana watched from a distance, her eyes sparkling with curiosity as she slowly approached the coffee table, peeking from a hole between Kai and Tom. You can write? Her barely audible voice shaking as she asked. Yeah, I learned pretty quick. He replied casually as he finished writing the sentence. Can you write my name? She turned to Kai and asked with a bright smile on her face. Kai looked at Tom, who only gave a slight nod of approval as he made way for Kana to join them. Sure, look, this is how you write Ka and this. A few hours later, both Kai and Kano were asleep on the couch with Tom reading a book as he watched over them. 5. Chapter 6 First Birthday The sun was still up when Ray and Elena returned with bags full of groceries and party decorations. Kai yawned as he woke up from his nap, and smiled faintly as he shook Kano awake, who was sleeping soundly next to him. She rubbed her eyes and the foggy surroundings slowly became clear to her 
jumping up as she realized that everyone was looking at her. Come on, Kana, it's time to go. Tom called out as he beckoned her with his hand. She immediately jumped down from the couch and ran to her father's side, watching Kai from the corner of her eye. Ray approached Tom with an amicable smile, and his lips parted as he said, Thanks for babysitting, Tom. The shop to get all these was quite further away than we anticipated. Don't worry about it. At least Kana managed to make a new friend. She is quite shy and no one inside the city wants to talk with her because of that. So I'm grateful as well. Glad to hear that. I hope they become good friends. I hope so too. Unfortunately, we have to leave. Isabella should be waiting for us to arrive by now. Tom said his goodbyes and left Kana, holding tightly to his arms as the door closed shut. Kai waved to them as they left, a question popping into his mind as he watched their figures disappear behind the door. Mom, why is Kana allowed to go outside? He assumed he wasn't allowed to leave because his race was weak to sunlight, but after seeing Kana, a girl only older by a few weeks out in the direct sunlight, he couldn't help but ask. His parents gave each other a quick glance, and Ray scratched the back of his head as he said, We'll tell you when your birthday comes, just be patient until then, alright? Kai nodded but he lowered his head in disappointment. It's only a week anyway, I can wait. Elena picked him up and held his hand into her own. Don't make that face, let's prepare you for your birthday. She said as a smile creased her lips. Kai nodded and put his arms around her neck in a tight hug. As Kai helped his father prepare the decorations and gave his mother some modern snack ideas, seven days passed by in the blink of an eye. Elena had made a small four-piece black suit with a white shirt for Kai to wear on his birthday, which complemented the black shoes chosen by his father. I didn't know mom was so good at sewing. She made such a beautiful suit in a few months. Kai donned the ebony suit, its black color contrasting perfectly with his long silver hair and red eyes. He inspected the living room, observing the joyous and festive atmosphere in the house. His father had put up some colorful decorations and his mother hung an elastic almost solid threat which she then imbued with magic, changing its color to fit the mood. Kana was as shy as ever as she hid behind her mother, Isabella, whose head was decorated with long locks of blonde hair, her big, round eyes, and plump lips that formed into a hearty smile. Kana almost looked like a mini version of her, were it not for her eyes that resembled Tom's more. Isabella wasn't as tall as her husband, only reaching up to his chest. Elena was chatting happily with her, both of them smiling as they looked in his direction. He's so handsome at such a young age. I can't imagine what he'll look like in ten years, Isabella remarked as Elena nodded, immediately agreeing. That's right, he will need to wear a mask so he doesn't come home with five daughters-in-law. Kai's nose itched as he saw his mother and Isabella giggling on the side while stealing glances at him. What are they talking about? He turned his head as he ignored the two, his gaze drifting toward Elizabeth, the elf he saw at his birth. She doesn't look like she aged one day, she's still as beautiful as back then. Elizabeth wore a red dress, which complemented her emerald green eyes and her long golden locks of hair that dropped down past her waist. It wasn't tied, instead, let loose to hang around her body. However, not one hair was out of place, which only served to ingrain her picture in his mind. She was sipping on a glass of water as she occasionally glanced at Kai, whose crimson eyes lingered on her beautiful figure. Their eyes met, and his heart skipped a beat as he shook his head. She's your mom's friend, not to mention she's decades older than you, what are you thinking? He berated himself as he quickly avoided her gaze, turning to walk toward his father. Ellie chuckled as she got up from her seat, smiling slightly as she approached him. It didn't take long for her to arrive next to Kai, whose body jolted upon looking up at her. Her huge stature that cast a shadow over him made him gulp as he tried to contain his racing heart. Was she always this tall? Or am I too small? Elizabeth's eyes wandered around Kai as dozens of images flashed in her mind, although she hadn't seen him in a while. She always wondered how that baby that couldn't even move his body was doing. She kneeled in front of him and touched his forehead with her index finger, and it glowed slightly as she drew a circle. A bright smile creased her lips as they parted. You have a strong spirit, come to Evicario when you're old enough, and I'll take you as my apprentice. Ellie got up and walked towards Elena, leaving behind Kai, whose eyes were wide open. Did I just get a teacher? His father saw the whole exchange, and he chuckled to himself as he took a sip of red wine. A few minutes later Elena got up from her seat with a glass in hand, 
and she turned to everyone present as her lips parted. Thank you all for coming today. It warms my heart to see so many people present at my son's birthday. She rose the glass into the air as she cheered, with everyone following suit. Chatter accompanied by the sound of clanking cutlery resounded in the living room, where a rectangular table was covered in all sorts of delicacies and everyone took what they wanted to eat, like some sort of all-you-can-eat buffet. Kai looked at everyone present, Kana and her parents, Ellie, and most importantly his parents, who had prepared all of this for him. Warmth spread from his heart throughout his body, and a tear dripped down his cheek as he remembered his past birthdays, which weren't even a fraction as happy as this one. His mother immediately noticed and hurried to wipe it away as she kissed him on the forehead, signaling with her eyes toward Ray, who immediately got up and rushed to the kitchen. He quickly came in with a huge, chocolate-looking cake in hand, and Elena immediately turned off the magic stones with a wave of her wand, with only a dim light left to illuminate the room. Ray rushed to Elena's side and put the cake down in front of Kai, immediately flicking his fingers where a fire stone resided, lighting up the five candles on top of the cake. Kai looked at the scene with widened eyes, awed by his parents' beautiful spy-like performance. Everyone stood up and sang Kai a song in a long-forgotten language, leaving him and Kana confused. The birthday ended uneventfully, the kids finished the cake in record time before playing a few games, at which they failed exceptionally. The parents had a fun time as well, but all good things must come to an end as everyone left late into the evening. After cleaning up Kai and his parents sat in his bedroom, both of them wore serious expressions on their faces, that hid a hint of excitement. Ray flicked his hand and a small vial filled with a crimson liquid appeared in his hand. Blood? Kai immediately jumped to conclusions once he saw the vial's dark color. Kai! His mother sighed as she sat next to him. The reason we didn't let you go outside was that it would be too dangerous, and we are living in the kingdom for the same reason as well. Our species is cursed, we are the only ones who can't live in the sun, and we are the only ones who must feed on blood to survive and live a regular life. Specifically, his father continued, It is human blood that is the most effective. Without it, ten minutes in the sun would be enough to turn us to ashes, and two hours under the moonlight would have the same effect. A sigh escaped his lips as he prepared to continue, however, Elena took over the explanation next. If we drink blood, we can not only reduce or even negate the sun's poisonous nature, we can also increase our magical and physical abilities. However, not all blood is created equally. Normal animal blood has little to no effect. Likewise, the blood of an average human would only reduce the sun's effect by very little. Men-infused human blood is the best and most effective type of blood as blood from the other races have lots of adverse effects. This is why our species is so hated. We must feed on others to be normal. Kai listened attentively, noticing the sadness in his parents' eyes. Anyway, his father broke the awkward atmosphere, and he handed the vial over to Kai as he said, Drink it, and let us handle the rest. Just like this? He asked, bewildered. Rain nodded with a slight smile as he urged Kai to open the vial, which he did. The instant he removed the cap, a sweet, alluring scent bombarded his nostrils, and his eyes started glowing like two stars in the night sky. His fangs grew longer and sharper, and his nails transformed into claws. Drool dripped from his mouth as his vampiric instincts took over his body. He brought the vial to his lips. The infatuating taste caused his muscles to tense up as he downed the blood without hesitation. It's sweet. So sweet it's addictive. The flavor, the taste, the texture, everything about this feels perfect. This satisfaction, this feeling of fulfillment, my entire body feels alive. Elena touched the mesmerized Kai's forehead and whispered softly in his ear as her hand shone with a pink light. Kai, I am going to transfer the technique to form a mana core to your mind. It will hurt a bit though, but please endure. He nodded subconsciously, his mind still infatuated with this new experience. The pink light grew in intensity as it filled the entire room before it quietly died down. Ray dashed behind Kai, placing his hands on his back as he said, Use the technique to guide the mana and form the core. Ray's voice rang in his ears and the technique became clear in his mind as he slowly woke up from his trance. This is, the method to form a mana core? He thought, feeling surprised that he already knew how to do it. Is this what the pain from earlier was? Following the technique, he guided the mana from his mana veins in a spherical shape at a spot right next to his heart 
with Ray helping in the process to make sure he doesn't accidentally destroy his heart. The minutes ticked by, and a small, translucent core slowly appeared next to his heart, pulsating briefly before it stood still, and Kai's appearance returned to normal. His eyes opened slowly, his dilated pupils reflecting the dim light of the crystals in his room. Ha! Huh, I'm a magician now. He chuckled as his mind drifted into unconsciousness and fell in Ray's arms, lightening the tense mood as his parents' lips formed into a smile. 6. Chapter 7 Dream Space Kai's eyes snapped open, a blinding white light greeting him as his unfocused gaze adjusted to the new surroundings. His long hair fluttered in the empty space as he observed the unfamiliar environment. Everywhere he looked was white, bright, blinding white. The ground beneath his feet mirrored the rest of the world his eyes losing focus as he gazed into the white abyss. It feels like I'm flying but at the same time, not. His eyes suddenly widened as a grim thought appeared in his mind. No way, am I dead again? He asked out loud and waited for an answer, but the only thing he heard was the echo of his voice bouncing back to him. I guess not, where am I then? He slowly moved forward, his light footsteps echoed in the white void, and he did his best not to fall as he fought back the urge to vomit. He halted his footsteps and shut his eyes as he took a deep breath. It's too difficult to move around, I can feel last night's food trying to leave my body. He steadied his breathing as he contemplated the situation, his chest heaving rhythmically as he inhaled and exhaled rapidly. I'm not dead, the proof is that no gods showed up yet. I still have my five senses so this can't be an illusion, what is happening then? His eyes opened once again, and a dark object appeared far into the distance. Is that a person? He rushed towards its location as cold sweat dripped down his forehead, his heart fluttering with the anticipation of meeting someone in this empty space. The dark object quickly transformed into a silhouette as Kai dashed toward it, eventually taking the form of a man in his mid-thirties with brown, short hair, and fish eyes decorated by thick dark circles. His dead expression was further complemented by a poorly shaven beard and dry lips that could make a corpse blush. He wore a simple white lab coat that, unlike his appearance, was kept perfectly clean. He held a cup of coffee and seemed to be staring into nothing, not even turning his head as Kai stopped next to him. Hello? Kai called out to him, but the man's head didn't move an inch, seemingly ignoring his presence. Kai moved in front of him, once again trying to start a conversation but the man continued to stare into the abyss, acting like Kai wasn't even there. Ah. Uh, damn it. I thought I finally had some sort of clue about how to get out of here. He yelled while kicking the air, when a chair materialized in front of him, followed by a desk, on top of which stood a computer, a night lamp, and a few hundred documents scattered about. Walls appeared around him and the man, then a couch and a coffee table, a chandelier that hung from a newly created ceiling, and another hundred documents. The man moved, passing through Kai as he made his way to the office chair. A fatigued expression manifested on his face as he inhaled deeply. The sound of frustrated typing resounded in the empty room, along with furious mouse clicks and light sighs every so often. A multitude of sounds rang in Kai's ears, and his expression turned to shock as he turned around. Numerous locations appeared out of thin air before his very eyes, schools and farms, labs, zoos, houses, front yards and backyards, parking lots, parks, town squares, and churches. Hundreds of environments from different places and different eras. Along with them, people appeared as well. Men, women, children, old and young, from the Victorian era and the modern era, as well as the medieval era and everything in between. Swordsmen and doctors, scientists and beggars, thousands of faces in different scenarios. Kai walked aimlessly, observing the huge assortment of people and locations, and he came to a few conclusions as he stopped in front of a few of them. These people seemed familiar, and at the same time, not. He walked in and out of them, the people inside never acknowledging his presence, or the presence of other locations. It seems like they live in a bubble, I can't interact with them, them with me, or them with others. Walking from place to place, he found himself in a small space, occupied by a large, modern house and a front yard, in which a small child was playing with a ball. His mother was on the veranda, phoned to her ear and smoking a cigarette as she wrote down something. Kai smiled faintly as he watched the scene, a feeling of longing growing in his heart. He seems happy, he thought as he turned around, leaving the small child's small bubble.
The sound of screeching tires rang in his ears as his head snapped toward the child, his eyes widening as a morbid thud echoed in his mind. The small boy's body flew through the air, his skull smashing against the asphalt, creating a trail of blood before everything came to a stop. No! Why? His eyes were fixated on the gory sight, his heart in turmoil as his mind was flooded with questions. He felt his stomach drop as he quickly looked around, witnessing hundreds of people dying in a matter of seconds. He felt his stomach churn and hot burning liquid climbed up his throat as an acidic taste flooded his tongue. He clenched his gut as he pushed it back down, his pupils constricted as he helplessly watched hundreds of people die. His footsteps matched the beat of his heart as he rushed back to the scientist looking at all of the bubbles as he passed them by, and all of the different people inside. Whether they were happy or angry, smiling or crying, playing or sitting, all of them died, and time seemed to have stopped moments after they perished. Arriving in front of the small office, Kai let out a sigh of relief as he saw the scientist's lonely figure still typing on his computer and writing down some information on a piece of paper. He put down his pen right after he finished rubbing his eyes as he let out a tired sigh. What a frustrating project! He thought aloud as he got up, laying on the couch behind him. He checked his wristwatch, and he closed his eyes as he murmured. I can sleep for thirty minutes before the next meeting. Kai watched as he closed his eyes, and an ominous feeling instantly swept over him. No way. He walked next to the man and noticed that he wasn't breathing anymore, his hand stopping midair as it fell. He's dead as well. He grabbed the man's hand and checked his pulse, but the pressure he applied didn't even wrinkle the man's skin. He really is dead, but his eyes drifted over to the scientist's face, he seems relieved. So his name was Rodney. He read the name tag sewn to his coat, and his hand froze in mid as he let go of it. He walked over to the desk and read the document Rodney had written before his death, his pupils constricted as he finished reading its contents. Project BH 2003.4 Creation of an Artificial Black Hole Experiment 22022 All attempts at creating a black hole so far have failed, despite our greatest efforts it is impossible to find so much energy, according to my calculations we would need the energy of 10 suns to power one small black hole for a few seconds, and even if we could it would be impossible to contain so much energy in such a small space, estimated casualties, 16. He was a scientist researching black holes, but what for? Could it be a military weapon? The sound of flipping pages resounded in the room for a few minutes, Kai's expression becoming even more shocked as he finished reading through a dozen reports, each with a different number of casualties. So many people died and the experiment still failed? Kai ignored the rest of the documents, too afraid to keep reading, and instead turned his attention to Rodney's lifeless body. He approached the couch and stared at the man. Disgust written all over his face. How could he write such things? Is it true that statistics are easier to bear? His hands clenched into a fist, and a scraping sound echoed in the room as his teeth ground against each other. He stared at the scientist's body, which was as cold as his heart. He yelled as his fists ran through Rodney's body, completely shattering upon impact. The world around him shuddered as the sound of broken glass rang in his ears. The office along with countless other locations disintegrated before his eyes, the corpses fading into the void along with them. Countless pieces of light bombarded his body as they disappeared, and a disembodied voice echoed in his mind. So much work to do but, it feels so peaceful. I'll lie down for a bit more. Then it was silent, the white void faded as darkness took its place, the quiet abyss whispering in Kai's head as he lost consciousness. 6. Chapter 8. Magic Training Kai's eyes snapped open, and he found himself staring at a familiar ceiling. A painful scream escaped his lips as he jumped up, his hands warped around his temples. Arg! My head! It hurts! It hurts! He clenched his teeth as a sudden and agonizing headache pierced through his mind, the pain intensifying as someone else's memories flowed through his brain. These memories! Are they Rodney's? He thought as the pain faded away and he collapsed on the bed in a pool made of sweat. How come I have his memories? Those other people, what happened to them? His chest heaved up and down as dozens of images flashed in his mind, memory fragments telling the tale of a genius, a man envied and loved by many who tragically died at such a frail age. The image of an angry woman appeared in his head, 
her face covered in worry as she berated the man. She wore a secretary's uniform and her beautiful brown eyes complemented her luscious red hair. Her sharp, harsh voice echoed in his ears as her eyes started tearing up. You're going to kill yourself if you keep going on like this, Rodney. Please stop. If not for you, please. Do it for me. How much do you plan on working? This woman was really concerned for Rodney, and in the end, she was right. She faded away, her image replaced by a crowd of cheering people. He could see an old man from the corner of his eye, who seemed to present Rodney to the crowd. This is Rodney. He graduated top of his class at the Scientia Institute for Science and Technology, and will now be our team leader on this project assigned to us from the military. His old and raspy voice resounded in the crowd's ears as they kept on celebrating. Kai sighed as more and more information revealed itself to him, and his image of Rodney gradually changed. What a stupid genius. He jumped as his bedroom door slammed open, his parents rushing in and instantly arriving at his side. Kai, are you all right? What happened? His mother asked while hugging him tightly, his father looking at him with concern as he grabbed some dry clothes. I'm fine, I just had a nightmare. An emptiness formed in his gut as the lie escaped his lips, and his hands clenched into a fist at the thought of lying to his parents. Kai changed his clothes and followed his parents downstairs, into the living room. They sat on the couch, excitedly watching Kai who stood in front of them, his heart racing as they recounted the events from the previous night. We used my family's secret technique to form your mana core. It is best done when your senses and instincts are pushed to their limits, and that is when you drink blood for the first time. In doing so, your body is more active, alert, and more responsive. Kai was deep in thought as he took it all in. His mother's explanation caught him off guard and various thoughts popped up in his mind. Then do all vampires use this method? Did Kana use it too? I wonder what color her core is, speaking of which. Congratulations on taking your first step towards becoming a magician. Kai snapped from his thoughts, awakened by his father's deep voice. You have yet to become one though, just on the cusp of it. You need to solidify it and make the star appear. Only then will you be a bona fide magician. Close your eyes and focus on the mana in your veins. His mother added. Feel it as it flows through your body, feeding the mana core. Kai nodded and shut his eyes, focusing his on the places where he knew his mana veins were, and once again felt the mana flowing through them. Rushing violently toward his yet-to-be-completed, translucent mana core. Oh? Looks like you don't need to explain what mana veins are? Ray jokingly remarked before Elena lightly punched him. Kai lost his focus, and opened his surprised eyes as he asked. You knew? Doesn't take a genius to figure it out. His dad replied nonchalantly as the dark ring on his finger glowed with a faint light, and a book materialized in his hand. It was the same book Kai read in the library last week. If you're gonna sneak around, be careful not to damage what you're snooping through. He said with a slight, knowing smile. Kai rubbed the back of his head in embarrassment, as he chuckled. It seems like you've got experience? Ray's smile froze on his face, and he felt a piercing glare stare at him from his right side. Why you brat, you even question your father now? He scolded Kai before he coughed lightly. Just do as your mother said. He chuckled silently as he closed his eyes once again. He focused on the mana flowing through his veins, and he saw his translucent core standing still next to his beating heart. Use the technique you learned and guide the mana from your veins inside your core, then compress it and do it again. Repeat the cycle a few times until the star and its color appear. His mother instructed, and Kai was surprised to find that the technique popped into his mind the moment she mentioned it. So this is what a technique looks like. It isn't that complex but could be improved, right? Rodney's scientific expertise appeared in his mind, and he slowly compared his knowledge with the meager amount of information he had about mana and came to the conclusion that the current technique was inefficient. If I change the structure of the mana core, the results should be miles better. But how do I do it? He tinkered with the idea for about an hour, a time in which his parents anxiously waited for him to open his eyes. Um, dear, is there something wrong with the technique? Ray shakily asked as he played with his fingers, sweat dripping through his thick beard. There shouldn't be. Elena replied, her hands held tightly together as she bit her lower lip until blood dripped down her pale face. I think he's trying to do something but I can't tell exactly what. Huh? What do you mean? Elena shook her head, and she dismissed the statement after a deep sigh. 
Nothing, there's no way. They waited patiently as the minutes passed. A crisp chime sound, like that of a bell being struck, resounded in the room as Kai's chest emitted a faint, multicolored light that filled the entire room before it slowly faded away. He opened his eyes, inhaling lightly as he steadied his breathing. A wide smile appeared on his face, his glowing crimson pupils failing to hide his excitement. His parents jumped up, relief washing over them as they waited for Kai to regain his focus. His head wobbled a bit before his pupils widened in surprise, and he munched on his nails as he murmured. Did I make a mistake somewhere? Ray and Elena, on the other hand, couldn't wait to ask him an important question, something that was in their minds since last night. What color is it? Your manicure? Kai raised his head and shakily said. It seems, it seems to be red. His parents' mouths dropped open as they took a step back, glancing at each other as they tried to make sense of the situation. Doesn't that mean that his original color was... Elena, this doesn't make sense. Ray said as he sat down on the couch. Well, it doesn't matter. She said as he took a seat next to him. What matters is how hard he is willing to study. Ray nodded, although his disappointment could not be hidden. Kai scratched the back of his hand as he stood deep in thought, analyzing every inch of his mana core before sighing internally. I should have studied magic more. I wanted to modify it so that the talent factor would be thrown out the window but I failed, and now I'm stuck with a red score. He exhaled softly and he turned to his parents, his piercing crimson eyes sending a small shiver down their spine. He coughed sharply as he cleared his throat, his clear voice ringing in his parents' ears. It doesn't matter, I will work hard to become a son you can be proud of. Talent? Irrelevant. In order to become a great magician, talent is only part of the process. It doesn't matter what color my core is, I will succeed no matter what. His parents were taken aback by their five-year-old son's words, but his words inspired confidence in them, and most importantly, he inspired confidence in himself. These words were a promise to himself more so than his parents, who had great expectations of him. However, unbeknownst to him, a slight orange hue appeared on his mana core before it quickly hid away in the center. We're already proud of you, son. His father said he pulled him closer, tightly hugging him and ruffling his long hair. I'm sorry, I wasn't a good father for a moment there. Please forgive me. Kai rubbed his face in his father's beard, smiling faintly while saying, No need to apologize, Dad. You're a great father, better than I deserve. His shaky voice echoed in the room as tears dripped down his cheeks, which quickly stopped as a sudden pain suddenly emerged in his head. You brat, how dare you say you don't deserve us? His mother slapped him on the back of the head before hugging him tightly, tears dripping down her cheeks as she ran her fingers through his hair. Mommy loves you more than anything, don't you ever forget that. Um, he replied softly as a wave of warmth washed over him, the feeling of being loved inundating his senses with happiness. The tight group hug broke after a while, salted tears and sweat mixing in their clothes, prompting them to separate. Before leaving, Kai turned to his father and said, pointing toward the book on the couch. Can I have it? I want to read it upstairs. Sure you can, just don't cast any Anko spells, not like you could but I'm saying, just in case. Kai chuckled as he thanked his father, rushing upstairs, eager to theory craft and compare Rodney's knowledge with the book. Say, dear, don't you think our son is too smart? Elena asked as she wiped her face with a handkerchief. Of course he is, he's our son after all. Ray replied with a light laugh, however his eyes told a different story. Who cares anyway? He's our son regardless. Elena nodded, and she wiped his beard with the handkerchief as well. You should shave sometimes. She jokingly remarked as she made her way to the kitchen, Ray following close behind her. You think? Kai sat at his desk, the scribbling sound of a quill echoing in the otherwise quiet room. Sometimes he'd stop and murmur something before he continued writing. Overachiever, work alcoholic, and antisocial. He graduated as a valedictorian in the most prestigious science and technology university and worked in several departments focusing on innovation, robotics, AI development, biological matter recreation, human cloning, teleportation devices, and other related topics. His last two years were spent on the Black Hole Project, where he performed hundreds of experiments resulting in a triple-digit number of casualties and he died in his sleep. Kai sighed as he dipped his quill in more ink, thinking aloud as he tried to make sense of Rodney's character. He was amazing, 
a never-before-seen genius that wanted to improve the world, then why did he accept to work on the BH project? Unfortunately, his memories aren't complete, and any fragments of his personality are missing, but he tore a line through the thin page as the quill trembled in his hand. It can be said that he had no empathy. Was he a sociopath? Were the ends more important than the means? He exhaled lightly as took out another piece of paper, writing furiously as his mind churned out theories. Rodney's knowledge of both basic and advanced chemistry is outstanding. It took me three years of high school just to memorize the periodic table, but I know all of it thanks to him. Not only that, hundreds of chemical reactions are now available to me, I wonder. Could magic and science be combined? What would be the limit? Could I use the BH project data to create one myself? He chuckled madly to himself as he wrote down countless theories. He only left his room to eat and piss. Otherwise, he'd either be taking notes or reading the magical book. His mind spinning as countless ideas popped into his mind. The moon was high in the sky when he finally fell asleep on the hard but comfortable surface of the wooden desk, his silver hair reflecting the small light stone his mother lit for him. The sun hadn't even risen when Kai got up waltzing in his parents' bedroom with the beginner's guide for dummy beginner mages in hand. He carefully walked to his father's side, nudging him awake. Hmm? Ha! Huh? What is it? Ray was still half asleep as he did his best to become alert, unsure of why his son would make him up before there was light outside. Magic! Kai replied with a single word, surprising his sleepy father, who rubbed his eyes as he leaned on his elbow. Ah, now, let me sleep for five more minutes. But Kai quickly took his hand, and said in a bratty tone, No, now, Ray had a sudden, bad feeling, telling him that if he didn't do what Kai wanted something bad would happen, and indeed it would, because Kai was ready to wake his mom up if his dad didn't oblige. What a scary fox this boy is, scarier than his mother. Ray let out a light groan as he got out of bed, not even bothering to change from his pajamas, and met with Kai in the backyard. Now that you have drunk blood, you can stay in the sun for a few hours, but we can stay longer as the damn sun didn't even rise yet. He quickly slapped his mouth as he realized what he said. Crap, Elena will kill me, ah shit. Ray shut his mouth and took the book from Kai, who was tearing up from holding back his laughter. Ahem. Ray coughed lightly. I hope you acquainted yourself well with the book, so I won't bother to explain much theory yet. I will do a small demonstration now, and listen closely as I explain. Saying that, a dark wooden wand appeared in his hand. It was decorated by a few crystals of red and black, which glowed lightly as he muttered a set of syllables. Oh mighty flame god, grant me your powerful fire. Burn my foe, fireball. What is this? It's so... Ugh Kai physically cringed upon hearing the spell, unable to believe that this was a chant. What kind of Chinibyo wrote this? I'd rather bury myself than every chant that. Maybe there is a way to cast chantless magic? His daydreaming was disrupted by the sound of an igniting flame, and sure enough, a small ball of fire floated in front of his father. His inner child exploded forth, as, despite the second-hand embarrassment, this was his first time seeing actual, traditional magic. His father smirked, and he pridefully said, Watch closely. The fireball then got bigger and bigger and Ray shot it toward the sky, and it flew upward with incredible speed. Before Kai could even react to what was happening, it exploded, creating a brilliant show of fireworks that rained down on the vast barren land. Wow! Kai stared at the sky, his mouth wide open as he admired the mesmerizing threads of fire as they danced in the twilight sky. He was so taken by the show that he forgot one thing, an explosion creates sound, and the sound. His head snapped toward his father, and his pupils widened in shock as he looked at the door frame where his mother sat with a why the fuck did you just wake me up expression. How was it? Pretty cool right? His father said, none the wiser of the beasts lurking behind him. What is it? He asked, and he rapidly turned around as realization hit him. Dee dee dear, I can explain dash. He shakily pleaded to Elena, who was looking at him like an emperor would at a dead man. Okay then, she said imperatively, tapping the ground with her foot, waiting for a well-deserved explanation. I was just trying to teach Kai magic and things got out of control and dash. Enough! She interrupted Ray before he could finish his sentence, clearly annoyed by his blatant boasting. You know better than I that we should lay low, don't do it again. She gave him a warning glare before she turned toward Kai, 
who was stupefied by his mother's hard stance. Kai found himself being picked up by his mother, who asked him, Did your father teach you what the elements are? He shook his head, prompting Elena to shoot another glare at Ray. All this ruckus and you didn't even teach him the fundamentals? Ray lowered his head and scratched the back of his head, murmuring under his breath. Why did he even read the book if he doesn't know them? 7. Chapter 9. Elemental Affinity Kai sat on a bench in the courtyard, his father next to him. The both of them were looking at Elena, who gave Ray one last angry look before her lips parted. Mana, in our world, mana is everywhere, from the smallest blade of grass to the tallest mountain and the highest cloud. It is the energy that allows us to gain a supernatural power magic. What we call mana is actually a type of energy that can be found in all beings, be they living or not. Everyone has it, me, you, the birds flying by and the bugs crawling on the ground, but not everyone can use it. In the beginning, most sentient beings weren't able to use mana, and we only learned after conducting some experiments. Eventually, we figured out how to use mana, and our bodies naturally evolved and adapted. Elena paused briefly, and her hands clenched into a fist as she recounted the history of her people, her pupils trembling as she seemed to remember something. Anyway, she continued, This energy has two main sources, mortal energy and celestial energy. Besides those two there is life energy, a very special energy that allows one to use healing magic, but very few people actually have it. It is theorized that death energy also exists, but so far no one has ever awakened with it. Besides that, there is time and space, which allows people to use spatio-temporal magic, but those are derivations of dark energy, and there are a lot more types of some magic, like blue fire and metal magic, and it is theorized that there are a lot more. These are considered insidiarum magics, which also include combination magics. Mortal energy, which includes life and death energy, is the energy that exists on Laminia, our planet, and they are fire, earth, water, and air. Celestial energy is the energy that exists outside of Laminia, such as light and dark. You may think that light exists on our planet, but our light is different from that of the sun, and as for dark energy, it's everywhere else. His mother explained rapidly, her face covered in sweat as her chest rapidly heaved up and down. Ray pulled out a glass of water from his ring, which he then handed to Elena. Thank you, dear. Kai excitedly absorbed all the new information, new theories forming in his mind as to how he can create new magics. In Sidiram magics, huh? They seem to be random but blue fire is a fire with a high amount of oxygen. Does that mean that white fire is possible too? As for metal magic... Are they controlling the metal itself or the earth within the metal? Did they discover magnetism yet? Life magic and death magic. This one is tricky, but doesn't seem impossible to learn. No, Elena said, waking Kai up from his daydreaming, and he found himself holding a small, red crystal in his hand. This is a fire element crystal. It is the refined, more expensive version of the fire stone. If you infuse your mana within, it will tell us whether or not you have any affinity for fire energy. Elemental affinity? Kai asked, bewildered at the concept. Is that some kind of RNG concept the goddess introduced? His mother didn't answer, however. Instead, she told him to stand in her place, and she sat down next to Ray. Go on, his dad said. You can close your eyes if you think it will help. Imagine the fire dancing in your palm as you infuse your mana into the crystal. He did as instructed and shut his eyes, visualizing his palm. He sent little amounts of mana into the crystal and a small wisp of fire appeared in his mind, swaying gently in his hand. Is this it? He wasn't sure if what he did was right, but he enjoyed the feeling of the fire rubbing against his palm. It feels so real, it's so warm. Suddenly, the small wisp of fire swayed violently, and it began to shrink, threatening to extinguish and disappear. No! His heart skipped a beat, but he quickly regained his composure. Recalling Rodney's memories, he imagined the fundamental components of fire. Fire is a chemical reaction, combustion, created from oxygen, heat, and fuel. In this case, the fuel would be mana, the heat, the spark. What can the spark be? Cold sweat ran down his spine as his mind worked at 110%. He frowned as his teeth scraped against each other. The spark is mana as well. By moving the mana particles at rapid speeds I can create the heat necessary for the combustion to happen, and then, the small wisp of fire grew quickly, from one meter to two, from two to three, from three to eight, 
From eight to twenty, it grew into a tall, raging inferno that he struggled to content. His eyes snapped open, a bright and intense red light blinding him temporarily. Elena and Ray jumped on their feet, their widened eyes focusing on the small crystal in Kai's hand, which threatened to explode as cracks spread all over its surface. This is amazing, not even I had such a strong affinity with fire when I first tested. Ray said slowly, his eyes sparkling with pride. His mother was just as shocked and full of pride as Ray. Her shivering hands were joined together, and her lips trembled slightly. Even if he can't use any other element, just this one is enough to give him a good life. He can join the academy despite his red core. Her big, crimson eyes became wet as tears threatened to fall down her cheeks. She jumped as Ray hugged her from behind, calming down her nerves as he tenderly kissed her on the cheek. She handed Kai another crystal, one of a dark, blue color. Now try to imagine the ocean, the sea, the river, or a lake. Imagine the rain falling on your skin as it sinks into your clothes and dampens your hair. Kai closed his eyes once again, and a small puddle appeared in his mind, which, just like the wisp of fire, slowly shrank until it disappeared. He didn't panic this time, however, as the formula for water popped into his mind. A strong tidal wave flooded his thoughts and his eyes snapped open once again, the crystal glowing with a blue light that reflected in his parents' sparkling eyes. Two elements. To think he'd be able to use two elements with a red core. Elena handed Kai one crystal after the other, each time glowing with intense light. His affinity for all elements was artificially boosted by Rodney's knowledge, and he could not help but feel disappointment in himself, even if he couldn't control the situation. Finally, it was time for the last crystal, the light crystal. Kai did as usual, and imagined himself, standing in the courtyard. The world around him was black and white, and a deep darkness surrounded him like a shadow. He stared at the dark sun, which emitted a faint light that softly bounced off his skin. He waited patiently, waited for the element to reject him before using his modern knowledge to artificially acquire it. The light grew brighter and more intense the scattered rays of sunlight piercing through the monochrome world, pushing away the darkness surrounding him. His widened eyes were focused on the sun, its blinding light forcing him to open them. He blinked rapidly as his eyes adjusted to the normal light, the dim glow of the crystals greeting him, along with his mother's beaming face and his father's proud, trembling smile behind her. She picked him up, hugging him tightly as she jumped with excitement, Ray watching from the sides, doing his best to control his laughter. I can't believe Kai has an affinity with all elements. Is my son a monster? A few weeks had passed since then. Kai and Kana stood opposite each other in his courtyard, each of them holding a fire crystal in their hands, and in front of them were two target dummies made of stone. They murmured something under their breaths, and the crystal lit up as a small ball of fire appeared in front of them. The flaming ball would sometimes levitate for a few seconds before fading away and other times they would send it shooting toward the target's general direction, either missing it by a hair's breadth or by a mile. Tom and Ray were watching them from the side as they chuckled and commented on their performance. Despite his high affinity for magic, he's no better than my Kana at casting spells. I have to say this is quite surprising, Tom said as he took a sip from a small glass of wine. Not really, I've seen plenty of people with high affinities waste their talents. There was one guy who had better affinity than me with dark magic but I still bested him. Ray boasted as he sipped on a small glass of wine before he continued. I have to say though, Kana isn't that bad herself despite only having two affinities. And she's smart as well, she will acquire more in due time. Tom let out a light laugh as he observed the two children doing their best to cast the simple spell. I'm sure she will, she's got good genes after all. Ha! Ray laughed loudly grabbing the attention of Kai and Kana, which made them turn their heads toward the two. You can say that again. The children rolled their eyes before they went back to training, Kai smirking slightly as he continuously shot fireballs, everywhere but on the target. You kinda suck at this. Kana remarked as she took aim at the stone dummy in front of her, and the fireball shot straight toward its head, then missed by a few centimeters. You kinda suck at this too. Kai chuckled as he cast another fireball which faded away before he could even shoot it. His head dropped in disappointment, and a sigh escaped his lips as he clenched his fist around the crystal. Even with the perfect elemental affinity, this stuff is really difficult. Besides allowing me to use the element, what's the point of this affinity thing? He raised his head, 
his eyes burning with determination as he rapidly chanted the cringe spell his father taught him. A small fireball manifested in front of him, floating calmly as it waited for his command. Kai looked at it closely, much to the bewilderment of both Kana and their dads. If my accuracy isn't good enough, then a bigger projectile should hit regardless. Time to put what I studied to the test. He inhaled deeply and focused on the ball of fire, which grew in size as he fed it more and more mana, and its color changed to a slight blue hue as its temperature increased. Ray and Tom jumped up as they saw the spell's diameter rapidly increase, and they yelled while running toward Kai, who had a wide smile on his face despite the burning heat being so close to his face. Kai, stop! His father warned as he got closer, however, it was too late. Kai's smile froze on his face and his pupils trembled as the fireball expanded at a rapid pace, until it violently exploded. Kai tumbled backward violently, groaning as he fell and landed on his back, his chest heaving up and down as he drifted in and out of consciousness, a faint light reflecting in his eyes before they slowly closed. 5. Chapter 10 Emotion Kai opened his eyes, a bright and warm light greeting him as he struggled to awaken, intense. Sharp bursts of pain appeared all over his body as he tried to get up. He sighed inwardly as he saw the foggy image of his familiar ceiling. Inhaling deeply, the smell of burnt flesh and fabric inundated his nostrils, and he coughed lightly. Hastened footsteps rang in his ears, and his parents' blurry figure appeared in his vision. He blinked rapidly a few times as his sight became clear, an angry expression obvious on their faces. What happened? He did his best to remember what happened, vague images of a blue fire explosion flashing in his mind. His pupils constricted as the memory of the incident became fresh in his mind. Why didn't it work? His thoughts escaped his lips, and his father's scoff resounded in the room. Because you're an idiot, Ray answered, a hint of fury clear in his voice. Why would you do something so reckless? Elena stood quiet by the side, sighing as he healed Kai just enough for him to get up. He immediately saw Ray's angered face who looked at him with crossed arms. I thought you knew better than doing that. It could have gone a lot worse. What were you thinking? He asked with an imperative tone, his stoic face and piercing gaze giving Kai goosebumps all over his wounded body. He avoided Ray's gaze, instead staring at the hardwood floor as he said with a trembling voice. I was annoyed I couldn't hit the target, so I thought that dash. You thought that a bigger fireball would make it easier to hit? Have I not taught you well enough? I said that infusing too much mana into a spell will make it unstable, and the caster will experience dire consequences, didn't I? Ray cut him off, his words digging into Kai's soul. He bit his lower lip and clenched the sheets, his blood flow becoming turbulent. He gave his father a quick glance, immediately avoiding his burning gaze. Answer. He demanded, his deep voice sending shivers down Kai's spine. Why why yes? His lips trembled as he answered tears threatening to flow from his reddened eyes, which he subconsciously shut, his muscles tensing up as memories from his soul flashed into his mind. He saw a huge, imposing fist fly toward him, its thick and hairy fingers descending upon him caused his mind to shudder, and a wave of inner turmoil washed over him as the fist was within inches of his face. Then, he opened his eyes. He saw his father's tender expression before he found himself being hugged tightly, a warm hand ruffling his hair, as he felt the rapid beating of a heart, one that was not his but it was much too familiar. His eyes widened as his father hugged him, and he endured the pain that appeared all over his body, waking up from the living nightmare he just experienced. Dad, he asked, unsure of the reality before him. His father's warm body pressed against his made him realize that this wasn't a dream. He returned the hug, wrapping his scorched hands around Ray's neck as tears dripped down his cheeks. Dad! Kai, you stupid boy, I'm so glad you're alive. The scare you gave me at that moment if you hadn't been breathing, you... I... His father's voice was shakier than his, and he could feel warm tears drip down his neck. His mother's quiet sobbing rang in his ears. All the tension up to that point was broken by his father's gentle hug, and Elena couldn't hold back the despair she felt anymore. Her red glowed under the light of the chandelier, and streams of tears ran down her cheeks as she sat next to Kai whispering softly as she tried to calm down. My baby! The starry night watched over the entirety of the bustling city. Countless stalls and shops were open, advertising their products with bright, different colored light stones. 
the infatuating smell of freshly cooked food lingered on the busy, cobblestone-paved road. Food and barbecue stalls, shops with wooden or plush toys, hunting equipment stalls, clothing, and bookstores were open on both of its sides, stretching as far as the eye could see. Vampires, demihumans, lizardmen, and some lesser demons manned the stalls, selling all sorts of various, exotic or weird foods such as fried snake tongue, honey bread bat legs, the pickled horns of a horned rabbit, or skewers fried on the antlers of a double-headed deer. One such shop stood in a remote corner of the city. Surrounding it were a few worn-down buildings and poor-looking shops. In contrast to them, this shop was brightly lit up by a few light crystals. Its walls were covered in some vine-like plants, small violet flowers sprouting from them. This shop had a large window lit by a couple of firestones. A dozen exquisitely crafted wooden wands were put on display, each of them adorned with small crystals of different colors. Three people stood in front of it, staring at the displayed goods as they talked. The smaller of the three was Kai, who has grown taller in the three years since the incident. His features developed to become more like his father's small eyes with long eyelashes, thin lips, and a nice jawline began to take shape. His long silver hair reached his chest, and it was tied in a ponytail as per Elena's suggestion. On the other hand, she and Ray never aged a day, their youthful looks remained untouched by the river of time, and not even a wrinkle appeared on their pale skin. Now that you're close to a two-star magician, you will need a wand to continue training. His father explained as they looked at the different wands on display. See all of those different crystals and woods? Just like you used a fire stone as a catalyst to control fire magic, the wand will act as a catalyst for multiple elements. Not only that, he said as he pulled out his own wand it was long and thin, made out of a dark wood. The crystals on it were six crystals of two different colors red and black three fire crystals, and three dark crystals. They shone with a mesmerizing light as they reflected all the light around them. With a wand, your spell will deal greater damage depending on how many crystals you have, and even your accuracy will increase slightly. Isn't that right? Ray finished his explanation and asked, seemingly to no one. A low and sharp screech rang in Kai's ears, and he looked around, confused and unable to find its source. It's my wand his father said before putting it back in his spatial ring. After a certain point, some wands gain sentience, which increases your control over mana, reducing the time to cast the spell. Huh, how do inanimate objects even gain sentience? What the fuck? Kai's inner voice questioned the concept that his parents seemed to have so easily accepted. He turned his attention toward the wands on display, signaling to Kai to come closer to the window. Close your eyes and tell me what you feel. Kai did as instructed and his eyes snapped shut. A few seconds passed, and he couldn't feel anything besides the wind running through his air. Dada, I don't think this is working. Ray let out a soft sigh. Send your mana toward the wand's dummy. Huh? How was I supposed to know that? Kai snapped back as his father finished the sentence, his face reddening slightly. He controlled the mana inside his mana core, moving it outwardly, penetrating the glass, and touching the wands. The moment his mana made contact with them, a wave of negative emotions bombarded Kai's mind, sending him tumbling backward, cold sweat dripping down his forehead as he inhaled with difficulty. What the fuck was that? So many emotions, so, such intense hatred and regret, the agony. His mother helped him up, shooting an angry glare at Ray, who did nothing to protect their son's mind. Are you alright? She asked as she brushed the dust off his clothes. Yeah, I... I think, what was that? Ray also helped clean some of the dust off, as he explained. That's what happens to wands once they are abandoned or lose their owner. Just like humans who lose their loved ones, they become bitter with hatred, anger, agony, and grief. Elena inhaled deeply before she sighed, urging Kai and Ray to enter the shop faster, afraid that her husband may implant some other weird thoughts in their son's head. The shop wasn't too big but it was spacious enough for several people to stare at the different materials on the shelves, which were filled with different colored wood, crystals, and powders, as well as magic stones, books, weird colored liquors, and a lot more unidentifiable objects and animalistic body parts. At the back of the shop stood a stall, on top of which was a scale, a few empty bags, and some lifeless wands. Behind it was a shopkeeper, his natural gray hair and wrinkled face giving away his age. He wore a simple linen shirt and pants, 
and a green vest embroidered with dark threads adding to his merchant aura. He was short and chubby. His dark and dead eyes lit up for a second, and a wide smile manifested on his face when he saw Kai and his parents enter. A wide smile manifested on his face as he greeted them in an excited tone. Ray, Elena, you brats, when were you thinking of visiting me? He waved his hand, revealing a long and deep scar on his forearm. Gramps, it's been too long since last time, how have you been? Ray hugged the man tightly, causing the old shopkeeper's face to turn slightly blue. Finally, Ray let go, and the old man coughed lightly. Rascal, you still won't let it go? He asked as he adjusted his posture, and without waiting for Ray to answer, he turned his attention toward Kai, who was sitting quietly behind his mother. And I assume this is your kid? The old man caressed his dirty beard while observing Kai, a hint of surprise appearing on his face. What's your name, kid? Kai stepped forward, shaking the old man's hand as he greeted him. My name is Kai. Ha ha, good, good. The old shopkeeper shook Kai's hand rapidly as he said, So young yet already a one-star large core mage, so close to a two-star mage. You taught him well. Aye, you flatter me. Ray smiled and laughed proudly. In contrast, Kai was visibly shocked. How does this old man know my exact rank? I was talking to Elena. The old man quickly rectified, not wanting to let anything fuel Ray's ego. I can already tell what you're here for. Tell me, child, what elements do you have the best affinity with? Kai glanced at his parents, who nodded approvingly. I am all of them, he said, feeling slightly embarrassed. All of them. I see, I see. All of them? Shock and amazement manifested on the old man's face, his mouth staying agape as the last words left his mouth. Not even the king, the strongest man to ever live on the continent had so many affinities at birth. Is this kid a monster? Even his mother only had four, and that is already extremely rare. The old man glanced at Elena and Ray, unable to believe Kai's words. They nodded in response, barely able to contain their pride. He fixed his clothes and straightened his back, clearing his throat with a light cough as he said, It will take me a while to make it, maybe three or four weeks, perhaps even more. Let's talk about the details. Usually, magicians only have one to two elements. The most gifted ones can even have four but I've never heard of anyone having all of them. Not naturally anyway. He walked back behind the counter, rummaging through the shelves before saying, I assume you want a wand with all six elements. Regardless I must have you pick two elements for the choice of material. Kai inhaled deeply and thought carefully about which of the elements he'd like or even need the most. Fire seems like a pretty good choice. It's versatile enough and easy to use, and it also looks the coolest for the second element. I'm not sure, eh, does it really matter? I want fire and dark elements. He replied nonchalantly, but his father's face lit up immediately, leading Elena to roll her eyes. The old shopkeeper's eyes shone with enthusiasm, smiling lightly as he said, Wonderful, then give me a little bit of your hair, that way the wand will recognize you as the owner. I will send word once it's ready and you can come to pick it up. You should already be a two-star mage by then. Thanks, Gramps. We owe you one. Ray said as he plucked a strand of Kai's hair. A soft wince escaped his lips. What can you owe an old man like me? Just pay up, you brat. You're not getting away this time. The old man berated Ray, and a low giggle escaped Elena's lips. Thank you, Grandpa. Make sure you stay healthy, all right? She thanked him and they left the store quietly the old man's gaze lingering on the trio long after the doors closed. A six-element wand was only made once, by the king, the ruler of the old world. He unified all races during his reign, imprisoned us, and ruled the whole continent as one country, and even then, he only acquired his sixth element. This will be my magnum opus. His mind raced with ideas as he mumbled to himself, opening a door just behind the stall and entering the room it hid. 5. Chapter 11. Hidden Danger. The bell chimed as the door closed behind them, and the kingdom's busy main street appeared in their view after turning a few corners. The hundreds of bright, artificial lights of the lamp posts illuminated the road with a beautiful yellowish hue. Elena held Kai's hand as they passed the dozens of stalls, filled to the brim with food, toys, and entertainment. The music of a few bards echoed on the street which, accompanied by the infatuating smell of freshly grilled meat and vegetables, created a lively atmosphere in the bleak kingdom. As they wandered through the long street, passing numerous people of different races, 
A question lingered in his mind. Just who was that old man? He was able to tell my rank at a glance. And he was really friendly with my parents. Should I ask them? Ray noticed Kai's troubled expression, and his lips parted as he asked. What is it? Are you hungry? Do you want some fried dragonite wings? Kai shook his head and halted his footsteps, and asked as he met his father's gaze. Who was that old shopkeeper? How come you know him? His dad scratched the back of his head and sighed, kneeling in front of Kai. He ruffled his hair and said with a hint of melancholy. That old man, he's someone who has helped us when we were in danger. If it weren't for him, I'm not sure we'd be here right now. Don't worry Kai. His mother added. He's a good person. You can treat him as your own grandfather. Unfortunately we weren't able to tell him about you just yet. We had our reasons. Please understand. That's weird. Why couldn't they tell him about me? Whatever. As long as my parents trust him, then I will as well. He didn't voice his thoughts, and instead continued strolling through the city. It's my first time in the kingdom itself as well. Are my parents some sort of criminals? He excitedly observed the products as they walked past the stalls, his eyes widening at the large assortment of goods, including those that he'd never seen before in both lifetimes. However, one stall had some things Kai recognized objects from his old world, or at least, similar in nature and looks. A few plums in the shape of horned rabbits and wyverns, wooden puppets tied to strings, and exquisitely crafted wooden boats that had their name Titanic engraved on the side. Must be a coincidence. He thought as he glanced at the vendor a middle-aged human, who raised his eyebrow upon noticing Kai. A faint smile formed on his face as he let out a light scoff, and he asked, Watcha looking at, kid? I'm looking at you, shithead. Kai stepped back as he involuntarily said, shocking his parents and himself. The human burst out in laughter, unbothered by the reply. He watched Kai get dragged away by the ear while his mother apologized. Haha, don't worry, it was fun meeting you. The noisy street grew louder and louder toward the center, where a small square was located. In the middle of it was a small stage, large enough for three people to comfortably move about. Surrounding it were a few crystals sparkling with different colors as they rotated around it. Next to it, a group of dark-skinned men were singing an upbeat song on drums and string instruments, their pleasant music filling the square with a festive atmosphere. Atop the stage, three enchanting women moved in a mesmerizing dance, their bodies melting into the pulsating lights. Adorned with ebony skin, their alluring figures were accentuated by the multiple red lines etched across their bodies, their luscious dark hair perfectly swayed with their graceful movements. With stunning yellow eyes and bewitching smiles, they captivated the audience, casting a spell on all who beheld their beauty. A few dozen people, mostly men, of varying races surrounded them, cheering in unison as the three performed their number, their eyes sparkling with a faint light that glowed rhythmically with their audiences. Demons! Ray muttered under his breath, his voice barely a whisper, but carrying a hint of deep-seated hatred. Kai turned toward his father with a bewildered expression. His mother pulled Ray away from the stage, and walked toward the outskirts of the square, where a flavorful, irresistible smell inundated their nostrils. A few barbecue stands were lined up one after the other, manned by both men and women of the lizard folk and human race. The sizzling meat of rabbits and porks, finely seasoned with the best condiments their kind had to offer, attracted many customers, patiently waiting in long lines. Kai's senses were completely overwhelmed by the cacophony of voices and the amalgamation of a dozen different smells, despite their individually pleasant flavors. A sudden wave of dizziness hit him, causing his head to become blank and unsteady on his feet. He staggered backward, but managed to regain his footing just in time to avoid falling down. Kai, what's wrong? His father asked, placing a hand on his shoulder to help him stand straight. Are you feeling all right? Uh, yeah, just a bit overwhelmed by everything. I'll be fine. He answered, his head still aching in pain. I just need to sit down for a bit. Elena picked Kai up as they passed quickly left the square, the smells gradually fading away as the bustling street got quieter. A warm sensation ran through his scalp as his mother used healing magic to calm his headache. He closed his eyes and leaned on her chest, breathing softly as he yawned. Oh? Are you tired? His mother asked as she tenderly caressed his face, only getting a small nod in response. Well, it is quite late already. We should be heading home. Ray said as he walked alongside Elena, glancing at Kai's tired figure as he cuddled and got more comfortable. Isn't he heavy? Elena shook her head, 
a faint smile appearing on her face as her loving gaze rested on Kai. Not at all, I feel like he's too light, I should prepare him more food. A melodious chuckle escaped her lips, with Ray joining in and adding, Indeed, I think I'm a bit light too. He joked as he patted his belly. They walked silently, the sound of their footsteps accompanying them on the gradually empty street. Very few stalls were open this further out, and those that were had few clients. The houses were derelict crack-covered walls and open roofs. The broken windows and doors made way for the chilly air to penetrate the empty rooms. They were inhabited by a few, grotesque-looking people their skin was stuck to their bones, and faces so white they looked as if they had rolled in flour. Their hungry red eyes glowed as they peeked at the couple through the destroyed buildings. Drool flowed down their oversized shirts as their fangs grew and shrunk rapidly, but none dared approach Kai and his parents, slowly hiding away in the shadows as they passed by. The situation is worse. Last time there weren't as many, Ray said as he quickened his pace. I fear things will go out of control in a few years. Elena nodded as she hurried as well. Hanyard, that bastard, what is he doing? Her voice carried a hint of repressed anger and hatred. Her lower lip trembled as she bit down on it, small amounts of blood dripping down her face. Ray wrapped his arm around her shoulders, bringing her body closer to his. I, I'm sorry, he said shakily. If I knew what would happen, stop. We already went over this. It's not your fault. End of discussion. She quickly cut his speech short with an annoyed tone. We can't change the past. We must look into the future and protect the present. A sigh escaped her lips her eyes unconsciously drifting toward Kai, his soft pants sending warmth throughout her whole body. Ray agreed silently, vigilantly watching the owners of the shabby stalls and the sickly figures watching from the shadows. We should hurry. He nudged Elena as they approached the city's exit. An aromatic smell lingered in the air as they passed the few barbecue stalls. A fragrance in particular was unlike any other. It was blander, less sharp and hypnotic but it carried a simplicity rarely found anywhere. Kai unconsciously sniffed the air, and his eyes snapped open. He broke free from his mother's grasp, the enticing smell leading him to walk toward it like a zombie. This smell seems familiar, like something from my old world, from home. His parents followed closely behind him, curious and perplexed by his sudden behavior. Usually he's very reserved, what could be making him act like this? Elena giggled inwardly as her and Ray vigilantly watched over him. Eventually, he reached his destination a small stand man by a shirt, bald and muscular man that sold grilled skewers. The man looked at Kai with a raised eyebrow but didn't say anything, only watching him with an amused expression in his eyes. He snapped out of his trance, dumbstruck by the object that made him act like a mindless zombie searching for brains grilled skewers normal skewers. Albeit the meat is of poorer quality, and is a bit different than what he saw thus far, but it was still pork rabbits and dragonite. What? How could some simple skewers make me act like this? It's true that I used to eat a lot of those when I went out with Nevin but, did I miss them to this extent? Don't tell me, magic skewers? It was the only hypothesis he could come up with that would explain his behavior. His parents looked in confusion at their confused child and the short man, then at the skewers sizzling on the hot grill. We passed by so many skewer stalls on our way here. Elena whispered to Ray. Why did he choose this one? Do you think this means anything? Ray shrugged and said, his voice barely a whisper. Must be the ingredients or the way this man cooks them. She nodded in agreement and handed Kai one silver coin. Go on, buy as many as you want. He accepted the silver coin and inspected it for a bit. So this is what their money looks like. The coin was about two centimeters in diameter about the size of a nickel. The engravings on it depicted the face of a man unknown to Kai with short hair and a piercing gaze. The letters on it were almost evenly spread around its circumference, spelling a simple yet imposing name the king. I bet their currency system is like that of those old school morks. How original he rolled his eyes before handing the coin to the shopkeeper. As many as this can buy, please. The manna accepted the coin and handed him five skewers filled to the brim with meat, one piece almost falling off the stick. Thank you. He said before he began devouring the skewers like a dog that hadn't eaten in days. Ray looked at his son eating with such appetite and couldn't help but swallow. You're not going to give one to your old man? He reached for one as he asked Kai, who paused briefly, his mouth still full of skewers. No, he said quickly turning around. 
Elena let out a soft giggle as his father's mouth was wide open in shock. He quickly rummaged through his pockets and pulled out two silver coins, handing them over to the bald man. Another ten skewers, please. What? Kai quickly said, having yet to swallow the food in his mouth as he protested. No fair. But as he was dirt poor, he couldn't compete with his dad. Elena's hand flew to her mouth as she did her best to hide her laughter, and even the stone-faced short man let out a small chuckle at the sight of the comedic duo. Ray handed one skewer over to Elena, and started devouring the skewers right in front of Kai, the grease and sauces spilling in his thick beard, much to his son's envy. Bully! A sudden explosion reverberated through the air, jolting the group up, their eyes snapping toward the source far into the distance. A huge cloud of dust rose from the ground, sending debris, food and liquids everywhere. A grotesque creature dashed out of the cloud, running away from a tall man dressed in a military uniform. The beast held another man wearing a similar uniform to the one chasing him, with a little less decorum. His eyes pleaded for help, and he weakly swayed his arms as he tried to lessen the beast's grip. Blood gushed out of his mouth as the creature's long, bony fingers gripped him tightly by the waist. Every step it took shook the cobblestone pavement, and it ran through a dozen stalls before slowing down. It brought the man up to its mouth, which was filled with razor-sharp teeth and two sharp, protruding fangs as long as the blade of a sword. It bit into the terrified vampire, ripping his arm clean off before chewing on it. The sound of crunching bones accompanied by the man's painful scream resounded on the street. Stop it! His deep voice resounded loudly on the street, signaling a few guards that were stationed nearby in case discord were to break out. The creature ran straight toward them, its gigantesque, humanoid form sent shivers down their spine, their pupils widening upon seeing the skin stuck to its bones, and its glowing, blood-red eyes stared them down as its bloody lips parted, letting out a primal roar. The two guards stood shoulder to shoulder with their spears braced to meet its charge. This enraged the monster, and it tightened its grip around the man, and using his body as a club it sent both of the guards sprawling in the derelict houses. It looked around, its almost non-existent nose sniffing the air, seemingly looking for something. Its eyes widened and snapped toward Kai's direction, immediately rushing toward him. His food got stuck in his throat as his entire body trembled upon seeing the immense, bloodthirsty creature run toward him. His heart jumped a few beats. His limbs went soft, and the skewers hit the ground with a soft thud. Cold sweat ran down his back, and his pupils widened as images from more than seven years ago flashed in his head, his gruesome and painful death. His mind turned blank and his breathing ragged as he struggled to inhale. The creature's malicious aura spread over to him long before it actually arrived, and he fell to his knees as fear took over his body. His pupils dilated as he stared at the beast, his consciousness slowly fading away. 6. Chapter 12, The Wand The creature pounced on Kai with great speed, creating a blast of air wherever it passed, blowing the guards back, and destroying the few stalls lined up on the street. It appeared in front of Kai in mere seconds, its long and skinny arm reaching for his throat with its bloody claws. He instinctively shivered, but his body wouldn't listen to his inner cries of despair. He could feel the scythe of death brushing past his throat, images of his former death flashing in his mind. Death once again? It was then that a bright light descended from the sky, collapsing upon the creature which instantly turned into ashes, its silent death shocking the onlookers. Kai, are you all right? Kai. His mother picked up the unresponsive Kai, and checked for any wounds. Thankfully you aren't harmed, she said as she embraced her son, whose skin began to turn blue, his wide pupils staring into the void. No way, am I dead again. Ray quickly pulled out a small pouch from his spatial ring, taking out a few grams of a weird yellow powder. He fed it to Kai, who quickly fell asleep, his face slowly returning to a healthy rose. The man dressed in a black military uniform arrived shortly after, his small and red eyes rapidly scanning the scene before he turned to Ray and Elena. He didn't look unusual, he was tall, with short dark hair and a short balboss style beard. He wore a stern look on his face as he made his way to the couple, and he raised an eyebrow upon seeing Kai's silver hair. Elena's eyes burned with rage, and she handed Kai to her husband before her voice erupted in the man's ears. What is the meaning of this? Her shaky voice resounded in the air, and everyone's eyes were glued to the military official. Madam, 
Sir, I am terribly sorry for what has happened, I. He tried to apologize, struggling to find the words suited to the couple who nearly lost their child. This was my fault. We detected the lytic too late. I hope you can accept my sincere apology. He bowed deeply for a few seconds, then straightened himself, his stoic expression reappearing on his face. Shortly after, the guards and military men who were chasing the beast joined the man, scratching their heads as they looked around. Captain, where? Where is it? One of them asked, bewildered by the sudden disparition of the enormous monster. You're looking at it. The captain pointed towards a pile of ashes by Elena's feet, which was being slowly dispersed by the wind. This, was it that light? We will take our leave now, if you don't mind. Ray interrupted them as he turned to leave with his wife. But we are yet to forgive anyone, he said angrily before disappearing behind a corner. The guards and military men watched the departing couple silently, and they hurried to collect the creature's ashes. Captain, one of the men dressed in a similar black uniform to his said, Don't you think these two look familiar? The man seemed to be deep in thought, and he stroked his beard as he answered. No, I don't think I do. He turned his attention towards the ashes, the heat from the light still lingering on their surface. Me and my soldiers barely wounded this beast, but a light magic spell turned it to dust in an instant. Could it be them? I need to report this. In the middle of the city stood an enormous castle. Its outer walls were made of dark brick and the inner court was paved with beautiful white stones. A single, gigantic gate isolated it from the world, and guards marched atop the walls, patrolling the interior and exterior. A huge throne, made out of a beautiful dark wood and decorated by red cushions stood alone in the back of a huge room. A long, gorgeous red yet dirty red carpet divided the chamber in two. Two statues depicting a golden dragon lay on each side of the carpet, showing the importance of this room. On the throne sat a man dressed in a black robe, decorated by golden engravings in the shape of a dragon. He had long, black hair, and his face was shaven clean of any beard. A long and deep scar ran diagonally across his face from his right eyebrow to the base of his nose. The sound of metal tapping on wood echoed rhythmically in the throne room as the man's impatience grew, his cold, crimson eyes staring at the captain. So you're saying, there's a chance there in the kingdom? The captain nodded, swallowing the saliva stuck in his throat, and his shivering lips parted as he said. Why yes, although they didn't look anything like vampires, I sent a small squad of novice shadow soldiers but the couple disappeared before they could even catch up. He quickly explained, his gaze fixated on the floor, not daring to lift it by an inch. Not to mention their kid, yes? The man on the throne stopped his impatient tapping. His fierce gaze locked onto the man. Their kid had silver hair. The man finished his sentence, and his eyes squinted as the long-haired man's voice rang in his ears. Enough! He ordered as he rose from the throne slowly walking toward the man. Dismissed. Yes, your highness. The captain quickly left, leaving the man by himself, whose expression turned sour, and a myriad of emotions could be seen on his face. A dense aura descended upon the room as the man gritted his teeth in anger, cracks slowly appearing on the walls and floor, as well as on the golden statues that began to crumble. Blood dripped down the carpet from his clenched fists, which shook violently before the man let out a painful scream. The room returned to normal as the scream faded away, his face returned to normal, and he touched the scar on his face as he gave out a simple order. Find them, they must be using disguise magic. Yes sir! A dozen voices said in unison as twelve men appeared from the shadows, quickly dispersing in six groups before disappearing. The long-haired man slowly walked toward a large portrait, a half of which depicted a tall and blurry man his large, red eyes complementing his short and dark hair, along with his thick and stuffy beard. His head was adorned with a small, black crown. The long-haired man gazed at the ground right below the portrait, where that same crown lay on the ground, its beautiful ebony surface dirted by streaks of dark blood. It has come to this at last. The man voiced his thoughts as his gaze drifted toward the other half of the portrait, which looked to have been torn and burned. The only proof of its existence was a small, silver-colored piece. I will cherish the opportunity you gave me, Estra, he said to himself, a light chuckle escaping his lips as he made his way back to the throne. Small explosions resounded in the backyard, dust and debris flying everywhere, steam seething from the water-covered scorched ground. 
Unnatural looking holes and weirdly shaped rocks covered the once beautifully decorated earth. Boom. Another explosion rang in Kai's ears. Sweat dripped down his body as he panted heavily. The stone dummy in front of him was blown to bits, the bigger pieces emitting smoke from their scorched surface. His gaze drifted toward the fire stone he held in his hand, gripping it tightly as it crumbled to pieces. A frustrated sigh escaped his lips as he sat down on the ground, throwing away the fine dust covering his palm. Well done, Kai, Ray said as he approached his son with a thumbs up. Your basic spells are at an intermediate level now but you've still got a long way to go. He pulled out a water pouch from his spatial ring and sat next to Kai as he handed it to him. Thanks, Kai said, grabbing the water pouch, taking a few big sips before exhaling in satisfaction, but a defeated expression rested on his face. Even after becoming a two-star mage, only my mana pool increased, my weakness. It's disgusting. If I weren't saved by that light two months ago, he shook his head as he voiced his concerns. But it's still not enough. Ray glanced at his son, patting him on the back before looking into the distance, seemingly at nothing, or perhaps at memories. Don't beat yourself up, you weren't even a two-star magician before, and even if you were, he dragged on his sentence as he looked around, and his pupils widened once realization hit him. He quickly stood up, dragging Kai up with him as he scrambled to clean the yard. Shit! He let out an involuntary curse as he pulled out his wand. I was too caught up in the training. I didn't realize how much of a mess we made. Kai inspected the backyard, and a shiver ran down his spine at the scene. It looks like someone fought a war here. Hurry, we need to clean up before Dash. Ray stopped mid-sentence as an angry voice rang in his ears from behind him. Before what? He gulped and slowly turned around, the image of his angry wife slowly appearing in his vision. Before Grandpa calls us over, haha. He let out a nervous laugh as he scratched the back of his head, and an awkward smile manifested on his face. Elena rolled her eyes and a scoff escaped her lips. He just sent us word that Kai's wand is ready. We'll go get it while you clean up this mess. Ray's smile froze, but he lowered his head in defeat and began leveling the ground. The mother-son duo left for the store after Kai changed his clothes, opting for a black cloak with a hood that would help hide his long silver hair. As per Elena's request, why would she make me wear such an ugly thing, ever since two months ago? The magic store quickly appeared in their vision, along with the image of the old shopkeeper waving toward them to hurry up. Come on in, fast! He pushed them through the door, creaking as it opened, accompanied by the small chime of its bell. Follow me. He led them in a small room behind the stall. It was filled with magic crystals and all kinds of wood and on a table glued to the back wall lay a weird robotic hand that held a wand in its pincers. The old man carefully retrieved the wand from its grasp, staring at it with glee before handing it to Kai, who took a closer, curious look at it. His eyes widened in surprise as he held it in his hand the texture of the dark red wood reminded him of an old branch he used to play with as a kid in his former world. Its thick base was decorated with three fire crystals, a faint light emitting from their surface. Higher up were two black crystals, which, if it weren't for the stark contrast in colors, would seem almost invisible. Finally, on the top a smaller, heavier dark crystal was located. This wand is unique, a magnificent combination of magic and craftsmanship. The old shopkeeper bragged as a wide smile manifested on his face. The wand itself is made from a hundred-year lock tree, one of the best materials for fire and dark magic conductivity he explained before pointing toward the crystals. Although we usually use a few magic crystals to cut costs, and mainly because they are more than enough for your average two-element magician, I decided to only use crystals for your wand, and even better they are interchangeable. Elena raised her eyebrow slightly upon hearing the old man's last sentence, and she curiously asked as she took a closer look at the wand. Grandpa, what do you mean by that? How can a wand change crystals? Aren't they fused with the wood? Ho ho ho. The old man laughed while playing with his beard. Normally that would be the case, but that's only because changing them is impractical for your average magician. But Kai over here isn't your average magician, he's someone with all six elements unlocked. I thought it would be a waste if he could only effectively use two or three, so I tried to make more crystal slots. But every time I did, the wand structure would break apart. He pulled out a small pouch, the contents within jingling as he placed it on the table and beckoned the wand toward him, 
which flew straight into his hand. Then I thought why not just change the crystals as he sees fit? I used a combination of modern and ancient wand crafting techniques, and made the wood slightly magnetic toward the crystals. That way they would lock in place and form a connection once inserted in the slot. As he said that, he made another hand gesture, and the crystals within the wand flew out of their place, arranging themselves neatly on the table as six crystals of different colors floated from the pouch, clicking in place in the wand's empty slots. And this is the result, a modular wand! The old man showed off his creation with pride before handing it over to Kai once again, along with the pouch of crystals. I carved all of them to fit perfectly in the wand. If you lose any of them you will need to come back here or carve them yourself. Kid, I suggest you start practicing. He explained with a slight grin plastered on his face. Grandpa, you have our gratitude. We will make sure to pay back this debt no matter what it takes. Elena hugged the old man tightly, his bones popping under her force. Aye, Elena, aye. He winced in pain, hoping that she would let go. Sorry. She released her hug and hastily apologized before attempting to heal him. It's fine, don't worry about this, these old bones of mine are still strong. He said with a light cough as he moved away from her. I think that was enough payback though. He chuckled before turning his attention to Kai. I wish I could see you perform your first spells with that beauty. Take good care of it. I will. Kai replied, placing the pouch and wand in his pockets as he turned to leave with his mother. Thanks a lot, Grandpa. He sincerely thanked the man as the bell's soft jingle marked their departure. To think that I was able to create such a unique wand for them brat's child. He's a dragon among men, just like his parents. He thought as a feeling of intense pride rose up within him. I wonder what great feats he will achieve. Ray was in the midst of cleaning when he heard the front door open, and immediately dropped whatever he was doing, rushing to the living room. He saw Kai, who was holding the wand in his hand, and asked, feeling more excited than his son. How is it? Do you like it? I don't know dad, I can't use any kind of magic with it. He played around with the wand, attempting to send his mana into it, but nothing ended up happening. His father curiously approached and inspected the wand. Did you make a bond with it? He asked as he glanced at Elena and Kai with a bewildered expression. Elena's face reddened and her cheeks flushed red. I completely forgot about that. Kai, on the other hand, was staring at the two of them like an idiot, unable to follow the conversation. What bond? Can I just use it? Ray scoffed at the statement before explaining. The first time a wand is created a bond must be made between it and the owner. As for why, I would say because the wand has yet to gain a spirit, so a connection must be created in order for it to be used. In order for a bond to be created, the wand must be infused with the owner's magic signature during its creation, then must be confirmed after. This way only you and you alone can use it until it gains sentience. Kai looked at the wand, seemingly lost in thought before his pupils widened at the realization. I need to give it blood? His parents stared at the boy in silence, their shoulders shaking slightly before they burst out in laughter. Of course not. Where did that even come from? Ray said through bursts of laughter, and plucked out a hair from Kai's head after he calmed down. Ouch again? He complained while rubbing his head. Ray smirked and handed the hair to Kai. Do you remember when we first ordered your wand? Grandpa needed a little bit of your hair, and this was why one's hair contains their magic signature. Now, wrap the hair around the wand. Kai did as instructed and coiled the hair around the wand, and it disappeared in a small, bright flash of light as the wand glowed strongly for a few seconds. He held it tightly in his hand as he looked at it with amazement. Almost immediately, he felt a deep connection with the wand and also something else, something he could not put into words. This aura, small, longing for love, it's just like a child. The aura slowly faded, and he tried to awaken it but it was useless, however, he could feel its existence, he knew it was there, somewhere inside the wand. Let's go try it out. His father prompted them and hurried into the backyard that was yet to be completely cleaned. Kai halted his footsteps after arriving in the yard. His vision fixated on nothing as he remembered something. Dad, look! He took out the crystal pouch from his pocket, and showed his father the method to change the crystals, and chose to fill it with fire crystals under his father's widened eyes. Ray's lips parted, but before he could even say anything he got cut off by Kai. I want to try the secondary spell, Dancing Phoenix. His parents didn't say anything, but the silence was enough confirmation. It's good to be ambitious, 
Even if he fails he shouldn't feel too bad about it. Kai walked in front of his parents, keeping a good distance from them and recalled the spell he had studied. He slowly injected magic into the wand, the fire crystals glowing gradually with a beautiful red light. I see, so that's how it works. He closed his eyes and started dancing almost instinctively. Following the movements in his mind, his steps were timed and spaced perfectly. His consciousness fusing with nature's energy as the mana moved rhythmically in his veins. The mana around him grew denser, and the area became hotter as he murmured in a low voice, O king of the sky, flame lord above all heaven, cleanse my path with fire. At the end of the dance, a small, phoenix-like figure made out of flames floated in front of him. Amazing! Elena happily exclaimed as she joined her hands together, her face beaming with excitement. His parents watched with amazement as the phoenix grew in size, becoming larger and larger, in almost two seconds it became a mighty, full-fledged, almost photorealistic phoenix. What the dash! Ray was awestruck by the scene in front of him, his heart racing in his chest as he jumped up, pulling out his wand, and immediately casting a few dozen sound isolating and concealing barriers. Just as he was about to let out a sigh of relief, Kai's eyes snapped open, flicking his wand toward the fire-red phoenix, and an almost identical one, but made out of blue fire appeared next to it. Be blue flames? How can he use that? Ray muttered proudly but anxiously. Kai stared at his creation with widened pupils, and as he pointed his wand upward, the two majestic phoenixes launched up in the night sky. Seeing that, Ray flicked his wand toward the sky once again creating another dozen barriers in an attempt to contain the wild magic creatures, who started moving in the same pattern that Kai was doing earlier. At the end of their dance, they met in the middle, where their collision created a huge explosion, splitting the sky in two contrasting colors, a rain of fire falling down on the ground as the flames faded away. Kai let out a satisfied, exhausted sigh, and fell asleep almost immediately, nearly hitting the ground. Got you, Elena said as she caught her son holding him tightly in her arms. Are you all right, dear? She turned to Ray, who had a few drops of sweat dripping down his forehead. Yeah, it wasn't that hard to contain, although it was pretty unstable. He replied as he heaved a sigh of relief. Our son, he's a genius. 5. Chapter 13 Leaving the Safety of the Walls A short distance away from the ruined walls of the former vampire kingdom, two short figures chased each other across the ancient buildings of the old city. The remnants of the once glorious empire were now only a pile of rubble and useless stones. The walls had lost their former glory. The two figures, a boy and a girl, ran through what was once a beautiful, lively village. Its big, derelict houses told a story from ages ago. Its black cobblestone pavement, now brittle and broken into pieces, trembled as the two crushed it under their weight. They dashed past an old fountain. The dirty ceramic statues that once depicted their king were now nothing more than a moldering sign of a glorious past. Kai, wait up! The girl's voice rang behind the boy, who only gave her a silent glance before he turned around, running faster toward the edge of the town with a faint smirk on his face. Kana pouted, and pulled out a green crystal as she yelled toward Kai. Fine, if you're going to be rude then I won't be polite either. Swift step! She used the spell and her body glowed with a faint light as her speed suddenly increased by threefold. She quickly caught up to him and touched his shoulder as she passed him, kicking up dust behind her. Kai's smirk disappeared, replaced by a helpless expression as he cried. You're cheating. Kana turned around and stuck her tongue out. All's fair in a race. Kai's eyes burned with determination after seeing the girl's cheeky attitude, and he sped himself up with a similar spell catching up to her almost in the same breath. He passed her rather quickly, and glancing behind him, he saw her joyous expression had turned to one of defeat. Am I really going to seriously fight with a brat? Kai contemplated inwardly as he saw the finish line they set the old, abandoned town square, appear within his view. Even though she is better than me at wind magic, I forget it. I'm the older brother after all. He let out a sigh as he tripped himself, falling face first on the ground allowing Kana to easily pass him. He got up, dodging the broken pieces of the ancient cobblestone pavement. He arrived in front of her in barely any time. I win, she said, panting, a wide smile plastered on her face, revealing her tiny, sharp fangs. That's because I tripped. Kai acted like it was a mistake, and made it sound like an excuse, much to Kana's delight. That was your mistake. She giggled, 
putting the crystal away before placing her hands on her knees as she caught her breath. He remained silent, inhaling deeply as he slowly regained his stamina. Kana straightened herself as well, the both of them were now standing shoulder to shoulder. They had both grown taller, Kana was about the same height as Kai, just a little bit shorter, and both of them had dark crimson eyes their race's signature. Her eyes were big, much like her mother's, but she had her father's thin lips and small nose. Her long and curly hair was the pale gold of a wheat field, and she wore a red dress and black shoes a gift from her mother. Kai's long silver hair was tied in a ponytail, and his facial features resembled Ray's a lot small eyes, with a sharp chin and small nose, but he inherited his mother's plump lips. He looked with curiosity at Kana, who let out soft pants as she regained her breath. I am close to a medium core two star magician, and I have a wand, while she is only at the medium core one star rank, and only uses crystals as catalysts. Am I stupid? She noticed his burning gaze, and her face flushed red as she nervously asked. WW what is it? Nothing, he replied calmly. I was just thinking about what to wear for your birthday. Ah that, don't worry about it, just wear whatever makes you comfortable. He nodded slightly as he said. You do the same as well. They walked over to an old stone bench, jumping up as soon as they sat on its chilling and wet surface. So cold, they explored the ancient town, their eyes widening as they walked through the historical buildings, and getting a scare upon seeing the occasional skeletons, unknown of which race they belonged to, due to their missing skull. I can't believe our parents agreed to let us explore this far out, Kana said as she walked shoulder and shoulder to Kai their footsteps resounding in the dark and creepy alleyways. They only agree because of the emergency device I invented, although it's only effective in a small perimeter. It should be enough from here to my house, he said, a light chuckle escaping his lips as he pridefully explained. Yeah, thank you for that, you're really smart. How did you even come up with that? She asked curiously, failing to notice Kai's nervous expression. I barely explained it to my parents but it should be easier to find an excuse for Kana. I, uh, I wanted to go out and explore, but my parents refused to take me anywhere, so I thought if they could find us in case of any danger maybe that would work. Even I am surprised they agreed. Well, I didn't exactly lie. But how did you create it? Her question pierced through his heart like a whooshing arrow, and he gulped as his nervous lips parted. It's not that complicated. I, uh, followed someone's advice and started carving crystals. And after my parents refused to take my anywhere I thought that by using two crystals that had the same mana waves, I could create a device that would allow one to detect the other once mana was sent into it. As they explored the abandoned buildings, finding nothing of value and getting creeped out by armored skeletons of long dead warriors, they finally reached the end of the town, marked by a huge, wooden gate, most of its frame eaten away by the rain and wind. Both of them halted in their footsteps, watching the large, tempting gate with the curious gaze of a child. The green canopy of the huge trees peeked out from behind the walls, and the sweet song of the chirping birds rang in their ears. Goosebumps spread over their body as a wild idea ran through their heads at the same time. Should we go outside? The two stared at each other, gulping as they began walking forward toward the unguarded gate. I know this is a bad idea. It definitely is, 100% a bad idea, but the gate is right there, the outside world. Kai yelled at himself inwardly, his gut telling him not to cross that barrier, but he couldn't help himself. The excitement of finally exploring a fantasy world sending adrenaline all over his body. It can't be that dangerous, right? He told himself, despite being aware of the rough geography and the dangers lurking within. Most of the monsters in the vicinity aren't even two star, it should be fine. Finally, he arrived in front of the gate the other side barely visible through the numerous holes decorating the green and dry wood. He removed the useless plank that acted as a lock, and pushed it open, its hinges groaning as they moved after countless years of rest. The world outside the walls appeared before them a dark and moist natural path surrounded by trees taller than the walls, covered by lush green vegetation, a stark contrast to the dead kingdom they grew up in. The enormous trees provided the much-needed protection against the harsh rays of sunlight which burned stronger and brighter compared to the ones covering the kingdom. They inhaled deeply at the same time, and took their first step outside the safe haven of the city. Kana wrapped her hands around herself as she shivered nervously, feeling overwhelmed by the completely different atmosphere. The humidity in the air caused her hair to straighten, 
and she let out light sneezes as she trailed behind Kai. In comparison, he was feeling nostalgic, the scene before him reminiscent of the forests from his old world. Albeit, the trees were much smaller. Regardless, he could not help but be amazed by the biodiversity of the forest. There were at least a few dozen different species of plants. The grass and the surrounding plants were of a dark shade of green, with a few flowers and bushes having a reddish hue. Thick vines traveled on the cold ground, climbing up the gigantic trees, decorating them with a few pink flowers that sprouted every dozen meters. Accompanying it was a bright green, moss-like plant that similarly climbed up toward the tree's canopy. They passed a few fruit-looking plants, but they decided against picking them. The bushes and tall grass rustled as they advanced, and a few small animals such as horned rabbits and large squirrels ran away from them as they passed by their location. A few smaller reptiles fled in horror as well. The ground gradually flattened, with only a few patches of grass growing over the beaten ground, and the poorly concealed traces of a separate road that lead toward the kingdom could still be observed. Kai's heart suddenly skipped a beat as a shiver ran down his spine, his gut feeling telling him to be alert. We should go back, he said, his voice barely a whisper. Before she could say anything, he grabbed her hand and started rushing the same way they came from. His pulse rose rapidly as his mind and body became alert. Adrenaline coursed through his muscles. He tightened his grip around Kana's arm, causing her to wince in pain. But he didn't stop. Uneasiness shadowing his mind, he pulled out a green crystal and used swift step, reducing the air resistance around his body. The wind blew his hair back as his speed increased slightly. But the panic in his mind only grew with each passing second. Kai, what's going on? Kana struggled to speak as the air blew out the oxygen in her lungs, her mind becoming lighter, about to pass out. Kana! He stopped and quickly shook her, causing her eyelids to twitch rapidly. She inhaled deeply, coughing as color returned to her face. Just tell me, what's going on? She pleaded in a weak voice, her eyes having yet to regain focus. I have a feeling we're being followed, watched. He paused briefly, trying his best to find the right word. Hunted, a shiver ran down their spine as the word left his mouth, the looming feeling of danger becoming increasingly stronger. He frantically looked around, trying to find, or hoping not to find, the source of his uneasiness. They traced their steps as he listened carefully, his ears twitching at the slightest sound, his heart skipping a beat every time the grass rustled, and he jumped up every time they accidentally crushed a fallen branch. He suddenly halted his footsteps. Kana stopping right behind him as she looked around, frightened by Kai's reactions. His pupils widened as his eyes snapped toward a rustling bush located to their right, where two yellow eyes slowly became larger, as their owner slowly walked out of the vegetation. Its white fur shone under the few rays of sunlight that sneaked through the dense canopy. Its imposing size towered over the two children as it limpidly made its way toward them. Their bodies shivered with fear, the lips of their open mouths trembled and their pupils widened as the creature stopped right in front of them, blocking their only path of retreat. Kai's mind was buzzing. His heart threatened to jump out of his chest as the beast's image appeared in his mind, and almost instantly remembered the name of the canine looming over them. An Oberic! 6. Chapter 14. Hunted. The huge animal stared at them, and Kai's gaze carefully inspected the situation, doing his best to find a way out of this predicament. The Alboric is the descendant of the legendary Fenrir, a huge canine that can perfectly wield any element. Alborics are way weaker than their ancestor, but its huge size and ability to instantly cast Inko's magic makes it a formidable opponent. This one seems to be a cub though. A wave of regret washed over him as he recalled the information written in a book about the beast. Damn it, I should have read all of it, maybe I would have found a way out. He clenched his fists as his teeth let out a harsh scraping sound and he put Kana behind him as he stared at the Alboric. He inspected the creature, its muscular body hidden behind a thick layer of snow-white fur. Its hungry yellow eyes were fixated on them, ready to attack at the slightest sudden movement. Something isn't right. Kai recalled another piece of information that he glanced over. Isn't it supposed to be in a pack? Are we surrounded or... His gaze drifted toward a red line on the creature's leg. It's alone. He swallowed as he gently pulled out his wand from his back pocket, Kana following suit with an assortment of crystals that clashed softly in her fists. The beast's ears twitched as the sound rang in its ears, taking on a fighting stance as it snarled at the two. 
Kai also took a fighting position, clenching his wand tightly as his lips parted, his voice barely above a whisper. We need to restrain its movements, then either run away or hit it with all we have. Kana nodded, her still trembling pupils burning with determination, and she patiently waited for Kai to get her directions. Huh, why do I feel such confidence in him? She looked at his back, which wasn't that much bigger than hers, but at that moment it looked like an imposing mountain blocking her from harm's way. He glanced at her with guilt-ridden eyes, his stomach dropping as he gritted his teeth. I knew it was dangerous. I knew it too well. Why did I let my curiosity get the better of me? His wand trembled in his hand as he tightened his grip around it. The alboric let out a low howl as its fur flashed brightly. It's casting Inko's magic, and so quick too. How is this possible? Kai exclaimed in shock, pointing his wand toward the ground beneath the creature's feet. Still, an alboric cub should only be able to cast a few body enchantment spells. The speed one will be tricky to deal with. He quickly murmured a set of syllables, and the crystals on his wand grew with a fierce light, especially the finely carved, small brown crystal placed on the very tip. Restrain his movements, Kai said toward Kana as the spell left his wand, the earth beneath the Albrecht's feet instantly turning soft. Kana followed suit, her blue crystals lighting up as she finished chanting, turning the soft earth into a deep mud puddle. The beast's body quickly sank into the muddy earth and it howled angrily as it was unable to quickly break itself free. Its body lit up once again, slightly growing in size as it unshackled one of its paws, and using the dry ground as an anchor it rapidly tried to pull itself up. Kana, use air blast at my signal. Kai ordered as his wand grew brighter once again, its two white crystals glowing with a faint light. He aimed it toward the Alboric's face, and he used his fingers to count down, indicating to Kana to use air blast at the end. He put his fifth finger down, he and Kana shot their spells simultaneously, one aimed at the Alboric's chin while the other was aimed just above. The air blast made the animal flinch, and it dodged the attack, his gaze ending up right where Kai's spell landed, exploding in a blinding light that lingered in the air for a few seconds. Now, Kai yelled and rushed forward before he started casting another spell, Kana following suit, each of them preparing a binding chant, hoping that it would give them enough time to escape. Fire prison! Water bubble! They cast their spells at the same time as they ran past the giant beast, their magic clashing against each other as it surrounded the alboric, temporarily trapping him. Fireball, water ball, air blast, rock arrow, fire arrow, dark bind, light prism. They cast all the beginner spells they were familiar with toward the creature, violently bombarding it with all sorts of magic as they ran toward the kingdom. Kai fiddled with a small, star-shaped device as he unsuccessfully tried to activate it. However, he couldn't get far before a song that made his heart drop to his stomach rang in his ears. His head snapped backward, staring at the alboric, whose fur glowed with a blinding light. Magic break! He exclaimed as he hastened his footsteps, a cold shiver running down his spine as he felt the god of death's scythe tickling their backs. A low growl rang in his ears and he heard the air split behind him as the alboric dashed toward them in a mad sprint. He grabbed Kana and rolled sideways on the ground, barely dodging its sharp teeth by a hair's breadth. It landed in front of them, fresh blood trickling down its skin, seeping onto the cold ground, spots of its once white fur were now scorched black. Its chest heaved heavily as it stared at the two with a deathly angry glare. Kai's heart threatened to jump out of his chest as he held Kana's hand her blood rushing madly through her veins. His pupils trembled. Looking at the giant alboric blocking their path, he could only be reminded of the day he died. He closed his eyes, images flashing in his mind, the faces of his unwavering, ruthless attacker as his attempts at self-defense were thwarted by his trained blade. It's the exact thing again. He felt a sudden pain in his hand. His eyes snapped open, and he turned toward Kana her frightened expression piercing his heart like a rain of ten thousand arrows. No, it's different this time. He tightened his grip on her hand as images of his current life flashed in his mind, his smiling parents, his soon-to-be teacher, Kana's parents and Kana herself, who trembled in his embrace. Do you still have mana? He asked as his grip tightened around the wand. She nodded lightly, and answered after a few seconds. I have very little mana left, maybe enough for a few air blasts, what about you? Don't worry, we won't be fighting it. He replied as he raised his wand to the sky, 
the crystals on it shining brightly before it unleashed a blinding light. Making the aboric turn away for a brief second, Kana let out a startled gasp as she found herself in Kai's arms, and he cast body-enhancing magic continuously as his speed gradually increased, running away from the dazed beast. What are you doing? She asked as she put her arms around his neck, afraid of falling down. I'm going back to the flat path. If people are regularly walking through the forest, at least one of them must be strong enough to defeat it, he said, gasping for air as his mana continuously depleted in order to maintain the speed enchantment. You're not going to last. Her desperate voice rang in his ears, his trembling hands slowly becoming steadier as he regulated his breathing, and he replied simply. I have to. The alboric's heavy footsteps echoed behind as it gave chase, its wounded leg and body slowing the beast down significantly. Its leg is wounded, paired with the small wounds we gave it, and with the fact that it must also not have a lot of man and stamina left. We have a chance. A slight amount of hope appeared on his flushed red face, and sweat dripped on Ankana's body as large amounts of energy left his body with every passing second. Kai ran through the forest skillfully barely dodging the thick vines and roots slithering on the ground, his clothes tearing up as he ran through the bushes and tall, spiky grass. Kana endured silently, protecting Kai's body with her back, her beautiful clothes ripping apart as she took the worst of the blows. She placed her hand on his chest, near his mana core, and began transferring the mana from her body onto his, helping him last a few more minutes, gradually winning distance over the alboric. Finally, he arrived at the path, and stepped on it without hesitation. Unfortunately, their meager amount of mana still paled in comparison to the cub, who slowly caught up to them, a few dozen meters separating them from its claws. Kai gritted his teeth, and he winced in pain as he forcefully absorbed the mana in his surroundings. A sharp pain spread all over his mana veins as the unrefined mana fueled his speed enchantment, barely managing to halt the speed at which the beast approached. Kana immediately noticed this happening and her eyes broke into tears as she brought her face closer to his hot body. Stop! You'll kill yourself! She pleaded, her tears mixing with their sweat as it ran down her cheeks. He remained silent, his constricted pupils staring straight ahead, his ragged breath transforming into vapor as he painfully exhaled. His mind became lighter due to the small amounts of oxygen in his blood. Must hold on. His muscles tore apart under the undefined mana's violent barrage and his mana veins showed signs of cracking. His vision blurred as he kept running, enduring the searing pain. He let out a silent sigh of relief when he saw a small wall made out of poorly cut wood and an entrance that lacked any doors. He collapsed in front of it, falling on top of Kana as his body relaxed, his consciousness fading away as muffled voices rang in his ears. 5. Chapter 15 The Old Man in the Woods Kai woke up surrounded by darkness, the only source of light was the small fire of a feeble candle laying on a shabby desk by his head. Where am I? Kana. Where is Kana? He tried to get up, but was swiftly stopped by a sharp pain that covered his entire body, his muscles crying every time he moved an inch. I shouldn't have done such a stupid thing, from the very beginning. He lay on his back, silently inspecting the room he found himself in. The walls were made out of animal skins of different sizes sewed together and the door was nothing more than a curtain. The ground was covered with a thick carpet made of animal fur and pelts. He sighed softly, wincing in pain as the air escaped his lungs. Staring at the ceiling, he noticed that it was higher than the actual room he was in, and a faint light poked out from above. I is anyone there? He asked with a hoarse, weak voice. There was no answer except for the soft sound of rapid footsteps. The curtain opened violently as Kana passed through it. Worry plastered on her tearful face. You're awake. Are you all right? He winced in pain as she grabbed his wrist with trembling hands, tears streaming down her flushed face. Of course I am, he said as Kana helped him lean against the railing of the bed, putting a pillow behind his back. How are you, Hick? How are you feeling? She asked, hiccups disturbing her sentence, her big eyes staring at Kai as she continued. The old grandpa said you, you nearly died. Grandpa? Who's grandpa? Kai asked with a perplexed expression. That would be me. A weak and tired voice resounded from behind the curtains as it parted, revealing a small and hunchbacked old man. His head was full of white hair, and a short beard as white as his head decorated his wrinkled face. He wore an old, tattered black robe, 
and his small, piercing eyes stared at Kai, giving him the illusion of being seen right through. He made his way to his left and grabbed his wrist as he checked his pulse. It seems like your vitals are fine, however your mana is in disarray and your mana veins are close to bursting, you won't be able to use them for a few weeks, he said before letting go. A heavy sigh escaped his lips as he grabbed a chair from the corner of the room. You're one lucky brat I tell you that. A few more seconds and your veins would have bursted, followed by your muscles shortly afterward. This method of absorbing mana is very dangerous. Without your core refining it, mana becomes poison, and a very potent one at that. In the best case scenario you could have become a cripple, and in the worst case, he lingered on his last words, unable to finish his sentence as he took a puff from a long, black pipe that suddenly appeared in his hands. The strong smell of mixed herbs caused Kai to cough lightly. However, he continued, you can also consider this a blessing, because your veins were tough enough to expand to twice their size. After they heal, mana will flow much easier and faster in your veins, therefore your cast speed and even meditation time could be reduced. He paused as he took another puff from the black pipe, the formless smoke rising up into the air before fading away. Don't make a habit out of this. In fact, don't ever try pulling such stunts. What would your parents say? The old man glanced at Kai before he could utter a word, the chair creaking as he got up. He stood opposite him and faced away from him. The pressure in the room increased greatly as he brought his pipe to his lips, and he once again took a puff as he turned his head, looking at Kai through the corner of his eye. This, it's even hard to breath. What is this strong magic? His voice deepened as he turned toward Kai, asking, so what brings two little children in this accursed forest? His oppressive voice sent cold shivers down Kai's spine, whose body started trembling from head to toe. He gulped, slowly parting his lips, he said in a feeble voice. We I wanted to see, see the outside world A and I. I brought Kana with me. I put her in danger. The old man nodded, a faint smile manifested on his face as he removed his mana from the surroundings. Good, a man who knows how to take responsibility is a good man, even if you're lying. What? Kai looked with shock at the old man, who laughed and gestured toward Kana. She already told me everything, it's clear both of you are massive idiots. I just wanted to test you, to see what kind of child Ray and Elena have. Kai's mouth was agape as he looked with bewilderment at the old man. How does he know my parents? The elder smirked, however his red eyes reflected his inner thoughts feelings of guilt and regret that haunted him since that fateful day. You did well against Aboric. He quickly changed the subject. Although whatever you did could not be called fighting, as your attacks had close to no synergy, hell, you even completely cancelled out each other's spells a few times. I must say, you suck at fighting. Kai's pupils widened as the old man's words lingered in his ears. Was there such a thing? How come I never heard of that before? Magic synergy. The old man gave Kai a red vial to drink and told him to rest for a few more hours before trying to move around. He left, taking one last puff as the curtains closed behind him, leaving Kana and Kai alone in the room. The two didn't say anything, silence descended upon the room as the two looked around the room, occasionally glancing at each other before looking away. Kai let out a heavy sigh, breaking the silence, and said, I'm sorry Kana, we shouldn't have left the kingdom. I never expected for there to be such a beast so close to the walls. Her beautiful blonde locks swayed slightly as she shook her head, a warm smile plastered on her face. We both agreed, so it's our fault, but you saved me, you saved us. Thank you, she said, her soft voice bouncing against the furred walls, into Kai's ears. She helped Kai lay down on his back, reassuring him slightly. However the feeling of guilt and anger inside him did not lessen in the slightest. I'm the one that already lived one life. Why is she the one comforting me? He subconsciously sighed, wincing in pain as a wave of pain spread over his entire body. What is it? Kana asked as he adjusted his pillow. Our parents are gonna kill us. He quickly replied and he closed his eyes, leaving a worried and nervous Kana awake as he slowly fell asleep. The next day he woke up drenched in sweat, and he frowned at the small amounts of pain in his limbs that appeared as he tried to move around. Oh, well at least it doesn't hurt as much as earlier. He carefully got up, moving slowly as he dragged his feet, he parted the curtains, observing his surroundings. The small room he was in was located in a bigger tent-like structure, animal pelts covering the cold ground, and the occasional sunlight hit his skin through the torn cloth of the ceiling. 
In the middle of the tent was a small fire stone, constantly emitting a calming light, heating up the surroundings. Around it were a few shabby couches, on which Kana, who had a wide smile plastered on her face, and the old man sat, talking about who knows what. He made his way over to them, the light slowly revealing his image as he greeted them before sitting down as well. The old man observed him carefully, letting out a sigh as he said, You really are the kid. Kai took a deep breath, and his gaze met the elders as he asked, Old man, how do you know my parents? The white-haired old man squinted his eyes, inhaling deeply as a hint of grief appeared on his face. It's a long story, one that is not mine to tell, he said as he handed a string bracelet to Kai. Give this to your parents, will you? Other than that, how are you feeling? Seeing that the elder refused to answer, Kai dropped the subject, accepting the bracelet with a curious expression. He replied with a faint smile. I'm better, as you can see. I can walk around but it does hurt quite a bit. That's good then, the old man said as he got up. Come, I'll help you get home. He and Kana followed behind him, slowly walking toward the narrow exit. Kai dragged his feet, and his lips parted as he asked with uncertainty. Old man, what about the Aboric? The elder kept walking as he nonchalantly said. It ran away. Why? That's simple, he replied. It's because I'm a medium core five star magician, and the reason I knew what you were up to was because of this. He halted his footsteps as he swished his sleeve, and the small figure of a wooden bird appeared in his palm. It's called a totem. It can be used to scare off monsters, protect a small area or as a second pair of eyes, depending on the magic formula you used to carve them with. Kai's mind reeled. His eyes widened in shock as the first statement entered his ears. A five, five star? five-star magician, and the effect multiplied as another new magic item was presented to him. Totems? Magic totems? The books my parents let me read didn't have any such things. The tense curtains fluttered as they parted. The small amount of sunlight sneaking through the tree's dense canopy gently hit Kai's skin as a disgusting stench inundated his nostrils. His eyes snapped toward the source a few black and dirty water-filled cauldrons placed boiling over a fire sickly vegetables and white bones cooking within. Women surrounded the cauldrons, watching over them. Their skinny bodies and pale expressions sent shivers down Kai's spine as a certain feeling of familiarity appeared in the back of his mind. Small children of healthier complexions played around or waited patiently for the feed to be served, warming their sickly bodies by the bonfire. The camp had a few dozen tents made from pelts and furs, supported by large wooden pillars and small branches. The one he just came out of stood at about 10 meters in height, but the ones before him only measured about 3 meters. What's going on? His eyes ran around the area, his pulse rising as he observed the dozens of sickly people. The men were only skin and bones. Blood seeped out of their skin as they lay under the cover of their tent. The women were a bit better off, but the healthiest ones were the very young children, those that have yet to reach 5 years of age, as for the older ones. Just what is this place? Kai unconsciously voiced his shock, and the old man turned to him with, his expression filled with grief. It's the place of the banished, of those too sick to work, or of those who were thrown out of the kingdom, those who cannot afford the cost of living. He explained as he slowly advanced through the camp. None of these people are of our races cursed of blood rotting. If vampires don't drink human blood for a prolonged period of time, our bodies eats itself from within, and as hunger grows, so do our instincts. From time immemorial, our bodies were not able to properly develop without ingesting blood. We do know the reason why but we know the consequences of not doing so. In the best case scenario we die a painful death, and in the worst case. He sighed before taking a puff from his pipe, his tender gaze drifting over the still healthy children running around. In the worst case we become a lytic, we lose ourselves, our body mutates, and we will not stop until we get killed or simply die. Lytics search for food, any type be it humans, vampires, animals or whatever else, but their hunger is never sated, and will never be. A lytic? Kai exclaimed as the pieces in his head clicked in place, his breathing became slightly heavy, and he remembered the creature's appearance. Doesn't it look a lot like these men? Does that mean? The old man let out a heavy sigh once again, the heaviness of the subject weighing on his heart like a boulder tied to his feet as he drowned in an endless lake. Before any of us here turn into lytics we. His lips trembled as he paused briefly. We put a stop to it before it happens. Kai and Kana gasped in shock. 
their expressions turned sour as the old man's words lingered in their ears. Such a cruel illness, why? Why does it have to be like this? Why do these people have to suffer? Kana asked a half-rhetoric question with an anger-filled voice, her hands trembling as she clenched them into fists. It is as the king wills, the old man replied. Before and during the war, human blood was abundant, we had slaves and could drink as much as we wanted, growing stronger and stronger with each passing day. Now, on the other hand, the king controls who gets to feed on blood due to the anti-violence treaty with the humans. He distributed blood whenever needed, about seven years or so, and the people must buy it from him. Of course, the citizens can also trade with the humans for it, but he cut his sentence short, refusing to elaborate any longer but his eyes shone with a burning hatred before they snapped shut. Let's go then, your parents must be worried. 6. Chapter 16. Reunion. Hurried footsteps echoed through the narrow alleys and dark paths of the abandoned town. Kai and Kana's parents ran around as they scanned the area with their mana. Ray fiddled with a weird star-shaped object that had five crystals on its extremities. Cold sweat dropped down his forehead as painful warmth spread all over his body, his fingers trembling as he tapped the large crystals on the star's surface. Elena and the others walked closer to him, their chests heaving nervously as they stared at the device. Dear, do you really believe this thing works? Elena asked, her grief-filled voice barely a whisper as she approached him. It has to. He replied with a hoarse voice as his mana flowed through the object. Tom stood next to Ray, his wife, Isabella following right behind him, worry and fear plastered on their faces. It's been two days since they disappeared, maybe even more. Tom said as he frowned, and his voice gradually rose. We've looked everywhere in the city and that thing your son built has proved useless so far. Ray let out a tisk sound as he ignored his friend's statement. Advancing toward the shabby wooden gate, he kept checking the device every few steps, and his heart dropped to his stomach every time he did so. Finally, he reached the gate, his goosebumps covered body shivered slightly as he placed his fingers on the crystals, waiting in anticipation for it to light up, for its color to turn green, for his son to appear. Ray! Isabella's soft voice rang in his ears, but he completely disregarded it, instead focusing on injecting energy into the device. His heart stood still as the mana flowed through his finger, and his pupils widened as one of the crystals' colors slowly turned green. He raised his head, staring at the direction it pointed toward outside. No! Elena let out a soft gasp as her hand flew to her mouth, water swelling up around her eyes as she lost the strength to stand. Falling to her knees, she couldn't hold back her grief, and tears streamed down her cheeks as she choked, gasping for air. My son, it's not too late. Ray comforted her, and he pulled out his wand as he prepared to step out into the forest, and Tom did the same as his heavy steps crushed the grass beneath his feet. A rustling sound rang in their ears, and their faces broke into a painful smile as they turned toward the source. Kana and Kai leapt out of a thick bush their ripped clothes exposing the small amounts of wounds that covered their body. They dashed toward their parents with tear-filled eyes. Elena and Isabella hurried toward their children, hugging them tightly with racing hearts. Why why you? His mother struggled to speak as she exhaled and inhaled rapidly, her body barely calming down at the touch of her son's warmth. We were, so, so where have you been? What, what happened? She asked in a barely cohesive speech, her voice trembling as she voiced her concerns her pupils trembling while looking at her son. Mom, I'm so, so sorry I. Promise I won't break your word again. I hick I will be a good son. He apologized as he wrapped his arms around Elena, her racing heart ringing in his ears, and he felt like a sharp sword had pierced his chest. Ray looked sternly at Kai, and his lips parted, but his words got stuck in his throat as he noticed Elena glaring at him. He let out a soft sigh as his pulse returned to normal and he bent down as he hugged his son. You don't even know how many worries you gave us. I think we aged twenty years in two days, he joked, his voice trembling slightly before he sternly said. But we will need an explanation at home. A few meters away from them, Kana's parents scolded her as tears fell down her face like a coursing river. I'm sorry I dash. Are you really sorry? Her mother cut her off before she could finish her sentence. You bad child, you have no idea how worried we were. Our world slowly crumbled away with every second you were missing, I we. She started weeping as she knelt down and hugged Kana's trembling body. Mom, I'm really sorry. I, I. 
She sobbed on Isabella's shoulder as she hugged her tightly. Tom sighed and embraced Kana as well, his nervous voice barely above a whisper as he said, It's all right, sweetie, you are safe and healthy, that's all that matters. A few minutes passed before the group got themselves together, and they silently walked home, their breathing shaky, but relieved. Kai suddenly reached for his pocket, having remembered the bracelet the old man gave him, he pulled it out and handed it to his parents. Mom, an old man told me to give you this. His mother's pupils widened slightly as she gently grabbed the bracelet, carefully inspecting it before asking. Did he say anything else? Kai shook his head in response. He wasn't really talkative, but he seemed to know you too well. Elena nodded slightly as he stored the bracelet in her spatial ring, not saying another word until they arrived at their home, which was located in the most southern corner of the kingdom, not that far from the abandoned town. Ray had a pensive look on his face, but he similarly remained silent, and only demanded an explanation from Kai once they calmed down their nerves a bit more. We were playing. Originally we didn't have the intention to ever break your word but, the gate was right there. There was a whole forest on the other side. How is that possible? He explained under his parents' stern look, and as he continued to recount everything that happened to him and Kana, their expressions quickly turned to shock and anger. Finally, he told them what happened with the old man in detail, including the short history lesson. That old man. Ray's teeth let out a scraping sound as they grinded against each, and he clenched his fists in anger. How dare he say such unnecessary things? I'll beat some sense into him. Elena grabbed his shoulder before he got the chance to sprint out the door, and she let out a sigh as she said. Forget about that right now. She turned toward Kai whose relaxed expression quickly changed to one of shock as he saw his mother's scary eyes. Our son needs to learn his lesson. She continued, approaching him as a long and thin branch appeared in her hand. Kai gulped in fear as the expected punishment rapidly descended upon him, his grunts of pain ringing in his father's ears, who only watched with a pitiful expression from the side. The days quickly passed and the time for Kana's birthday finally arrived. Her house was located on the outskirts of the only city that was still habitable the capital city, Matiso. She waited for Kai and his parents just outside, nervously fiddling with her fingers and a small bracelet around her waist. The small red crystals that stood at the center of a few beautiful roses, which were embroidered on her crimson dress, softly reflected the moon's gentle light. Her head rose as she saw Kai's figure appear from around the corner. His casual black and white clothes served as a stark contrast to her puffy dress. Happy ten years. He congratulated her while handing her his gift a book written by himself containing multiple children's stories that he more or less remembered. Its hardcover was black like the ebony tree and the title, written in white ink, read. Stories. Kana inspected the beautiful book, her small fingers grazing over its rough texture and her eyes briefly stopped on the title before she burst out into a light laughter. Kai tilted his head as he curiously asked, What's so funny? Sorry, sorry, I this handwriting is just interesting. She replied, opening the book and flipping through the pages before stopping somewhere in the middle. Oh? The bear tricked by the fox? What's this about? She asked upon reading the title. Ah, uh, just the story I came up with a while ago. He scratched the back of his head as he entered the house, followed by his parents, who had used this guy's magic to change their appearance. They said I can't use that yet, I don't understand what's so difficult about it, but why do they even need to hide? Kana's house was built from the same materials as his, except the decorations, which consisted of many more plants than his. There were some potted flowers and small trees, as well as vines that climbed up an isolated pillar. It didn't take long for more and more people to show up. A dozen people quickly filled the house with chatter, creating a joyous atmosphere as the guests greeted each other and caught up. Off to the side was a small desk that had a few beautifully wrapped gifts. The rest of the evening passed by uneventfully, and Kai found himself in Kana's room as per her request. She slumped down on the bed and let out a relaxed sigh as she looked at Kai with wide eyes. She handed Kai the book he gave her and asked in a low voice, can you read me a story? He sat down next to her as he took the book, and jokingly remarked as he opened it. Why? You still can't read? You. She pouted as she repeatedly, but lightly punched him in the arm, and he asked as he burst out into laughter. Should I choose? Kana nodded and lay down on her bed, attentively waiting for Kai to start reading. All right, I like this one. 
he said as he cleared his throat. There was once an old couple. The old woman had a chicken and the old man a rooster. The old woman ate eggs every day from her chicken and never shared them with her husband. One day he asked her to give him one but she refused, saying he should get his rooster to lay eggs. A soft snore interrupted his reading session, and he slowly turned his head toward Kana, who was peacefully sleeping while hugging a pillow. His tender gaze lingered on her as he asked himself is this what it feels like to have a sibling? A friend? Memories from his life on earth flashed in his mind, his head hurting slightly as he tried to recall what his family was like. I was, alone, a single child. My mother, father, I can't seem to remember much of that. I had a friend, his name, his name was Nevin, right? Nevin, Nevin. His face reddened as blood rushed through his veins, and he inhaled while calming down. He closed the book and placed it on Kana's desk before he covered her with a blanket and softly closed the door behind him. He left with his parents, who had already finished having fun and slowly headed home, and two pairs of eyes watched them from the shadows as their figures disappeared behind a corner, following them from above under the protection of the darkness. 6. Chapter 17 Leaving? The two silhouettes silently moved through the shadows their feet barely touching the roofs of the houses as they jumped from one tile to another. We must inform the king. One of them whispered to the other as he halted in his footsteps, turning to leave as the other's voice lingered in his ears. I would rather be safe than sorry, go back on your own. The other shadow replied sternly as he resumed tailing Elena and Ray, not waiting for an answer as he disappeared into the darkness. The first one sighed reluctantly before following behind the other one his figure also disappearing in the darkness. As Kai's parents left the main city, the two shadows resumed their pursuit on ground, an eerie silence accompanying them as the city grew farther and farther away. The two suddenly stopped, and they looked around them as a cloud of pitch-black darkness surrounded them. What's going on? The first shadow asked with a panicked voice, clearly not expecting an answer from the second one, who suddenly jumped in place as his formless lips parted. Run we be dash. His words were cut short by a whooshing sound, accompanied by a faint purple light, and his head left his body as blood spurted from his neck, softly hitting the ground, an expression of disbelief clear on his face. The other one had no time to react to what happened. At the same time that his friend's head hit the ground, a small wisp of fire shot toward his chest, instantly shattering his mana core, and he fell to the ground as his body convulsed violently. Elena and Ray popped out of the darkness, slowly walking toward the corpses, and Ray kneeled in front of the beheaded one as he inspected it. His expression turned to one of disgust and anger, but it was quickly overtaken by worry. Elena looked at the two corpses from afar, her lips trembling behind her hands and her pulse rose slightly as her stomach churned. A wave of nausea took over her, as she did her best to balance herself. She looked away from the corpses and said in a muffled, trembling voice, Ray, those two, who are they? Ray stood up, a small, dark flame appeared at the tip of his gloved finger, and he said as he sent it toward the two corpses. I don't know, I've never seen such concealment magic before but it seems familiar, it can't be. Elena gasped as she took a step backward, the smell of incinerated flesh lingering in her nostrils as the bodies disappeared without a trace. I'm afraid so, he said in a grave, slightly panicked voice, and his heart dropped to his stomach as he turned to Elena. I can feel some leftover mana, but I can't erase it. I reckon we don't have much time before they start searching for us seriously. I assume that we have two weeks at the most. He isn't organized enough, but we'll leave once Kai's birthday passes. Let's let him have one last good memory of this place. Where should we go? Ellie's place? Or maybe to Finfin? Fin? What will we do about his hair and eyes? Elena bombarded Ray with questions as her mind overflowed with worries. What do we do? The whole reason we even decided to live here was Dash. Ray cut off her sentence as he hugged her tightly, his deep and reassuring voice ringing in her ears as his lips parted. We'll be fine, we'll figure something out. We just need to hurry and pack our belongings. They left the scene and hurried home, grabbing the already asleep Kai and laid him in his bed. Six days passed by quickly, time in which Ray crafted two more spatial rings, while Kai watched him curiously. Listen carefully. Ray said. A spatial ring is crafted from a very pure dark crystal and advanced magic. You basically find an empty spatial node and link it with our space, and the ring acts as a key. 
The size is mostly dependent on luck, but it's better than a backpack. He tinkered with a few small components in his hand that slowly transformed into a ring, and he reached toward emptiness with his hand, where a dark light appeared shortly thereafter. Ray passed the ring through the ring, and it glowed faintly as it let out a soft chiming sound. There you go, he said as he handed Kai the ring. I think there are about three cubic meters of space, not too shabby. Kai put the ring on his finger, staring at the dark crystals with excitement as he said, Thanks, Dad, but must we really leave? His dad sighed as he ruffled his hair. Yeah, it will be fun, I assure you. You're not a little chick anymore. You need to see the world. He stood up and patted Kai on the shoulder. Now go and pack your stuff. You just need to infuse a bit of mana in the ring when you hold an object in your hand, and you'll be good to go. If you want to take something out, just them. You'll figure it out when you use it. Kai nodded and rushed to his room, where he picked up a random book and did as his father instructed. He jumped slightly as the book disappeared from his hand in the blink of an eye. Now, how do I take it out? He fiddled around with the ring for a bit, nothing happening even when he sent mana inside of it. There has to be some secret, right? He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, carefully leading the mana through his veins toward the ring, and he focused intensely while thinking about the book. His eyes snapped open as a soft thud rang in his ears, and he saw the same book he stored inside the ring on the ground not looking any different from how he stored it. Oh, that's quite simple, but I need to practice it a bit. The day passed uneventfully as the three cleaned out the house of anything valuable, with Kai spending the whole day in his room, training with the ring like a child playing with a new toy. When he finally descended, the house he grew up in for ten years turned into an unfamiliar dwelling. The beautiful decorations his mother made throughout the years had been taken down. The bookshelves filled to the brim with knowledge disappeared and even the kitchen utensils had been stored away. Is this what deja vu feels like? He walked toward the window and grazed its cold surface with his fingers, memories of his past life flashing in his mind as image fragments quickly appeared and disappeared. He remembered the red patches of the empty walls as some older men helped him pack his belongings. His mother's room closed off by police tapes and one officer talking to a middle-aged woman who kept wiping her tears with a handkerchief. So something like that happened as well? I had almost forgotten. His red eyes lit up faintly as he stared at himself through the transparent reflection of the window. A melancholic expression plastered on his face and a wave of sadness washed over him. Was I really about to forget, my mother? A sudden chill feeling around his neck startled him awake from his daydreaming and he quickly turned around with a racing heart, only to see Elena's face. He looked toward his chest, and saw a beautiful dark sphere hanging around his neck with a beautiful silver chain. Do you like it? His mother asked him as she rearranged his shirt. Your dad made it for you. I think it may be a bit too heavy to wear it all the time though. Kai held the large crystal in his hand, a shivering cold spreading from its surface up his fingers and down his arm but he endured the frosty feeling as he examined it closely. Inside the sphere lay a small white cube. Its exact details were hard to discern, but Kai's gut told him that it was something very important. So cold. He shivered as he let go of the thing, his hand temperature quickly returning to normal, and he raised his head toward his mother as he said, Yeah, I like it a lot, thank you. I'm glad, she answered, kneeling in front of Kai and hugging him tightly, her racing heart pushing against his chest. He returned the hug, feeling a shiver run down his mother's spine as he did so, and could not help but ask. Mom, is everything all right? Elena tightened her hug around his body, and she said in a quivering voice as a tear dripped down her cheek. Yes, everything is all right, don't worry. She could barely hide the distress in her voice, and her body began to tremble. Fear and anxiety took over her body as warm tears dripped down her cheeks like a waterfall. Her shoulders shook lightly as her soft sobs rang in Kai's ears, his heart skipping a beat each time. I may not read a lot of history, but even I know vampires aren't welcomed anywhere. He ran his fingers through his mother's delicate, silver hair as he tried to reassure her, his uneven, uncertain voice shaking slightly. Mom, it's all right, we'll be fine. Elena's heart stopped for a second, and she took a deep breath as she separated her body from Kai's, wiping away her tears, saying, you're right, tomorrow is a big day, so let's go get some rest. She stood up, and turned off the light crystals as she walked up the stairs, Kai following closely behind her, and he let out a soft sigh as he took one last look at the empty house. 
A soft thud accompanied by a sharp click resounded in his ears as the door closed behind him. His dark, empty room gave him a melancholic feeling. The bed creaked under his weight as he laid down. A heavy exhale left his lips as he closed his eyes. I have a bad feeling, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Now that I think about it, I don't remember falling asleep last week. I wonder what happened after Kana's party. He rubbed the chilly surface of the necklace as he gradually fell asleep, his mind racing with thoughts and fears. Fragmented memories flashed in his mind, abstract dreams and nightmares, a violent thud pumping against his chest. Thud, thud, thud. He tossed and turned, his clothes and sheets drenched in cold sweat as his entire body vibrated rhythmically to the beat of the thuds. His mind shook as the thuds became louder and louder. His dreams vanished, replaced by pitch black darkness. Jumping up, he gasped for air as sweat dripped down his entire body. Panic plastered on his flushed face as he frantically looked around, his long silver hair swaying wildly about. What happened? Was it a nightmare that? Thud, 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 thud. The horrific sound rang in his mind, and he jumped up, trying to make sense of the situation. Thud, Thud, a huge earthquake accompanied the heavy thud, and the sound of shattering glass resounded in his ears, and he quickly ran downstairs with ragged breathing, blood rushing through his veins as he felt weakness growing in his legs. I am sorry for THR weird spacing mobile is difficult. 5. Chapter 18 An Enemy from the Past He pulled out his wand from the spatial ring as he nearly stumbled on the stairs, his heart threatening to jump out of his chest as he rushed toward the window. There. He saw a rain of light particles descend from the sky, as if the heavens themselves were shattering. His parents quickly appeared next to him with pale faces, their pupils trembling as they stared outside the window, anger, resentment and fear manifesting on their faces as they held each other's hands tightly. They broke the outer barrier, Ray said, his voice barely a whisper, frowning as he scoffed where did I make a mistake. Elena's hand trembled in his as he turned to face her staring deep into her fearful crimson eyes. I'm sorry, dear, he whispered. I made a mistake, we... He was one step ahead. She brought his hand closer to her heart and lightly shook her head. It's not your fault. I... I shouldn't have intervened back then, but Kai, he... You did what you had to do. Ray interrupted her, kissing her forehead gently before saying, Now we must do what we have to do for Kai. He quickly muttered something under his breath and his face darkened as he clicked his tongue. They've cut off any teleportation, he said, his voice grave. It's probably a huge spatial lock domain. He must have at least a dozen mages. Damn it. Elena released herself from his embrace and straightened herself, taking a deep breath. Her eyes turned resolute as she looked at Kai with a gentle gaze. She turned toward the door, closing her eyes as she steeled herself. Images of a tall man with black, short hair and a raspy beard appeared in her head. He wore a large black robe embroidered with golden thread, and a large crown decorated his head. His warm smile was as beautiful as a lily, and his joyous laughter still rang in her ears after all this time. Father, Ray also steeled himself for what was about to come, and he pulled out a small piece of paper from his spatial ring, turning to Kai as he handed it to him. Keep this close to your chest. And rip it when I say so, all right? Kai nodded and looked at the small paper in his hand, its yellowish hue showing its age. His parents faced the door, and they took out their wands as they slowly walked over to it. Each step felt like thousands of small needles relentlessly pierced their feet. The door creaked open, the faint luminescence of the moon spilling and revealing the grandeur of the army hiding within the darkness. Hundreds of soldiers wearing tar black armor staring back at them with gazes filled with murderous hate. Fifty of them were flying high in the air on some sort of black-winged lizard beasts, looming over them, ever watching, like the tip of death's scythe itself. Behind the soldiers stood two dozen magicians where they chanted in an indecipherable, ancient language. The man who stood in front of the soldiers was the same who sat on the throne in the imperial palace, the commander of the shadow soldiers, the king of the vampire kingdom. He was tall, slim, and his long, dark hair reached down to his waist. His pointed red eyes stared at Elena and Ray with inexplicable hatred. He had a small nose and thin, red lips with a long and deep scar running across his face, from the upper left side of his forehead to the lower right, cutting along his eyebrow, nose and stopping at the corner of his lips. His left hand was missing, 
replaced instead by a metallic arm, talons at the extremities of his fingers, creating some sort of claw. A grim smile was etched on his face, his lips and legs were trembling. His expression was a mixture of excitement and anger. He watched the two as his breathing turned ragged, but quickly collected himself. His expression turned deadpan as he played with some small beads in his hand. His teeth let out a light scraping sound as they brushed against each other. Ray looked at the man with a fearful expression, his muscles trembled and his chest tightened. His gaze lingered on the man, and a wave of intense guilt swept over him as their eyes met. Master, he quickly repressed the feeling and gulped, tightening his wide-knuckled grip on his wand, his thoughts becoming resolute. I have Elena and Kai, a family I must protect, I made the right decision back then. Almost as if the wand had sensed Ray's resoluteness, it let out a faint, sharp screech, similar to that of a bird. The crystals on it flashed briefly as the sound abruptly stopped. Next to him, Elena gritted her teeth, blood dripping down from her taut fists. She angrily glared at the man in front of her, her arms, legs, and lips. Her whole body trembled as her muscles tensed up, blood rushing through her veins as images of that fateful day flashed in her mind. Corpses. Countless corpses, a bloody throne room and her father's large back that protected her from this man's fatal blow. Her beloved maidservant who had acted as a second mother. Her heart burned with anger and pain as she saw the man who took away her old family come to break apart her new one. I knew we shouldn't have come here. Everything would have been fine if not for that. Lydic, if only. Her face flushed red as her muffled, angry voice escaped her lips through gritted teeth. Ha Nyard! She inhaled deeply as she tried to calm herself down. Ray grabbed her hand, his warm touch helping her compose herself. They stared into each other's eyes bravely, both of them seeing the decisiveness within and their breathing returned to normal as they wordlessly assured each other. They inhaled deeply and faced the man named Hanyard, whose face morphed into a piercing, maniacal expression. His lips twisted into a weird smile and he started chuckling which gradually turned into a crazy crackle that sent shivers down everyone's spines. His crazed laughter continued for a minute until he finally calmed down, and his expression returned to a normal, neutral one. Hidden behind it, however, was an intense and vicious anger. His eyes made contact with Ray's, and a hint of a strange and complicated emotion revealed itself before slowly fading away. His lips parted, his hoarse voice ringing in Ray's ears once again after countless years. Why? He asked us simply, a one-word question, the meaning behind it only known by a certain few. Ray bit his lip and avoided Hanyard's gaze, staring at the ground as he replied in a shaky voice. It was wrong, all of it. We killed too many innocents. I had to make things right. Hanyard let out a sigh as he looked at Ray, then at Elena, who stood beside him. So this is your idea of making things right? He asked, his voice filled with anger. I wanted to believe you made a mistake that you'd come back to me once you figured it all out, but instead, you decided to side with her, he said as his resentful voice gradually rose. I raised you as my apprentice, my son. I taught you all I know and I saw in you what others didn't, yet you decided to stab me in the back anyway? What about your parents? What would they say? By the end of his speech, any trace of pain in his voice disappeared, and his last words stabbed at Ray's heart like a sword pierced through his chest. He suddenly remembered the past he wanted to forget, the life of a young orphan left alone in the streets, his parents lost to war. He begged for food and lived in the derelict houses together with the other war orphans. Back then he was angry, angry at the country, at the king, the nobility, and at his parents. After all that we went through, they surrendered? What about me? My siblings, what did our parents die for? He kneeled in front of a shattered statue as tears ran down his cheeks crying toward the sky. It was then, when he was five years old that he met Hanyard, who had stopped behind him. He raised his head and looked at the man who extended his hand, and asked the question that sealed his fate. Boy, do you want to be my apprentice? How could he refuse? A noble someone he hated wanted to become his teacher. He knew all too well what would happen if he said no. From that day forth he became Hanyard's apprentice. He was fed, taken care of and educated and gradually he began to see Hanyard as more than a teacher, until Elena nudged him awake from his daydream, and as he looked into her eyes, reminding himself why he was here, he pointed his wand at Hanyard, and inhaled deeply before saying, Master, I regret betraying you, 
because you were someone I cared about, but I don't regret saving her from you. She did nothing to deserve this, either. Neither did the servants. Hanyard remained silent, letting out a deep sigh as his eyes drifted toward the night sky. He raised his hand and parted his lips, ordering in a cold tone. Men, fire! Hundreds of spells and arrows flew toward Ray and Elena in an instant. They waved their hands, murmuring spells under their breath in two huge, transparent shields materialized a few meters in front of them, blocking the majority of the projectiles. A spectacle of colors covered the sky, and the sharp sound of metal on metal resounded in every direction. A few arrows managed to sneak past the massive shields, the air splitting apart as they careened toward the house. They stopped a few meters away from the wall, crashing against the translucent barrier that enveloped the entire house. The sound of falling arrows and crashing spells rang in Ray and Elena's ears as they hid behind the shield's protection, thinking of a way to get out of the situation. As time went on, the sound of cracking glass resounded on the battlefield, and thin lines began to cover the magic shields as they trembled. What should we do? Elena asked through gritted teeth. We can't win a battle of attrition against them. He nodded slightly and pulled out a glass flask filled with a transparent liquid and handed it to her, saying, Drink this and hold the shield for a minute. I will lessen the pressure. His shaky voice caused Elena to shudder, but she bit her lip and downed the liquid, her shield gradually healing. Ray took a look at the battlefield and identified the people who were posing the biggest threat. A group of magicians who were casting spells as if they didn't need to use mana. The cockatrice riders and the magicians behind. I bet they're holding the active spatial lock. If only I could get to them. He clutched his wand and pointed it toward the sky, and as his muffled voice echoed in the noisy battlefield, Elena was doing her best to protect them from the unrelenting bombardment her shield continuously splintering and healing as her mana depleted faster and faster. I can't hold on much longer, she said, her voice barely a whisper as cold sweat ran down her face while trying to hang on for a few more desperate seconds, just enough for Ray to finish his spell. A small wisp of fire appeared in his hand, and it gradually grew larger and larger, metamorphosing into a small, dark phoenix, similar to the one Kai casted, except for its temperature and color. Ray's dark phoenix exuded a bone-chilling air, and as its size gradually grew larger, its temperature plummeted even lower. It flew higher and higher, and after reaching a dozen meters in size, its eyes opened, letting out a loud screech as it hovered mid-air, waiting for Ray's commands. Extermination Phoenix! He yelled as he pointed toward the flying beasts, and the dark phoenix instantly dashed toward them, the air splitting under its speed. It let out a sharp screech as it leaped right in the middle of the cockatrice riders, and it exploded without hesitation. The men at the center evaporated instantly, not even their weapons or beasts remaining. And those were the lucky ones, in the outer limits of the explosion, those who had been barely touched by the shockwave began rotting. Pieces of skin and bones turned to dust as they slowly disappeared. They screamed in agony as their armor melted and molded onto their skin, before it too fell off, disappearing without a trace. Only those in the outer ring could say that they had gotten off scot-free, even if they were forced to cut off a body part. The explosion had spread to the ground troops relentlessly as well, the thousand or so soldiers running frantically from the shockwave. Those that were closest to the origin point had a similar fate to those on the outer limits their armor, skin, and bones melted and disappeared. Their muffled screams filled the battlefield with a horrific sound before finally dying out. Out of the thousand or so soldiers, about 300 of them had lost their lives in this manner, and more than 100 were severely wounded. Out of the 50 cockatrice riders, one-fifth of them perished instantly, while the rest were severely wounded, with only some of them getting away relatively safe. Hanyard stood inside a small barrier as he watched the gruesome spectacle, feeling impressed and a little proud by his apprentice's skill. But those feelings were quickly drowned out by sorrow. I spent so much time and resources training them and now they're gone. He bit his lower lip as the soldiers rearranged themselves. I shouldn't have given him the time to cast that. I never expected him to reach such high proficiency in dark and fire magic. With so many soldiers dead, the burden on Elena decreased exponentially, and she let out an involuntary sigh of relief before her pupils widened at the sight of so many people falling from the sky. The wails and pleas for help of those unlucky to still be alive rang in her ears as goosebumps spread all over her body. She looked toward Ray, unable to endure the horrific sight. 
His face was deathly pale as he struggled to breath, and cold sweat dripped down his forehead like he had just run a marathon. He clenched his stomach as he fought the urge to vomit, and his mind was flooded with thoughts he didn't have the time to process. His whole body trembled as he straightened himself, looking at the corpse littered, scorched battlefield with a pained gaze. Is this the only way? Was there no other choice I could have taken? Kai popped in his mind as he pulled out a vial filled with a faint blue liquid, downing it in one gulp. We moved here for him. What's there to question anymore when we knew the risks? He pulled out another flask filled with a red liquid, and some color returned to his face after drinking it. The bombardment of the enemy quickly resumed, although not as bad as before, it was still difficult for Elena to endure by herself. Ray kneeled down, and quickly activated a barrier who took most of the pressure off her shoulders. She undid the shield and took some time to catch her breath, her gaze drifting toward the mages that stood all the way in the back. Why aren't they attacking as well? She asked her husband as she drank another potion. He wiped the sweat off his forehead and answered with a hoarse voice. They're probably the ones, maintaining the spatial lock active. We must get rid of them, quick. Elena noticed her husband's tired appearance and hurriedly cast a healing spell on him, easing his fatigue ever so slightly. Hanyard glared at them, his heart getting slowly ripped apart and eaten by hatred. He noticed Ray's weakness after that attack. However, he didn't dare be reckless as he didn't know the strength of his former apprentice. Even a cornered rabbit bites after all. Men, advance! He barked an order as pointed forward, his wand pointed straight at Ray's heart. The sound of the soldiers marching in unison was like a symphony of death to Kai's parents, but like music to Hanyard's ears. It was the song playing as he took the lives of two traitors. Their hearts raced as they did their best to remain calm and Elena healed Ray continuously as his muscles eased up, her mana supplies not showing any signs of exhaustion. She stood close to her husband and they raised their wands, preparing themselves for their biggest fight of their lives. It was either kill or be killed, there would be no in-between. 6. Chapter 19 Two Against an Army Ray stood his ground as the earth shook beneath the soldiers' feet, their overwhelming presence sending shivers down his spine as goosebumps spread all over his body. Cracks spread over the thin barrier protecting them as the soldiers and cockatrice riders kept firing off spells and arrows, each hit increasing the number of thin fissures. Ray's grip tightened around his wand, and as he finished chanting a spell, a huge, dozen-meter transparent barrier manifested in front of them, the tip of the arrows shattering instantly upon impact, and any spells would immediately dissipate as the barrier's surface trembled and shone with a faint light. Elena. He turned toward his wife with a guilty expression. Take care of the cockatrice riders, please. She nodded slightly as she gulped, her pupils trembling while looking at the huge army that attacked them relentlessly. She took a deep breath. A faint chant escaped her lips as her wand floated in front of her, shining with a bright light as she said, Original magic, light weaponry. The wand slowly morphed into a huge, longbow made of light, and a dozen transparent swords manifested around her. She pulled back the bowstring, and three arrows appeared within. The thin string of light vibrated violently as Elena released it from her clutch, the three light arrows silently flying with precision toward three riders, but barely missing them by a hair's breadth. The flying soldiers shot spells after spells in quick succession, their fire rate seeming like a modern-day minigun. How are they casting spells so fast? This isn't normal. Something must be up. Cold sweat dropped down Elena's forehead as she struggled to aim at them, the barrier's strength diminishing with every passing second, and the enemies only got closer and closer. Ray stood motionless with his eyes closed, his soft murmur echoing on the battlefield as large pieces of rock suddenly broke off from the earth in a large area around him. As his chants grew quicker and sharper, the rock's temperature gradually rose until a large flame covered each of them. They slowly flew upward, Dozens upon dozens of flaming rocks looming over the large army like a sword hanging above their heads. Ray's eyes snapped open, and he pointed his wand forward as he shouted, Combination magic! Flaming meteors! The few dozen meteors shot toward the foot soldiers, and in almost the same instant that Ray finished his spell, half of the mages that were maintaining the spatial lock active suddenly opened their eyes. They pointed their wands forward, and a small crystal in the middle of the soldiers' chests glowed like a burning star creating a small shield that surrounded them as they advanced. However, 
The sound of shattering glass rang everywhere on the battlefield as the shield shattered. Like a brick thrown at a window, the meteors destroyed everything in their path. Pandemonium erupted once again as the soldiers stopped their march in an attempt to block the flaming projectiles however possible. But anything they tried quickly proved ineffective as the meteors crashed into their bodies, smashing them to a pulp. Pools of blood and disembodied limbs littered the battlefield as the meteor's relentless attacks slowly calmed down. Crimson craters the size of a grown man covered the scorched ground, screams of pain echoed on the battlefield. In the blink of an eye, another hundred or so soldiers perished under Ray's powerful magic, and another few dozen were grievously wounded. Henyard watched from afar with a bitter and shocked expression. Blood dripped from his tightly clenched fists, but he tightened them even more. He's already at the medium core seven star rank. How did he advance so fast? It's only been a few decades since then. He let out a heavy sigh, and he advanced toward Ray as he commanded a few mages behind him. Go heal the wounded. They immediately rushed to the battlefield, handing potions and casting spells to any wounded soldiers they found. Hanyard passed the hundreds of corpses with a heavy heart, biting his lower lip as he glared at the figures hiding behind the cracking barrier. The nauseating scent of coppery iron inundated Ray and Elena's nostrils, and their stomachs churned, holding back the urge to vomit as they kept fighting back against the terrified army. Ray looked up with widened eyes, noticing that the cockatrice riders didn't diminish in numbers, and as they fired off spell after spell, the cracks on his barrier only multiplied. He turned his head toward Elena, noticing her swords hovering around her body, and he watched her fire off the three arrows toward the enemies and missing all of them by a hair's breadth. Cold sweat dripped down her forehead as she gulped, her hands trembling as she once again pulled back the bowstring. A shiver ran down her spine as she felt Ray's warm touch, slightly calming her nervous body. It will be all right, just close your eyes and follow my movement, he whispered in her ear, taking control of her arms as she infused mana within her light bow while shutting her eyes. As they pulled back the heavy string, a dozen small arrows manifested on the tip of her fingers, both of their arms trembling as they tensed up the string. Ray guided her aim, their trembling hands released the string, and it vibrated violently as the thundering sound of the whooshing arrows rang in the dark soldier's ears. The invisible arrows split the air in two as they shot toward the cockatrice riders, and Hanyard's expression turned grim after he detected them, his heart dropping to his stomach as he involuntarily let out an aggravated scream. No! He waved his wand with haste, fruitlessly trying to protect his troops with a shield, but it was too late. A dozen riders let out pained grunts as light faded from their crimson eyes, the arrows piercing their skulls before slowly dissipating. Elena watched in horror as a dozen bodies fell from the sky, hitting the ground with a hard thud as their skulls split open under their helmets. Pools of blood formed under their corpses as any hint of life vanished from their bodies. She fell to her knees her stomach turning upside down as she stared at the grim sight before her, unable to turn her eyes away. These people, all of them. I, I killed them. Hot burning liquid climbed up her throat, and she threw up as tears fell from her crimson eyes. Ray turned his gaze away from his wife. An overwhelming feeling of guilt washed over him knowing that what he had just made her do was unforgivable. But he had found it necessary in order to try and survive this situation. He glared at Henyard hate burning in his eyes as his teeth let out a sharp scraping sound as they grinded against each other. His hands clenched into a fist, and blood rushed through his veins as his face flushed red. How could I make her do something like that, something so against her nature? All because of him that that. His fists tightened further, but he quickly stopped his train of thought, as he refused to badmouth the man who gave him a safe and secure future. Hanyard similarly watched his most elite soldiers drop like flies his face morphing into a vicious and twisted expression. His heart felt like it was being pierced by hundreds of needless. Gone. They're all gone. Decades of research and mountains of resources. One third of all my elite casters were defeated by two people. His eyes grew with a faint red hue, and he pulled out two purple stones engraved with intricate symbols, which he then crushed. Two long and thick purple spears took their place and he let out a primordial roar as he threw them toward Ray one after the other, aimed straight at his heart. The first spear appeared in front of him in an instant, and the spear pierced the first barrier like a hot knife cutting butter, instantly shattering it and disappearing shortly after. Ray had next to no time to react, and he pulled Elena as he ducked to the side, 
dodging the second dark spear. It reached the house. The sound of a mirror breaking rang in their ears as the barrier protecting it cracked and faded away as it broke into tiny shards. The spear flew through the barrier and pierced their house from one end to the other, creating two huge holes before fading away as it relentlessly sped forward. Kai's small head peeked from the inside of the house and a cold shiver ran down his spine as his eyes widened in fear at the sight of the bloody battlefield. Hanyard instantly noticed his figure, and their eyes locked as Kai fell to his knees, his expression covered in horror as he felt the malice, resentment, anger and pain in his eyes. What? How strong is he? Kai felt overwhelmed by Hanyard's aura, and his gut told him that the man in front of him could wipe him out with the flick of his sleeve. He gulped as he looked around his face lighting up slightly after he saw his parents standing to the side, dirt and scratches covered their bodies, as they shielded against the enemy's attacks while panting, but they had yet to notice their son, whose body was trembling in fear. What is going on? My parents are wounded and that man, who is he? His body trembled uncontrollably as he tried to move, his unresponsive limbs shivered as the threat of death overwhelmed him, and his gaze repeatedly jumped from his parents to Hanyard. He parted his lips, and he tried to call out to his parents, but his fearful voice quickly turned silent as he saw Hanyard pull out another purple stone which quickly transformed into a spear. Despite the distance, Kai clearly felt the weapon's deathly aura, and his hair stood on end as Hanyard threw it toward him without hesitation. The spear vanished from his vision, appearing in front of him in less than the tenth of a second as dust and debris flew everywhere. His vision blurred as more than a dozen, Small translucent barriers appeared right before his eyes, slowing down the spear. A warm touch wrapped around his body, dragging him to the side right before the spear destroyed the last barrier, whooshing past his body with great speed. He quickly looked around and saw his parents' horrified faces, cold sweat dripping down their forehead as they struggled to breathe. Looking toward Hanyard, he saw a tall and wide translucent barrier block the hundreds of arrows and few spells that shot toward them relentlessly and cracks slowly spread all over it. Dad, what's happening? Kai asked, his voice cracking as blood rushed through his veins, flushing his face red. Ray pulled out several pieces of paper and plastered them over his body as he activated them, and multiple barriers wrapped around Kai's body. Keep the piece of paper I gave you earlier close to your chest, then, his father said, his eyes closing as he took in a deep breath before he continued. And tear it when I tell you to, it will keep you safe. Ray stood up and left him and Elena alone, only glancing back slightly as a hoarse voice escaped his lips. Hide, stay safe and do as I instructed, alright? Dad! He called out in a painful voice. Tears streamed down his cheeks as he watched his father's figure walk toward the battlefield. Kai, hide behind the walls, me and your father, we're going to take care of it, alright? Elena said with a smile filled with motherly love her hands trembling as she handed Kai a round, green object. Keep it close to your chest, next to the talisman and necklace, and wait for us, she said before watching Kai hide in the ruins of their home, and her eyes burned with determination as she walked to her husband's side. They stood shoulder to shoulder, a faint smile plastered on their faces as a flame danced in their eyes. Hanyard watched the couple protect their son, his expression turned into an ugly smile as he was reminded of that moment all those years ago the day of his coup d'etat, the day where he killed the former king, who also had that stupid smile on his face, just like Ray. Fine, I'll just kill you together then. He barked as he moved forward with his troops, who had stopped shooting arrows but instead unsheathed their swords, their silver blades reflecting the moon's gentle light. Ray and Elena stood still in front of their house, protecting it like a bird guarding her nest. She held her wand in a sword-like position, and red light started enveloping it, and extending as she chanted in a low voice, gradually taking the shape of a huge, two-handed sword. Twelve invisible light swords manifested at the same time, and they circled her slowly, waiting for any orders. Ray's spatial ring shone with a faint light, and a long sword made from a purple and black metal appeared in his hand, its surface barely visible as it absorbed all light hitting it. Their bodies glowed faintly as they casted several Inko's spells, increasing their speed and strength for a brief duration. Ray's mouth moved rapidly as fifty small and thin barriers quickly appeared around him. He brought a small glass vial filled with blue liquid to his lips as he watched the army approaching them. I need to kill the mages and destroy the spatial lock, 
then instantly teleport away with Kai and Elena. Stay here and protect Kai, I'll do my best, he said as he placed a small green crystal in his breast pocket, and passionately kissed her on the lips as the sound of the advancing army rang in his ears. I'll support you from here, she said as their lips separated. Do your best, Ray marched forward, his small figure creating a huge contrast to the hundreds of dark armored soldiers. He glanced back at Elena as he tightened his grip on his sword, and said in a voice only he could hear, Thank you. 5. Chapter 20 Master vs. Apprentice Kai watched everything from afar, fragments of the untold story slowly forming in his mind, but he could barely piece together a theory with the information he had. His heart raced as he inspected the battlefield, the countless corpses and destroyed lands sent shivers down his spine. His gaze snapped to his father, who seemed to be swallowed by a dark and murderous wave. The sound of clashing metal accompanied by grunts of pain rang in his ears as Ray pushed against the army, his small body barely noticeable in the cloud of darkness. Sweat dripped down his forehead, blood and guts covered his clothes as his purple sword was now painted with a crimson dye. Countless enemies surrounded him, and each of his slashes claimed one life as he nimbly moved around the battlefield like a rabbit. He held his wand in his left hand, quickly casting spells as he snared his opponents before cleanly slicing their neck. The morbid sound of their heads smashing against the ground rang in the battlefield. He ran toward the center of the army as he panted heavily, and his wand lit up as he quickly chanted a spell. A dark cloud slowly spread with him as the source, shrouding him in darkness. He silently walked behind the dark soldiers, who silently dropped to the ground as his sword swiftly sliced their necks. Blood gushed out of them like a fountain before they could even process their death. Their number slowly decreased, and by the time his spell had dissipated, Ray had already killed more than fifty of them. His clothes were stained with black blood, his irregular breathing giving away his fatigue. I didn't think it would be so hard to take on an army. He made it seem so easy. He thought as he brought a vial to his lips, gulping down the red liquid as he dodged a swing coming from his right side. The tip of the thin sword grazed his cheek, leaving behind a trail of blood as Ray quickly thrust his sword in the soldier's body. Huh! He let out a surprised grunt as the dark soldier's body transformed into a viscous liquid, trapping his sword and his legs as a horrifying, deformed grin formed on his dripping face as his body grew larger and larger. The creature let out a maniacal laughter as its body exploded into bits, a corrosive liquid spreading in every direction eating away at the ground and corpses. Ray's barriers were useless against this attack, and his feet were locked in place. Unable to dodge out of the way, he hastily cast a shield spell, blocking most of the liquid. However, a few drops still ended up landing on his skin. He grunted in pain as he endured, and his hair stood on end as the sound of whooshing arrows rang in his ears. His eyes widened as he looked up at the wave of hundreds of magic-imbued arrows, the air split in two as they traveled through the sky, raining in his direction. Ray! Elena yelled from afar as her eyes snapped toward her husband, but she herself didn't have any time as dozens of soldiers attacked her relentlessly, their metal swords and dark armor barely able to endure the high heat from her two-handed light sword. Her twelve invisible swords also ran around the battlefield, cutting down any dark soldier that dared to underestimate her. The sword's mana signature was so small that they could barely detect it before they fell to the ground with an expression of disbelief. A slim man watched her from a distance, his sharp eyes locking onto her location as his longbow trembled in his hands. The tense string immediately got released and it released a screech akin to an eagle. A single arrow sped toward Elena, creating silent explosions as its speed reached an incredible level. It split the air in its path arriving almost immediately at the exact location where she would dodge. Her eyes snapped to the arrow, her heart skipping a beat, she reacted quickly and threw out a red crystal without hesitation. Flames burst out of it, instantly burning the arrow, sending everyone tumbling backwards. She panted as cold sweat ran down her spine, instantly turning to the archer who had a devious smile plastered on his face, another arrow instantly appearing within his bow as he took aim once again. He got ready to shoot once again, the string vibrating violently under his fingers, and Elena casted several barriers in quick succession before retreating, her large sword morphing into a light bow as she took aim as well. The string trembled gently as she pulled it back, and several arrows manifested in the bow. She carefully aimed at the archer while moving about on the battlefield, 
nimbly dodging and taking cover behind the degrees as dozens of soldiers chased her down. Their standoff was broken by the sound of shattering glass, which rapidly resounded in the battlefield in quick succession. Once, twice, thrice, ten times, their eyes snapped toward Ray's location, which rapidly flashed with consecutive white lights as the rain of arrows descended upon him. His barriers shattered one after the other as he retreated, trying to dodge the mass of projectiles intent on taking his life. He nimbly ran around the battlefield, creating barriers and dodging the dark soldiers' swings while trying to get closer to their back line. But the enemies kept attacking relentlessly, and when Ray killed one, another three took his place. The volley of arrows nearly stopped, however the number heading toward him was not negligent. He grunted in pain as an arrow hit him in the shoulder and his sword fell to the ground with a soft thud. Almost immediately, a dozen swords descended upon him, and his heart skipped a beat as he prepared to create several more barriers in an attempt to save his life. The twelve swords stopped mid-air, falling gently to the ground, accompanied by their owner's bodies. He quickly picked up his sword, briefly glancing toward Elena who was fighting intensely on her own battlefield. Escaping the entrapping, he pulled out the arrow from his shoulder, and quickly tapped the green crystal in his breast pocket a few times. A gentle energy emitted from it, spreading throughout his body but mainly focusing on the wound, which closed up almost immediately. He let out a relieved sigh before moving his sword in a circular pattern, leaving a faint trail of light as he did so. The light became sharper, and as its form clicked in place, Ray pushed it toward the army approaching him. The circle grew larger and larger as it passed through the dark armored soldiers until finally stopping a few dozen meters away, where it started spinning violently, emitting mana waves for a few seconds before slowly fading away. The mana waves affected all the enemies the circle passed the Og, making them drop to the floor and squirm in pain every time it pulsated. However, this only affected a few enemies for a short period of time, which barely gave Ray a small opening to dash forward and slay some of them. Cold sweat ran down his back as fresh blood dripped from his sword, its purple edges painted with a crimson hue. He panted, his breathing uneven, and he gulped as he stared down at the army coming toward him. Damn it! No matter how many I kill, they just keep coming. He tapped one of his rings twice as he retreated, clutching his wand as he chanted a spell while avoiding the mass of enemies coming toward him. A ring on Elena's finger flashed twice, and her weapon changed back into a wand as she cast a small shield and jumped high in the air freeing herself from the cluster of enemies. The slim archer smiled, and scoffed as he aimed at a place where Elena would be. You can't dodge in the air, you wench. The bow's string let out a screech, the arrow dashing toward her as it split the air in two. It arrived below her feet in a few seconds, and would pierce her body in mere milliseconds. The archer had a vicious smile plastered on his face as he excitedly watched the arrow travel toward Elena. However it quickly disappeared as something unexpected happened. A small square of light manifested below her feet, which she then used to jump upward, dodging the arrow by a hair's breadth. She pointed her wand forward and a large speck of light shot toward the battlefield. Ray's eyes glowed with a purple hue after he chanted a short spell, and he looked toward Elena's attack, and a murmur escaped his lips as he prepared another spell. The speck of light exploded above the soldiers with a blinding light and anyone who was within its reach had their vision taken away from them for a brief period of time. He took advantage of the situation and ran toward the mages, his vision unaffected by his wife's spell. The dark crystals on his wand lit up with a fierce light as he pointed it toward the ground, chanting a spell as fast as possible. Ten seconds passed, fifteen seconds. His spell was just about ready when the blinding light faded, and the enemies regained their sight. However, it was far too late. A fierce, dark light exploded from his wand, enveloping everyone in a small area around him, binding them with dark, metallic chains that spread toward enemies outside the area of effect. The chains binded everyone, leaving them unable to move an inch, and like an anaconda, they tightened around their limbs and necks, their faces turning blue, and their bodies shaking in terror. The morbid sound of tearing flesh and crunching bones resounded in the battlefield as hundreds of limbs fell to the ground an ocean of blood forming on the ground as their screams of pain rang in Ray's ears. A small clearing formed around him, and his clothes turned a dark shade of red, just like his eyes. Mountains of corpses lay at his feet, and the other soldiers shook in their boots as they looked at the horrific scene. Hanyard was amongst them, his face flushed red, 
and his body shivered uncontrollably from anger. He bit his lower lip as blood dripped down his chin, and he glared at Elena and Ray with unfathomable hatred. I can't believe his strength rose by so much. Aya, why did such a talented disciple betray me? And that damn bitch, she's so strong as well, what kind of magic is she using? I've never seen that before. She's at least an eight-star small core. He yelled inwardly, and he clicked his tongue as he slowly moved toward Ray. Regardless, both of them will die by my hand. His spatial ring flashed and a purple sword, similar to Ray's, appeared in his right hand. It held a similar purple luster, and its black surface was akin to a deep, dark abyss that pulled people toward it. Its thin golden lines glowed under the moon's soft rays of light, and he brandished it in front of him as he got used to its weight. It's been a while since I last used this. Ray's eyes widened upon seeing the sword, his body shivered involuntarily as his pupils trembled. The purple dragon sword, memories of that sword taking the lives of countless soldiers under the former king's rule flashed in his mind. The sword which destroyed the castle's gates and killed the former king now lay before him, his master now wielding it against him. He retreated quickly, casting a few more buffs, but before he could finish, Hanyard disappeared from his location and appeared right in front of Ray, his purple sword leaving a dark trail behind as he swung it in a crescent moon motion toward Ray's neck. What speed? He raised his sword, and the two clashed with a purple hue as he deflected the blow. The blades trembled as they pushed against each other, and Ray put all his strength into his sword, however it wasn't enough to resist his master. His eyes widened as he saw Hanyard raise his leg, kicking right at his solar plexus. However, Dodging was impossible because of the sword pressed against his neck. He grunted in pain as he got kicked backward, sending him straight into the wall of his house, leaving a man-shaped indent on it as he slid down, coughing heavily and struggling to breathe. Dear! Elena rushed to his side, quickly creating a mana shield in front of them, quickly healing Ray as he coughed a mouthful of blood. Fuck, he's damn strong, he said, his voice barely a whisper as he slowly stood up. Ray chuckled bitterly and several different colored flasks appeared between his fingers. Mana regeneration, strength boost, speed boost, endurance boost, endurance regeneration, natural shield, so many potions. His heart ached as he drank them all in quick succession, his stomach churning briefly before he tightened the grip on his sword. You mad man! Hanyard couldn't help but curse at the sight of Ray drinking so many potions at once. Usually... Drinking so many potions with different effects would cause an overload of mana in the body, resulting in it falling apart, or even exploding. Ray had a faint smile on his face as he dropped the empty flasks, feeling invigorated. I took a lot of time to make these potions, so of course I would make sure they were compatible with each other. He tightened his grip around the sword's handle, and he disappeared as he dashed toward Hanyard, leaving after images in his trail. His sword split the air as he swung at his former master, who instantly parried the attack, sending energy waves in the surroundings. Hanyard's pupils widened as his sword trembled under Ray's strength, and he pulled back as he retreated before instantly attacking. Sparks flew everywhere as the two exchanged dozens of blows in mere seconds, their unfathomable speed creating illusions as the sound of muffled metal striking metal resounded in the battlefield. Blood and sweat dripped down their bodies as they pushed their blades against one another, and their eyes locked for a brief moment before continuing their harrowing exchange. He thrust his sword toward Henyard's chest, his purple blade glowing with a faint luster as it suddenly gained speed, catching his mate by surprise. The sword penetrated his shoulder, and blood gushed out as he quickly retreated, applying pressure on his fresh wound. Ray quickly dashed toward him aiming his sword at Hanyard's neck as he swung it in the shape of a crescent moon, but he quickly dodged to the side, barely avoiding the fatal blow. The two panted as they glared at each other, and Ray bit his lower lip as a grim thought surfaced in his mind. He isn't trying at all. At this rate I will be the one to die. He pulled out his wand, and swung at Hanyard with a single hand as he chanted a spell before quickly placing it into his mouth, and a symbol akin to a seal glowed on its base. Jumping forward, he swung at his master with both arms, and in the instant the swords collided, he opened his mouth, dropping the wand as he shouted, Break! The wand lit up with a white, phantomic light as small, ghostly hands manifested from its base, instantly grabbing Hanyard's arms and legs. 
Ray took advantage of the opportunity and instantly crushed two paper seals, and a dark barrier manifested around Hanyard instantly. The pressure within greatly increased. Void bind? Hanyard thought panicked. In that same instant, a small, white creature with only one eye and a large mouth jumped at Hanyard, its razor-sharp teeth glowing with a faint luster. Not good. Hanyard screamed inwardly as he saw the creature approach his body. He defensively raised his left arm, letting the beast bite on its metallic material. The thing munched on it, however its teeth weren't sharp enough to penetrate the solid material. What? There is something even a void devourer can't eat? Ray thought, chanting another spell while Hanyard was still under the effect of void bind, and at the same time crushing one more paper talisman. As his spell finished casting, a dozen lighting bolts landed in Hanyard's location, instantly scorching the ground as a black cloud of dust rose into the sky, slowly revealing that the place where Hanyard stood was now a dark hole. Is it over? No, it can't be that easy. Ray turned his head in every direction, inspecting his surroundings and listening closely to the slightest rustle. His eyes widened suddenly and he raised his head as he heard a whistling sound from above. Impossible! 5. Chapter 21 A Decisive Strike Hanyard swung at Ray as he fell, his sword piercing the ground in the spot where Ray stood, leaving a small indent as he pulled it out. Ray looked at his master with shock-filled eyes, a question plaguing his mind that he could not help but voice. How did you get out? His wand flickered with a red hue as he asked. Hanyard didn't answer, smiling faintly as the ground cracked under his feet. He lunged at his disciple, brutally sweeping at Ray's stomach, who dodged backward, instantly aiming his wand at his master. The wands would glow with a fierce red light, despite its original black color, and the fire crystals etched onto it lit up with a blinding light as a small fireball shot toward Hanyard. He scoffed and dozed to the side and was about to strike at Ray again when he saw another fireball come his way, then another and another. In but a few seconds a meteor rain appeared in the sky. Hundreds of fireballs descended upon Hanyard, who frantically did his best to dodge. His figure became blurry as he advanced toward Ray, whose hands were burning while holding the wand, however he never let go. Small cracks appeared on the surface of the crystals, and the wood started to shrink as it slowly burned. Ultimately, the rain of fire overwhelmed his master, who grunted in pain after being hit by one, momentarily stopping as cold sweat ran down his back. However, that one second of pause was more than enough for hundreds of fireballs to descend upon him, locking him in place. Ray let out a sigh as he pulled out another talisman, surrounding him in another void bind as he ripped the talisman while dashing past him. He sighed sorrowfully as his wand let out a soft, sad screech disintegrating into nothingness, disappearing like it never existed. I'm sorry, but overcharging you was the only way to give me a chance. I have no idea how he escaped the void bind and void devourer. Inspecting himself, he clenched his fists and tightened his grip around his sword. Not much mana left. His boots and blade glowed with a gentle light as he sent half of his remaining mana toward his feet, and the other half toward his sword. He disappeared from sight as dust kicked up behind him, dashing past any enemy soldier, aiming directly for the magicians, not daring to look back at his master, whose state was unknown. His purple sword whistled through the air as it got split in two, and he arrived in front of the magicians in the span of a few seconds. The blade left a purple trail in the air as he swung it toward the magicians, who were still chanting with their eyes closed, their deadpan expression never disappearing. Ray's heart skipped a beat as watched the magician stand still. His eyes gleamed with hope as he prepared to cast the teleportation spell with whatever mana he had left, however. Nothing happened. The magicians were still alive, keeping the spatial lock active. His pupils trembled as his head snapped downward, a familiar purplish hue covering his vision. His heart dropped to his stomach as red drops fell on his blade, which now rested on the ground, his hands still clutching the hilt tightly. He slowly tundered his head to his right, where a place-faced Hanyard stood with the purple dragon sword, now dyed with fresh blood. Ray's eyes snapped toward his other hand, where he held a vial with some leftover dark blood. His face flushed red with anger, ignoring the pain pulsating through his arm he yelled at his mother. Demon blood? You dare? Hanyard chuckled in response, raised his mana-infused right leg as he said. Why wouldn't I dare? He kicked with with an upward motion at Ray's stomach intending to slash him almost immediately. However, 
Ray took advantage of the opportunity and used his master's kick to propel himself backward, flying all the way to the front of his house, right before Elena, who had just finished off another wave of enemies, and his son, who was watching from the inside of the house. Dear, Dad, they yelled at the same time, rushing toward Ray. Elena cast a few shields, quickly followed by Kai, who did the same in an attempt to protect his father, who lay motionless on the ground save for the heavy heaves of his chest. Elena quickly placed her hands, which emitted a soft green glow over his body, continuously casting healing magic in the hopes of restoring his hand. However, regardless of how much she tried, how much mana she used or how many tears fell on her husband's body, the corrosive effect of the darkness magic in Hanyard's sword was too severe. Cough. Ray's eyes opened slowly as he coughed lightly, and he groaned in pain as he tried to get up. An intense, sharp pain spread from his stomach and arm all throughout his body, corroding it from the inside. He, I can't believe it. I can't, I can't let it end like this. He grunted as he struggled to raise his hand up, and a green book appeared in his hand as he barely activated his mana ring. Elena quickly grabbed the rough textured book and opened immediately opened it in the middle, revealing a huge hole dug into its empty pages, in which lay a brown, greenish stone. She quickly took it and placed it in Ray's mouth, and he instantly swallowed it. A bright green light covered his body as the crystal stopped near his mana core, fighting off the corrosive effect of the darkness magic. He quickly got up, propping himself on Elena's shoulders as they glared at Hanyard, who was watching them with a darkened face as his expressions twisted, and he hit himself in the stomach, throwing up black blood before wiping his mouth. This should have gotten rid of most of the demon blood, such a shame I can't use it for a long period of time, otherwise. He clicked his tongue as he clutched his sword, inspecting Ray's body. What did he just eat, to have such healing power? Did he go to that place? He panted as he waited for the after effects of the demon blood to wear off. Ray quickly downed a few more potions, smashing the vials on the ground, he retrieved a normal, iron sword from his spatial ring, brandishing it with his remaining left hand as he got used to the feeling and enchanted it with a spell. This should do, he said as he took a fighting stance, Elena following suit with her giant magic sword, and she murmured before saying, Combination magic, sharp light. Her sword glowed with a faint light as its edges became sharper, and the same effect applied to the twelve swords circling her. Both of them dashed toward Hanyard, who similarly lunged at them with a maniacal expression on his face. Ray met his purple sword, his own iron blade shattering almost instantly were it not for the enchantment he cast on it. Cracks spread all over the sword's body as he and his master exchanged more than a dozen blows. Elena followed right behind Ray, jumping from behind him, and swinging at Hanyard, who was distracted by his disciple. He quickly cast the protection barrier as he dodged the spell, pushing Ray backward as Elena moved her huge sword with incredible speed, rays of sword light shooting everywhere each time she swung her sword. What kind of spell is this? Hanyard yelled inwardly as cracks quickly spread over his barrier, and he jumped backward as it shattered, slashing at the ground with his sword, a thick wall of earth quickly rising in front of him. Ray pursued him relentlessly, and swung from behind the wall, destroying it into pieces, taking advantage of the dust he slashed at Hanyard's neck from a weird angle, and the sound of shattering glass rang in his ears as the barrier protecting his master broke. A shiver ran down Hanyard's spine as he felt Elena's warm blade approaching his back. Locked in place, he decided to block Ray's fatal blow, arching his back in an attempt to protect his vitals as he endured the light sword's fierce blow. The morbid sound of tearing flesh accompanied by calming drops of dripping blood rang in their ears. A long wound appeared on his back, its edges sizzling as they cooled down. Hanyard left a trail of blood as he quickly retreated dying the ground crimson as he stood a few meters away from Ray and Elena, glaring at them as he panted. He sent vitality toward his wound in an attempt to close it, however, it would only heal half a centimeter at a time. He clicked his tongue and quickly pulled out a red and round pill from his spatial ring, dodging the duo's attacks as he swallowed it. The wound on his back started healing in mere seconds, and it completely closed up, leaving a long scar across his back. Hanyard jumped backward, and let out an ear-piercing scream as he infused mana in his voice. He flicked his wand before him, and two people looking identical to Hanyard appeared in Ray and Elena's view. The figures quickly multiplied, dozens of them appearing in a few seconds, rushing toward the two as they brandished their sword. 
Illusion technique! Ray exclaimed as he stepped backward, Elena carefully following him as she swung her sword at the clones, which would quickly disappear upon being cut apart. Their heads snapped toward the side, where a sharp whistling sound approached them quickly. Elena grabbed Ray and propelled themselves backward using wind magic, the place where they stood instantly being pierced by a dark spear. Before they could even think about it, another spear rushed in their direction, which they quickly dodged, and as they ran around the battlefield, they realized that a cloud of darkness had enveloped them completely. Relying on their hearing and mana detection, they kept on dodging the spears as they appeared more and more often, the ground shaking every time once thrust into it. What's going on? This seems familiar. Ray's pupils widened as he suddenly realized what was happening, however, it was too late. The spears had stopped, and Elena cast a light spell that drove away the dark cloud. A shiver ran down Ray's back as he looked around him, noticing the multitude of spears surrounding them. He gulped, and turned toward his master, who wore a faint smile on his face. Elena's heart dropped to her stomach upon seeing her husband's reaction, even though she herself was unsure of what befell them. 5. Chapter 22 The Azura's Red Sword The dark spears pulsated with a black light, surrounding Ray and Elena in a symmetrical fashion. Each spear was exactly two meters apart from the other, forming an octagon, inside of which lay a smaller one, where the two stood. Faint, almost invisible threads connected the two shapes together, as they pulled in all the mana from the area. The air became thinner, and the ground cracked as the feeble amount of mana got drained away into the formation. The wind howled as silence prevailed over the battlefield, and not even the birds dared make any sound. Hanyard's hair swayed back and forth, as he calmly watched his disciple trembling slightly inside the octagonal prison. Ray's heart sank into his stomach as the gravity of the situation descended upon him. His eyes dropped to the ground as a wave of despair washed over his body, regret and sorrow filling his heart. He bit his lower lip as his finger ran over his spatial ring, and he injected small amounts of mana into it as he faced his master. I assume you know what this is, Hanyard said slowly, unable to hide the shiver in his voice. Yes, I could have never imagined you would take the time to set it up. We really played into your trap, huh? Ray replied sarcastically with a bitter voice. Hanyard ignored Ray's rhetorical question, instead saying with a chuckle, Not even the former king had the right to see me use this dark siphoning array. The cost was simply too great for. He lingered on his last words as he looked at Elena. Such an easy fight. However, he continued, You have too many secrets up your sleeve. Every time I thought I had you beat you rose back up, I didn't want to give you a chance anymore. It's a pity, but... He took a small pause, a sinister smile manifesting on his face as he said, Your wife will be more than enough to make up for the vitality I will expend to activate it. Ray's hand clenched into a fist as he increased the amount of mana sent into the ring. His face twitched and his pupils contracted as he glared at his master. He gritted his teeth as he endured knowing that any sudden movement would cause Hanyard to activate the array, and they would be dead in mere seconds. Elena's face darkened, and her hand flew to her chest as it tightened. Her heart skipped a beat as a wave of anger washed over her after hearing what Hanyard had said about her and her father. She glared at him with a murderous gaze, however, she didn't dare act either after seeing her husband's helpless state. It looks like this array isn't so simple. Ray kept his head cool as he took advantage of his master's ego preparing his escape plan, the chance of success becoming higher with each second they delayed. Cracking the thing is impossible. Damn it. I wish I had listened more closely to this lesson. He sighed inwardly as he regretted the idiocy of his younger self. Hanyard watched them carefully, and looked to be in contemplation as he brought his hand to his face, his fingers running across the long scar. He frowned as he still felt the sharp pain running across his back, and he let out a bitter laugh as he addressed the couple. Originally, I wanted to kill you one by one, but I won't take the chance. He closed his eyes as his voice lowered, and his decisive gaze turned slightly softer as he looked at Ray. Farewell. He made some hand seals as the last word left his mouth, and half the color drained off his face, along with some of the luster on his eyes and lips. In that same instant, Ray's body twitched as he cast away the sword pulling out five dozen red and white crystals as he turned his back from Hanyard, hugging Elena as he shouted, Explode! Stacking a few flimsy barriers at the same time, the crystals exploded immediately, 
enveloping both him and Elena in a blinding light of fiery mana. The array shuddered constantly as the shockwave tried to escape the contained space, and the sound of cracking constantly rang in the battlefield as cracks spread over the barrier keeping them in. An intense sound of shattering glass resounded in their ears as the array collapsed, releasing the huge mana pressure and sending Ray and Elena flying backward with great speed. Hanyard also got blasted away, his injuries flaring up as he coughed a mouthful of blood, barely processing what Ray had just done. What madness! An intense wave of anger washed over him as he watched the couple fly toward their home. He gnashed his teeth as his metallic left hand dug deep into the scorched ground. That idiot! To think he'd use such a way to escape the array. I definitely need to create a failsafe. Ray and Elena shot toward their house with incredible speed, the wind current was so great that they couldn't even find it in themselves to chant a spell, and they arrived in front of their house in just a few seconds. I fucked up. Ray cursed inwardly as he could barely move his arm, his scorched back burning with intense pain as the threat of imminent death loomed over them. If they were to actually hit the wall at this speed, accompanied by their waning vitality and wounds, a sudden gust of wind slowed them to a halt, gently descending upon the ground as their organs placed themselves back in place. They turned their heads in confusion to see who was it that cast the spell, only to see their son, Kai, running toward them with his wand. Mom, Dad, are you all right? He asked, kneeling next to them, observing his parents' conditions. Both of them were breathing with heavy and irregular breaths, and his mother's arm and legs were burned from the explosion. Her body and lips lost some of their color, wrinkles appeared on her face, and her hair had turned from a beautiful silver to a depressing white. His father's back was almost completely charred black, and his shirt fell off, revealing countless wounds on his abdomen. He tightened his grip on his wand his eyes gleaming as he steeled himself. Kai! Ray grunted as he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Go back inside the house, it's too dangerous out here. Blood dripped from his mouth onto his scarred chest as he tried reaching for Kai, his hand barely reacting to his commands. Kai didn't reply, nor did he shake his head. He knew he couldn't do anything against such an opponent, and his heart threatened to jump out of his chest as he felt Hanyard's cold glare on his back. He helped his father pull out several potions from his spatial ring, and quickly helped him down them as he said. I know I won't be able to do much, but... His voice cracked, unable to make himself finish the sentence. Elena also drank a few mana regeneration potions as she did her best to heal Ray, whose entire body was trembling from the pain. I don't have much mana left. Will this be enough? She sighed inwardly as her eyes snapped to Hanyard. A twisted smile plastered on his face as he panted heavily, doing his best to heal his wounds with whatever vitality he had left. I can't believe I wasted half my vitality. Only for him to blow himself up, that fool. He gazed behind him. The remaining soldiers were watching the battle with awe and fear, and the mages that maintained the spatial lock could not to do so for that much longer. Their mana and mana veins exhausted faster and faster. The spatial lock will only hold on for a few more minutes. Hanyard sighed inwardly as he slowly marched forward. A grin formed on Ray's disheveled face as he came to the same conclusion. He let out a pained grunt as he pulled out a silver sword from his spatial ring, propping himself on it as color slowly drained from his face. The seed's vitality is about to run out, and once it does, he stopped his train of thought as he glanced at Kai and Elena, and he straightened his trembling back as he let out a deep sigh. Elena stood next to him, and her expression pales as she sensed the dwindling life force within her husband. Her shivering hand flew to his face as she gently caressed his scorched beard, and they nodded slightly as they looked in each other's eyes. A bitter expression formed on their faces as they thought about Kai, who wouldn't last long if they perished. Hanyard won't give us enough time for the mages to run out of mana. He will definitely do everything in his power to kill us, Ray thought as he downed another mana potion. Without waiting for Hanyard to move first, they dashed toward him, and Elena shot up into the sky once she was a few dozen meters away from him, her wand once again turning into a huge sword that channeled a large amount of mana, and she kept herself hovering using wind magic. Ray rushed toward Hanyard, the wind cutting his skin and causing his face to go numb. He imbued his silver sword with all the magic he could muster, its blade glowing with a cool black light as cracks covered it slowly. In that same instant, Kai also started chanting the strongest spell he could use, Double Phoenix Destruction. 
Hanyard looked indifferently at the scene, his heart skipping a beat upon sensing the trio's magic. He sighed, and placed his sword diagonal to the ground, its tip glowing with a small red dot. Countless crimson strings manifested around it, connecting the red light with the soldiers surrounding him, including the magicians. Their expressions didn't flicker as the thread penetrated their foreheads, rapidly draining their vitality. The sword tip absorbed the majority of it, Hanyard only receiving a small amount that slowly healed him. The red dots slowly turned from a bright red color to a dark crimson hue, and Hanyard gradually lifted its tip, emitting an indomitable might that surpassed all life. A shiver ran down Ray's spine as approached the sword, but he didn't falter, picking up the pace as he thought, regardless of what technique he came up with, he is also weakened. There is no way he can unleash it completely. He struggled to raise his speed once again, hoping to stop Hanyard's attack before finishing it. He arrived in front of his master at the same time that the sword had been lifted to about 80%. Ray slashed at him with all his strength, the black aura around his sword shooting straight toward Hanyard's forehead, and at the same time, Elena had finished her spell. Her sword had become as big as the trees, and she cleaved down as a blinding sword light shot toward Hanyard. Original magic! Execution! The sword light passed right through Ray, its only target being Hanyard, who watched the attacks with a deadpan expression on his face. Kai also finished his spell, and two large phoenixes of contrasting colors shot toward Hanard at rapid speed, leaving a trail of red and blue fire behind them. The sky got covered in four different colors, one mightier than the other, all of them aimed straight at one man, who calmly raised his sword as its tip trembled violently. He did nothing to protect himself, not even casting the smallest barrier. As the attacks were about to connect with his body, his sword slowly fell to the ground as all the leftover vitality in his soldiers and mages got sucked away by the red threads, and they instantly turned into ash, their armor and clothes falling to the ground with a loud thud. Ray's vision blurred, and a red hue covered his sight, and the world disappeared under his feet. The only thing he saw was the clear blade of a crimson sword that descended upon him like an arrow show from a crossbow. 4. Chapter 23 the bitter twilight. The sky got drained of all color as his surroundings turned dark, and as he looked at the bloody sword, the image of an azura from hell standing in the battlefield manifested in front of him. Mountains of corpses manifested around the creature as it stood there. Its head was decorated with two sharp horns and its eight eyes stared down at Ray as it brandishes its eight weapons, each one held in a separate hand. It emitted a strong and murderous and bloody aura that made Ray tremble in fear and he grunted in pain every time he inhaled. The azura opened its mouth and let out a primal scream, its two sets of razor-sharp teeth glowing slightly under the moonlight. Ray lost the grip on his sword as it fell, letting out a muffled thud sound as it hit the ground. His pupils trembled as he took a step backward. Kai and Elena saw the same thing as him. Fear gripped their hearts as Elena fell to the ground, unable to maintain her spell anymore and Kai was kneeling on the floor as he stared at the sky with widened eyes. The sword tip stopped falling, and once again its tip was diagonal with the ground as its color was restored to its original purple, and it seemed to not have moved at all from its original position. The moment it made contact with the ground, a huge crimson red sword phantom split the sky in two as the clouds churned about. Crimson rain suddenly poured down as Ray was sent flying toward his house and the ear-shattering sound of breaking the sound barrier echoed in the battlefield. Dad! Kai woke up from his daze as he saw Ray shoot toward him, and he quickly attenuated his fall as kneeled next to him. His father laid motionlessly on the ground, his chest struggling to raise, and a deep and long cut ran across his entire body, slowly eating away at whatever vitality he had left. Dad, open your eyes! Dad! Kai placed his father's head on his knees as he pleaded, he pulled out a pushin from his spatial ring which he shoved down Ray's throat, however that was of no help. Tears dripped down his cheeks onto his father's gradually paler face, contrasting the red rain descending upon them. He gently lay Ray's head on the ground, and placed his arms upon his father's chest bloody chest, and started doing chest compressions as his arms turned crimson. Come on dad, wake up, wake up, wake up, Kai cried inwardly his heart ripping apart as he did his best to bring his father back to life. As Kai applied his body weight to Ray's heart, a small faint light spread out from his chest, slightly healing him. His blood-soaked hands persisted as his mind slowly fell into despair, 
and he continued clinging to that thread of hope until... Arg! Ray groaned in pain as he opened his eyes, coughing lightly as his unfocused gaze turned to Kai, whose face lit up briefly. He inspected his father's body, and saw that the wound wasn't closing up any faster, and instead the blood that dripped down formed a large pool that surrounded them. A tender, apologetic look manifested on Ray's face, and he struggled to smile as his hand twitched before stopping. He felt the very last bit of strength leave his body, and he gazed into his son's eyes. Kai, I'm sorry, the talisman break it. His weakened voice barely left his body. He looked at his father, his tears still flowing out like a river in the intense rain, which, along with his shock and pleads, silenced Ray's last words, which only entered his ears as an incoherent mess. I'm so useless, so useless. His despairing gaze fixated on his father, who slowly closed his eyes and gave his last breath. No! Kai let out a light cry which quickly faded as his voice cracked. His legs felt limp, and his heart raced as his gaze fell on his bloody, shivering hands. He gently ran his hand across the large wound as goosebumps spread all over his body. Boom! He snapped his head toward a violent explosion. His hazy vision caused by his tears and thick cloud of dust made him unable to see exactly what was happening, but he could see two figures still fighting within. Elena fought against Henard with all her power but she also had a small but deep cut down to the bone, running across her arm. Wounds covered her body, deep, black cuts and holes littered her abdomen and legs, and her face had been slashed several times. Blood covered her body, which only got worse and worse each time she swung her sword. She let out light grunts of pain as she slashed at Henyard, who barely managed to dodge by a hair's breadth each time. A wave of anxiety washed over her body as she glanced behind her unsure of the state of her husband and fearing for her child's life, thighing her grip around the sword's handle, and let out a soft sigh as it morphed back into a wand. A gut-wrenching cry of unwillingness emitted from it, and Elena's face twisted in pain as the sound rang in her ears. I'm sorry. She threw her hand at Hanyard instantly, pulling out a dagger decorated with two golden dragons from her spatial ring at the same time. Explode! Elena yelled the moment the wand arrived near Hanyard's head and she lunged at him with her dagger, aiming straight at his throat. Boom! The wind howled as a bigger, more violent explosion rang in the battlefield once again, creating a small shockwave accompanied by a blinding light, and a small sea of fire. Kai quickly cast the small mana shield close to his body, but even with this added layer of protection he shot backward like a kite with its string cut. He struggled to open his eyes as the light faded away and he gulped nervously as he focused his gaze toward the battlefield. He wanted to see his mother succeed, to win, to kill Hanyard. Please! The dust settled quickly, and his eyes widened as his heart skipped a beat. He saw his mother, not running toward him, not smiling or laughing. He saw Hanyard. His face was half-scorched, his flesh sizzled, his body covered in burn marks, and his skin melted off his bones in some places. His long metallic left arm pointed upward, and what hung on its tip made Kai gasp in shock. His left hand had pierced Elena's chest, and he was holding her up like a piece of meat on a skewer. Her chest moved slightly as she struggled to hold on. Her scorched black arms hung around her body in the air. She slowly turned her head toward Kai. Her crimson eyes had lost most of their luster, and her beautiful silver hair swayed in the wind as her lips parted. No sound escaped her mouth and even breathing sent huge amounts of pain throughout her entire body. She could only mouth her words as her eyes locked with Kai's. My son, please, live. Her mouth closed into a slight, melancholic smile as she closed her eyes. Hanyard held her tightly with his right hand, which has been nearly maimed by the explosion, and a morbid flesh-tearing sound rang in the battlefield as he pulled his metallic hand back. A rhythmic beating sound echoed in Kai's mind as he watched his mother's body drop to the ground with a muffled thud, a gaping hole decorating her bloody chest. His gaze switched from Elena to Hanyard's hand, which held the still beating heart quickly draining of blood. It was immediately obvious the heart wasn't red, but instead it was transparent like a crystal, which sparkled brightly under the twilight sun. Kai's pupils widened as goosebumps spread all over his body. Tears ran down his face as he looked at his parents' corpses, lying in a pool of their own blood dead. 5. Chapter 24 Love Births Hatred His pupils trembled as his vision switched from one to the other, 
and his breathing turned ragged as a sharp pain spread from his chest all over his body. His muscles spasmed lightly as he tried calming his breathing, which gradually turned to hyperventilation. Mom, Dad, why? He glanced at their corpses again and again before glaring at Henyard, who panted heavily, his bloody body in high contrast to the clear heart within his hand. He wore a twisted, excited smile on his face as he placed the heart into a glass box that contained immense amounts of mana, and he rubbed it gently before placing it into his spatial ring. I finally have the crystal heart. It was so hard to obtain that I didn't even bother putting it in my plans but now, he gloated inwardly as he straightened himself. To think they'd be so foolish as to stay in M.Y. Kingdom, all for a... His head snapped toward Kai, who trembled like a terrified cat as he lay against the wall. I should get rid of him. This brat's a variable I don't want. He thought as he walked toward Kai. Kai watched helplessly as his parents' murderer calmly approached him, brandishing his bloody sword as he looked at him with a piercing gaze. The sound of his muffled footsteps drowned got drowned by the scarlet rain and it reminded Kai of that day ten years ago. Once again, backed into a corner, powerless to do anything but watch as his life was about to be taken away once again. His heart threatened to jump out of his chest as his face flushed red, and in his despair, he shut his eyes, trying to remember a simpler time. Somewhere on the edges of a small city stood a small, crude house. It looked abandoned, ready to fall apart at any second. The walls were made out of cheap, crumbled stones while the wooden supports were filled with holes and insects. The kitchen had little to no appliances, only a sink filled with dirty dishes and nearly broken down fridge. A small and old window frame stood on the southern walls, patched with some rags in hopes of stopping the chilly air from coming in. A woman sat at a table, smoking a thin cigarette, tapping off the ash in an ashtray filled with a few dozen butts. She held a bottle of wine in her other hand of which she took big gulps before placing it down on the table. She looked to be in her mid-thirties, and her beautiful brown hair already showed some white spots, and her face had a few wrinkles. Her emerald green eyes glowed with a faint luster, and despite her current appearance she still showed signs of a young beauty. Next to the kitchen was a bedroom, on which a boy, no older than five or six was drawing something before he got up, running toward the kitchen with a piece of paper in hand. Mom, look! I drew a dinosaur. He yelled as he ran in the woman's embrace, handing her the drawing. She looked at her son, and gently caressed his black hair after putting her cigarette down. That's great baby, you're such a good artist. The boy closed his eyes as he placed his head on her lap, and she continued gently caressing his head, looking at him with a tender gaze. The boy opened his eyes, reaching toward his mother for a hug. However, they weren't in the kitchen anymore, but in the bedroom. It was nighttime and he struggled to keep his eyes open as he looked ahead, where his mother was. Her hands were clenched around his neck, and she wore a maniacal expression on her face as she tightened her grip. It's your fault, all of it. If only, if only, if only you had never been born. He would still be with me, loved me, and my mom. The boy's teary eyes squinted as he said weakly, looking at his mom with a pleading gaze. The woman's pupils widened in horror, as she seemed to have woken up from a daze, realizing what she had done. She let go of the boy, which she quickly took into her embrace, tears flowing down her cheeks as she apologized. I'm sorry baby, mommy didn't want to, please forgive me, please, mommy loves you. The boy's eyes snapped shut once again, and the next time he opened them it was already daytime. He looked into the bathroom's mirror, as he brushed his teeth. He was a bit taller than before, and his unkept hair had grown longer as well. He seemed to be about eight years old now. He walked into the kitchen, and a man at least twice his size stood before him with a bottle of beer in his right hand. A strong, nauseating stench of alcohol escaped his body as he stared at the boy with a hateful gaze. Damn it, to think I have to raise a bastard child like you, he said bringing his hand up to his face, and sighed before he continued. But your mother's a babe and has a job so I guess. He lingered on his last words as he made a clicking sound with his tongue. Suddenly, his foot rose up and struck down at the boy, who curled up into a ball to protect his organs. Endless signs of abuse revelled themselves through his tattered clothes, bruises littered his body, and his body trembled inessentially, without pause, as the man hit high over and over again. Why don't you just die already? Yeah, it would help us a great deal if you would just drop dead. 
The man raised his hand and smashed the bottle against the door's frame before aiming it at the boy, whose eyes had already widened while trembling in fear. No! A sudden cry erupted from the side as the bottle was about to pierce the boy's back. A hand hit the bottle, sending it away, and fresh blood began to drip down on the boy's back. His mother stood above him, her frail hand cut open by a deep wound that reached the bone. The boy remained speechless as he looked in his mother's horror-filled eyes. His consciousness faded away as the sound of a loud slap rang in his mind. Kai opened his eyes halfway as he blinked rapidly, vague memories, nearly impossible to understand flashed in his mind. But all he could see was a bottle of pills and a woman's dead body. A soft luster appeared in his eyes as he completely opened them. So something like that happened. Both lives flashed before his eyes as he stood up, lifting his head and looking at his parents' bodies. Grief, despair, sadness, regret, indignation, a myriad of emotions washed over his body as a shiver ran down his spine. He steeled himself and decided to face his enemy, even if he was weak, powerless, even if his odds of victory were small, he decided to fight. I've been cowering long enough. He locked eyes with Hanyard, who took a step backward as he sensed Kai's strong will, and a faint smile appeared on his face as he quickened his pace. Kai inhaled deeply as he calmed down, his ear beating slowly but rhythmically, and with each pulse he could sense large amounts of energy spreading throughout his entire body. Strong gusts of wind circled him and the ground beneath his feet started cracking under the pressure. Silver scales appeared all over his body at a speed visible to the naked eyes, and his nails morphed into sharp claws. His feet grew bigger and slowly another pair of claws manifested as they tore apart his shoes. His fangs grew longer, thicker and sharper and his pupils became thinner, akin to those of a cat. His silver hair grew even longer, and two horns sprouted from the top of his head, pulling the mana from the environment toward him. He glared at Hanyard as his hands clenched into a fist, and his muscles tightened in an unnatural anticipation for the fight. Hanyard halted his footsteps, panicking slightly as he choked. Amazing, he was in awe at the sight before him and his eyes shone greedily as he looked at Kai. This brat's bloodline awakened at such a time. Not even the former king had done this. A creepy smile manifested on his face, and he chuckled to himself as he thought, to think I'd be able to obtain two treasures. Once I extract his bloodline and fuse it with mine, and together with the crystal heart I will be unstoppable. His body shivered in excitement as he imagined himself rolling over the whole continent. He marched forward as his lips parted. Not bad, kid, to think you'd have such talent. Kai didn't reply, instead he stretched his limbs, and as he got accustomed to the transformation, his skeleton let out loud noises as his bones creaked. He cracked his joints in rapid succession, the loud bangs ringing like thunder in Hanyard ears. His lips parted as he let out a primal scream, akin to an angry dragon yelling at the heavens. He looked hatefully at the man before him, and without concerning himself with inspecting his body, he moved. 5. Chapter 25. There is nothing left. His body appeared in front of Hanyard in less than three seconds, his silver-scaled fist heading straight for the man's pelvis. However he dodged and Kai sent himself flying forward. Oh? Hanyard thought in surprise upon noticing the interaction so he doesn't know how to fight yet, but that strength. He licked his lips as he waited for Kai to steady himself, before giving him a provocative look. I want to see how far this dragonic form can go. Kai scoffed as he faced him once again, this time imitating a fighting stance he saw in his previous life. His legs and shoulders stood apart, and his arms were raised up to his chin, protecting his vitals. Hanyard's eyes widened in surprise, but he only smiled faintly as he waited for Kai to attack, which didn't take long as he immediately lunged at the man. He sent a multitude of loose punches toward Hanyard which he casually dodged as he looked at the bizarre fighting technique. He has some style but it's messy, uncoordinated, imprecise. He's worse than a beginner. He sent out a punch toward Kai, taking advantage of his many openings and sent him flying backward a few meters before regaining his footing. He frowned, looking at Hanyard with a perplexed expression. Is he toying with me? Inhaling deeply, he dashed toward Hanyard, sending out a fake right hook, causing him to dodge backward where Kai's feet would wait for him. He kicked him up into the air, taking him by surprise, and before he could even land, Kai jumped toward him, sending him flying onto the ground. 
The ground shuddered as Hanyard dug a small hole into it, and Kai landed on his body before he even got a chance to get up, deepening the hole he found himself in. Kai lifted him up by the collar, preparing to strike again, but before he could do that a sharp pain spread from his wrist. He let go of Hanyard, and noticed that his hand had been rotated the other way around. Not only that, his fingers were a jumbled mess of flesh and bone, and even his feet were barely recognizable. He let out a light scoff, ignoring the pain as he inhaled deeply. A wave of warmth spread throughout his body as his wounds healed at a speed visible to the naked eye. Hanyard observed these changes and he took a mental note as he pulled out his sword. He barely has any power behind those fists, and when he does hit he ends up doing more damage to himself than to me. What an idiot. Kai ignored the pain as he rushed toward him, subconsciously imbuing his claws with the corrosive power of darkness as he aimed at his neck. The sound of metal clashing with metal rang in the battlefield as Hanyard blocked the strike, causing Kai's claws to break. He lost and regenerated claws endlessly as he struck faster and faster, gradually gaining an understanding of his new form, and increasing his control over it. Hanyard's focus increased as he noticed Kai hitting harder, faster and more precise. He blocked Kai with his sword each time he would aim for his vitals and would dodge the strike whenever possible as his sword slowly lost its luster. As time passed, and Kai understood his powers better, Hanyard was forced to block with his sword more and more often, wincing in pain each time he saw a small piece of it get chipped off. Kai's fist suddenly opened into a hand, and a small wisp of fire appeared within it, rapidly becoming a fireball, making Hanyard take a step back, then hit him with a wind shot. Hanyard stepped back slightly, in a place where Kai had raised the ground a bit, causing him to lose his balance. Kai's fist descended upon Hanyard like a barrage, in response to which Hanyard cast a few barriers, and let out a strong discharge of mana. Break! He yelled furiously. Kai stepped back, losing his footing as Hanyard imbued his sword with darkness magic, his sword casting a purple trail as it shot toward Kai's claws. He scoffed at the straight, and he extended his hand as he cast several small barriers around in the shape of his hand around his palm and his arm trembled as he caught the sword with his bare hands. Hanyard's eyes widened as he hastily tried to remove his sword from Kai's grasp. However, he found that no matter how much he wanted, he couldn't actually pull it back. How is this possible? He suddenly let go of the sword as Kai reached toward his neck, and retreated as he cast several minor spatial barriers between him and Kai. He panted heavily as he analyzed the situation. Kai also took the time to observe the changes in his body. Ignoring the physical changes, he contemplated on how to best use his strength. If I concentrate most of my strength in a single part of my body when striking, the damage ideal would be greater, however. He sighed as he looked at the ground littered with claws, flesh and blood, most of it belonging to him. I can't control it perfectly. I won't last long at this rate. He clenched his fist as memories of his parents flashed in his mind, and his eyes snapped to Hanyard gritting his teeth as a thick killing aura emanated from within his body. Glaring at Hanyard, he let out a primordial scream that came from the depths of his soul. The sound caused the air to shudder, and all animals in a small radius looked toward Kai's direction with a look of reverence and fear. He stepped forward, ignoring all the spatial barriers. He appeared in front of Hanyard in an instant, and the air split in two as his punch shot toward his enemy. Hanyard's pupils constricted as he instantly cast several mana shields as he deflected Kai's punch with his metallic arm. The fist fell toward the ground, and the ground shuddered as they made contact, a shockwave spreading out from the impact. Kai wiggled his arm in an attempt to escape his hand, but it was firmly planted in the dried soil. Hanyard immediately pulled out another sword from his spatial ring, slashing toward Kai's neck. Almost instinctively, he dodged in a weird manner barely able to make the blade miss his vitals. Ack. He grunted in pain as a deep cut appeared on his shoulder, and blood spurred out everywhere as the darkness imbued sword ate away at his flesh the moment it healed. How had Dad managed to endure this? Finally pulling out his fists, he retreated more than five dozen meters and he applied pressure on his wound as he glared at Hanyard. And a wave of anxiety and fear washed over him as a thought popped up in his mind. Even when he looks shocked he's confident. Although I seem to have the advantage over him, how come I don't feel like that at all? Could it be? He gulped as his heart skipped a beat, and his pupils trembled as he looked at Hanyard. Could it be that he was testing me? 
A shiver ran down his spine as realization hit him, and his pupils constricted as he clenched his fists. You want to see how strong I am, so be it. He cast a speed-enhancing spell, and his claws turned darker as two small tornadoes rotated around his fists, pulling everything before him backward. He imbued them with the power of darkness, and his eyes lit up with a witty glint as he shot the two pitch-black tornadoes which shot with great speed toward Hanyard. Hanyard cast several protection barriers in front of him in an attempt to slow them down, and he ran toward the purple sword Kai had left on the ground as he covered himself with layers of protection. Kai pulled his wand and smiled sinisterly at him, disappearing from sight once again as he stopped a few meters behind Hanyard, who just managed to grab his sword. His head snapped back as he felt a sudden threat of death loom over him, and his eyes widened as he saw Kai point a wand at his head, mouthing only one word before all sound disappeared. You know in my world gods aren't the only ones that know how to wield a heavenly tribulation. A large, violent explosion that seemed out of this world appeared in a small area around them. Hanyard raised his sword, instantly casting several dozen layers of protection as he attempted to retreat. However, he couldn't. The two black tornadoes were still blocking his path, which gave him no choice but to endure silently. His body flashed as he chanted several protection spells, however it was far too late. A deafening sound reverberated through the air as the explosion gradually spread outward. The ground cracked under the heat as the air became heavier. What kind of spell is this? Hanyard panted as he anxiously looked around, and a shiver ran down his spine as he felt the change of mana in the area. It's... It's disappearing. He glanced upward, his skin burning hot as he tried to make sense of the situation, and he could vaguely see the shape of the explosion. From afar, it looked like a huge mushroom cloud that pierced through the heavens. The sound of shattering glass echoed in the area as Hanyard's barriers shattered in quick succession, and he finally felt the brunt of the pressure as it reached its peak. He flew wildly about as the huge mushroom-shaped cloud revealed a horrific scene as it gradually faded away. A huge, scorched hole replaced the patch of ground that once existed in the area, and somewhere in it lay a person, coughing and spitting blood as he struggled to get up. Hanyard's metallic arm was nowhere to be seen, and most of his hair had been burned off, as well as most of his clothes. He wore a twisted, horrible expression on his face, and his eyes widened in shock as he inspected the ruined battlefield. This area is devoid of any mana, and that brat, where is he? A doubt arose in his heart as he pondered over the matter, however he quickly led of that thought. There are traces of teleportation left. He must have escaped. His teeth let out a scraping sound as they grinded against each other, fury overwhelming his body. He coughed out blood, realizing that there was nothing he could do anymore. The little amount of mana he had left almost flowed backwards in his veins, and his muscles trembled under his weight as he slowly moved out of the death zone. He sighed as he looked toward the morning sky, and he crushed a small stone before disappearing. Somewhere in the huge forest around the kingdom, the rustling of leaves and crackling of branches broke the silence of the quiet wonderland. The birds stopped their morning song as they quickly fled in panic, the flapping of their wings accompanied by a heavy thud. At the base of a tree lay a boy, his silver hair reflecting the stray rays of the twilight sun, and his watery crimson eyes trembled as his chest heaved heavily. Silver scales fell off his body, revealing a set of dark red and torn clothes. He grunted in pain as he tried to lift his head, his entire body shivering as tears slid down his cheeks, hiccuping lightly as he tried to calm his breathing. Sighing, he leaned against the tree to support himself, and his unfocused gaze stared at a piece of old and torn paper. He clutched it tightly as he brought it to his face, his gaze shifting toward the necklace hanging by his neck. Tears streamed down like a waterfall, gradually flooding his face as he pressed the necklace to his chest. A sharp, cold pain spread from his chest throughout his whole body. Mom, Dad, Hick Mom, Hick Dad. His consciousness slowly faded away, and his breathing calmed down as the rhythmic drops of chilling rain landed on his body. Hurried, dragged footsteps slowly approached his location, and a small shadow cast over him as the tired figure of a person stopped before him. Three. Chapter 26 Morbid Ever After The wind made the soft blades of grass sway back and forth as it slowly blew past them, and a few dried leaves rustled as they moved along with it. The leaves followed the breeze, flying above the vibrant grass field before stopping on a boy's face. 
he scratched his nose, pushing away the leaves before he resumed his peaceful sleep. Laying in the field, his body sinking into the grass, his long silver hair was almost completely hidden within its blades. His chest heaved as he slowly opened his eyes, blinking rapidly as the sun hit his crimson pupils. His hair fell along his body as he slowly got up, stretching before looking around curiously. Where am I? He tried to stand up, however he shot back to the ground the moment he raised, almost like an invisible force pulled him down. What the? Kai's heart sank to his stomach as he tried standing up once again, but his legs felt heavy, as if they were tightly constrained by spiky tendrils. He screamed in pain as blood gushed out of his feet, turning the grass to a deep crimson color. His gut-wrenching screams reverberated in the empty field, but his pleadings fell on deaf ears, as no one was there to hear. He wore a pitiful expression as he yelled toward the sky in a silent voice. He snapped his head backward as he felt a morbid aura rapidly approach him, and his pupils widened in shock at the sight before him. A man and a woman walking slowly toward him, their ghostly bodies covering a dozen meters in a single step. Mom, Dad. He watched in horror as his parents' figures became clearer and clearer in his eyes. They both wearing smiling expressions as they casually strolled toward him sending a shiver down his spine. Goosebumps spread all over his body as he gulped. His face flushed red and his face broke into a relieved smile after seeing his parents alive and well. But he was too blinded by their presence to observe the morbid scene behind them. The grass withered and fell apart before disappearing into clouds of dust, revealing the dried and broken dirt, similar to that of the vampire kingdom. The sky darkened and a blood moon appeared, hanging above their heads following them wherever they passed. Kai tried getting up, and he grunted in pain as he fell to the ground violently hitting the floor with his jaw. He raised his head, hopefully looking at his parents, and his heart threatened to jump out of his chest as their figures came closer and closer. He could clearly see their young faces, their bright smile, and their glowing crimson eyes. Mom! Dad! He yelled inwardly as he began crawling through the grass, dragging his bloody legs as he hurried toward his parents, his elbows gradually becoming a mangled mess as the grass turned into small, dark spears that dug into his bones. He steeled through the unbearable pain as he stared forward with anticipation, waiting for his parents to pick him up, hug and tell him that everything will be alright. His eyes gleamed with hope as their figures finally arrived by his hide, their translucent clothes fluttered past his body, which started decaying as soon as they walked past him. He gasped in shock as he looked toward his parents with widened eyes, and his body jolted slightly before he looked around. Finally seeing the death and decay his parents left in their wake, he stared at his decomposing body with horror, as he let out a soundless scream. No! Don't leave me! He pleaded inwardly, and his heart skipped a beat as they halted their footsteps. They slowly turned their heads in an unnatural angle, their exposed skull had bits of melted and rotten flesh hanging from it. Their empty eye sockets glowed with a fierce red color, and their teeth cackled as their body turned, following the motion of their heads. His mother had a gaping hole in her chest, while his father was missing his hand and clothes, exposing his still-beating heart that could be seen through his ribcage. Kai gulped and his entire body trembled as he tried running backward, however he was unable to move. He shifted his gaze toward his legs, where he saw two pairs skeletal of arms tightly hugging his shins and thighs, dragging them to the ground as they slowly tore away his flesh. Why, son? Why? His parents' eerie voices rang in his mind, cold sweat dripped down his spine as he tried to pry open the arms, however all his efforts were futile. You, you killed our son. His eyes widened as stared at his parents, his left eye slowly fell out of its socket, turning into dust before even reaching the ground. No! No! I, I'm your son! He yelled, spitting his yellow teeth out as bloody tears flooded his eyes. Your fault! All your fault! The sky shuddered, the couple's voices reverberating through the air, and a huge metallic hand raised up from the ground, violently slamming into Kai's body, destroying his midsection. The skeletal arms finally dragged his legs into the ground, disappearing completely from view under Kai's primal pain-filled scream. He tried removing the metal hand, his futile actions causing his parents' teeth to cackle in amusement. Serves you right, re h t u k. Kai let out a bloody scream as the metallic hand dug its claws into his body, dragging him backward and into the crowd, his parents' ghostly laugh echoing in his mind as he became one with the ground.
half his body jolted as his eyes snapped open, and he grunted in pain as his heart pushed wildly against his ribcage. Cold sweat dripped down his forehead as he attempted to calm his unsteady breathing. He brought his hand to his chest, clutching at his heart as he tried to ease his pulse, inhaling deeply in an attempt to steady himself. His sweat-drenched upper body was covered in bandages, blood sipped from his open wounds, dyeing them crimson. He looked around the familiar room, the walls made out of pelts gave him some privacy as he laid down on the large bed. He briefly inspected his bruised and bloodied arms before gently lowering them on the bed. A set of slow and heavy footsteps echoed in his ears as the figure of an old man appeared in the corner of his eye. He carried a vat of water inside as he stopped next to Kai, placing the vat on a chair by his head. Another nightmare? He asked as he wet a cloth, undoing his dirty bandages and cleaning his wounds, without waiting for Kai to answer. He didn't resist. He couldn't couldn't even if he wanted to as he barely had any strength in his body. The cold water sent shivers throughout his entire body as it touched his burning skin. A soft light emitted from the old man's wand, and a brief feeling of relief washed over his corrosive wound. He stared blankly ahead as the old man helped him up, drying him off before placing new bandages over his wounds and leaving without saying another word, only giving Kai a pitiful glance. Lying back down, he inhaled deeply, staring blankly at the ceiling as he tried to calm down. He held the purple necklace his parents gave him, his mind occupied by thoughts, but empty at the same time. His teeth let out a scraping sound as he remembered the events of the past few days, and his heart threatened to jump out of his chest as images of that day flashed before his eyes. The old man had found him five days ago, laying against the tree not far from his camp, unconscious. His body was drenched in blood and a few drops of rain washed off a bit every so often. Even unconscious, he held tightly onto the necklace, as if he was afraid that he might lose it. The old man's eyes widened after he inspected Kai's wounds. He poured mana into his body, carefully inspecting every nook and cranny and his shock deepened after he finished. How is this boy still alive? A lot of the bones in Kai's body were broken, and a large percentage of his mana veins were covered in cracks ready to shatter at any moment. His muscles were torn to shreds, and his internal organs were a complete mess. The most shocking thing, however, was the wound that ran across his chest from his shoulder. A malicious, dark energy ate away at his skin, rotting his flesh and drinking his blood. The old man gulped as he used some light magic to drive away the corrosion, but it did little to no good. It will take a while. He sighed as he put his wand away. He brought Kai back to the camp placing a small totem by his head to watch over him. His heart raced in his chest as he ran toward Kai's home, and an empty feeling appeared in his stomach as countless thoughts flashed in his mind. No, it can't be. The battlefield appeared in his field of view. His heart dropped to his stomach as he panted while looking at the morbid scene. Countless corpses littered the crimson dyed ground, bits and pieces of flesh rotting away, emanating a putrid stench, filling the air with the aura of death. The old man jumped over the burnt and mangled bodies of the black armored soldiers, frantically praying and hoping that his thoughts would not come to be. However what one fears to happen always becomes reality, and one's worst nightmares always end up being true. He ran toward what remained of the house, a few walls covered in holes, the roof had caved in and the windows became nothing more than glorified knives. The old man fell to his knees as he arrived next to Elena's lifeless body her youthful vigor replaced by the face of a middle-aged woman. A gaping hole took the place of where her heart used to be. Her pale skin contrasted the pool of dark blood that she was stuck to. Her faint smile had remained frozen on her face that, together with her widened eyes, created a horrific picture. He brought his trembling hand to her face, slowly closing her eyes as he held back tears, and he took out a pelt from his ring, covering Elena's body before getting up. Ray, where is Ray? Looking around, he gulped as he feared the worst, but he had to make sure, he needed to verify with his own eyes that it didn't happen. He looked toward the destroyed house, in front of which lay Ray, his body in a worse state than even Elena's as the darkness consumed most of his skin and muscles, leaving behind an almost empty skeleton. Ray! The old man exampled, barely recognizing Kai's father at first sight. His heart ached painfully and a sharp pain spread all over his body as tears flew down his cheeks. Why? He let out a long, pain-filled scream as he stared at the cloudy sky, his soul tearing into pieces as he fell to the ground. 
repeatedly hitting the ground with fury and desperation. He took out a small cart from his ring, and gently placed their covered bodies next to each other. He finally departed after finding Ray's arm and sword. The cart's wheels creaked under their weight, and the old man disappeared into the forest, slowly dragging his feet behind him. He found a place where the sun would shine during noon, in front of two trees whose trunks intertwined. Using earth magic to dig two holes, he could not bring himself to separate the couple, and lay them to rest together before before dirt covered their empty husks. He then dug the sword deep into the ground, marking their resting place. He returned to his tent as darkness took over the land, his body swaying weakly from left to right as he balanced himself against the trees. Kai woke up two days later, every fiber of his body screaming in pain even as he tried to breathe. He couldn't move, he couldn't eat, he could barely drink water and speak, and even that proved difficult. The old man rushed to his side, his being overcome with emotion upon seeing Kai awake, and dropped to his knees as his shoulders shook lightly. Kai looked at him from the corner of his eyes, their dimly lit crimson hue and unmoving pupils seeming to have lost all life. Who did this? The old man asked, choking lightly. He didn't answer immediately, instead looking at the ceiling with a deadpan expression. His disheveled hair covered part of his face, and after a long period of silence his lips parted. Ha, and I are, he said in a hoarse, barely audible voice, pain spreading all throughout his body with each syllable. A shiver ran down the old man's spine upon hearing the name, but his eyes burned with determination and fury. I knew it. He hurriedly got up, his expression covered in the desire for revenge, and he got ready to rush out the tent. His eyes widened in surprise upon feeling something drag him back. He snapped his head backward and saw Kai's pain-filled expression and trembling hand that held him by the cloak. Deep within his dim eyes, Hidden behind a layer of grief and depression was a fire fueled by rage, emitting a hint of killing intent and bloodlust. The old man sighed, and gave up on any thoughts of revenge upon seeing Kai's seething hatred. Looks like it's inevitable. He freed himself and left the tiny room with his hands behind his slightly hunched back. 4. Chapter 27 An Orphan's Desperation Recalling the events of the past few days, all the pent-up rage he'd bottled up was ready to explode at any time. He winced in pain as he straightened his back, and clenched his fists while looking down at his body. Remembering the technique his mother shared with him, he attempted to circulate mana through his broken mana veins, causing excruciating pain to spread throughout his body. His stomach muscles convulsed violently, and he threw up blood on the new pelts, immediately stopping the technique. Cold sweat dripped down his forehead as he stared at the viscous pool of blood before him. His pupils trembled as tears slowly dripped down his cheeks, unable to contain the sadness and despair. His nails cut deep into his flesh as his shivering hands clenched into fists, and his teeth let out a sharp screeching sound as he grit them. Blood soaked his palms, turning them into a crimson hue which only grew larger as rage and anger took over his body. I refuse. I refuse to be a cripple. He grunted in pain and slammed down on his knees bloodying the pelt that served as a blanket as he wiped his hands on it. His bandaged and broken legs shivered as he removed the cover, and he wore a twisted expression while trying to get out of bed. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! His leg muscles spasmed violently as they barely listened to his orders, and the bone fragments rattled in his body as he fell to the ground with a loud thud. Biting his lower lip, he rose his head toward a makeshift torch a small fire stone glued to the pelts situated next to a shelf. He dragged his feet behind him as he crawled on the uneven and cold floor. The chilling surface rubbed against his bandages, nearly undoing them as blood seeped out of them once again, the dark mana pulsating widely as it ate away at his flesh. Enduring through the pain, he crept even so closer to the magic stone, his eyes burning with the desire to prove himself wrong, to prove the old man wrong, and to stop his fears from blooming further. Minutes that felt like hours passed, a sharp pain spreading all throughout his body each time he moved. Panting, he held onto the shelf as he raised himself, and he tugged the fire stone while falling to the ground. He lay on his back as he held the stone above his head, its glowing surface reflecting in his crimson eyes. It burned furiously in his palm as the mana that the old man left in it had yet to be fully used, and he shut his eyes as he imagined the mana in his body. I can do it. I can do it. Recalling the spell for a simple fireball, 
he gritted his teeth while trying to control the energy within his cracked mana veins, and called to the meager amount of mana still present in his core. A burning pain spread throughout his nearly shattered mana veins as the old cracks expanded and new ones appeared. He could feel his core vibrating violently as the two dimly lit stars slowly spun to life. The fire stone trembled in his hands as it accepted the barely usable mana, and a small wisp of fire seemed to be forming above it. However, that didn't last long as it disappeared as quickly as it appeared. As Kai forcefully used the magical energy, he could feel that his mana core stood at the brink of shattering. He could either persist and risk higher injury and death, or he could accept that he was no longer able to cast Anko's spells. His eyes snapped open, and he threw the fire stone away in blinding rage. He brought his burning, shaky hands to his face, which he gripped madly, to the point of bruises and wounds. A voiceless scream left his body as he parted his lips, letting out a primal and muffled scream as his hoarse voice cracked under the endurable pain. The old man rushed madly to the room, his heart racing as anxiety overtook his body. What are you doing, you stupid boy? He screamed madly as he laid his eyes on Kai, who remained silent. Struggling to lift him up without provoking any more pain, the old man placed Kai onto the bed and looked at him with a scornful gaze before letting out a deep sigh. Just rest for now, Kai stared at the ceiling, struggling to hold back tears as he questioned what could have caused such catastrophic damage. Was it that weird form I transformed into when I fought that Bassard? Or maybe because of that heavenly tribulation spell I didn't test properly? Perhaps a combination of both? Fuck. He grunted in pain as he cursed inwardly, and decided that it was better to sleep the pain away than dwell on things he couldn't change. However, even the sleep he longed for was nothing but a mental person, where he was shackled by nightmares and whipped by guilt. He slowly fell into the fabrications of his own mind. Every time, the same scene would repeat, accompanied by a different sunset. Every time, the peaceful dream would turn into a hellish nightmare. Every time, this hell would become his eternal torture. Every time, sweat would drench his body, and his heart would race. The next month passed slowly and Kai started walking and talking more freely. He often sat at a bonfire with the old man. There, the crackling would accompany his trembling voice as he recounted everything that had happened to the old man, whose face was covered in guilt. His heart skipped a beat when Kai told him about the changes in his body, about the weird form he had, and how he managed to fight Hanyard equally. Of course he omitted the last part of the fight, which was largely unimportant for now. The old man decided to look into it as he found the description familiar, but his old mind couldn't quite put his fingers on where it was that he saw it. During that time, Kai had taken small steps toward healing. The corrosive wound has been reduced to a small cut and the skin around it healed slowly, leaving a horrid scar behind. The boy was also worried about Kana and her family, and had asked the old man to go look for them. Fortunately, their house was already vacant, and it looked like they had left in a hurry. Once he was able to walk normally, the old man accompanied him to his parents' graves, where the erected sword reflected the soft light that sneaked through the canopies. He made his way toward it, staring at the hole that was now covered in lush vegetation, and a single tree had sprouted from their resting place. His heart dropped to his stomach, and he fell down on his knees as he lost all feeling in his legs. Blood dripped from his clenched fists, his mind in turmoil as he struggled to accept the facts. But he had to. He saw them die with his own eyes, and now their grave lays beneath his feet. Tears flowed down his cheeks like a river, and he bit his lips as he struggled to hold back his cries. He wept, and the sounds of his grief echoed through the calm forest, so that anyone nearby could hear the sound of his suffering. They were the cries of an orphan. The light reflecting upon the blade faded, and so his cries stopped. His eyes snapped open and he walked toward the sword as he got up. A shiver ran down his spine as he grabbed the hilt. It's heavy. The weight of the sword fell on his body as he raised it above his head, staring at its bloodied surface. He clutched it tighter as it trembled in his hand. The old man waited for Kai to finish mourning, and he let out a heavy sigh as he looked with pity at the boy. So much tragedy at such a young age. I'm surprised he's still so lively. 3. Chapter 28 Hope is all we have. Another half month passed and Kai's physical injuries have recovered for the most part, even the corrosion has vanished after enough treatment. However his mana veins showed no signs of healing, his core was still cracked and the stars still dim. 
The camp was shrouded in darkness, save for a few spots where the light passed through the dense canopy. On its far south was the training ground, with only two poorly made wooden dummies and a fence surrounding them. The dummies were covered in shallow and imprecise cuts, signs of a poor swordsmanship. Kai's white clothes stuck to his skin as sweat drenched his body, and he clutched the purple sword hilt even tighter as blood dripped from his banged hands. He swung relentlessly at the wooden targets, fury and anger fueling his every action, desperation driving his sword toward the enemy. His lack of technique didn't impede him from mindlessly slashing and thrusting, sometimes hitting the dummy with the side of his blade, sometimes it got stuck. But most of the time he'd make shallow cuts that weren't even one centimeter deep. His chest heaved up and down as he took a deep breath. The hilt of the sword trembled in his hand as he planted the blade onto the ground, using it as support. He wiped the sweat off his face as he raised the heavy sword above his head. Stop it! A deep and hoarse voice rang in his ears, and he suddenly felt a strong pressure descend upon his body. He fell to his knees, his sword clanking as it lay beside him. Struggling to turn his head, he was just able to make out a figure out the corner of his eye. What is the meaning of this? He demanded as his voice cracked, glaring at the old man as he fought against the magic. The old man's eyes seemed to be be staring at nothing as memories of countless years ago flashed in his mind. His face darkened and he looked sternly at Kai. How many days has it been since you started doing this? He yelled back, his caring voice now filled with anger. Isn't it enough? Look at your hands and your body. For how long are you going to mutilate yourself like this? How would your parents react? What do you think you will achieve by doing this? Do you think it will bring back your parents? Do you think that by swinging that damned sword around all day you'll be able to defeat Hanyard? His hoarse voice rose higher and higher, cracking by the time he had finished his speech, and his old, wrinkled eyes looked deeply at Kai, his young self and the boy before him merging briefly before he removed his magic. Let's go to the tent, you need to heal first. He had just turned around when a tired, cracking voice echoed in his mind. What do you know? Kai stood up, leaning on the sword as he glared at the old man, his eyes burning with hate, but not directed at the elder. His chest heaved as blood rushed up his throat, which he coughed out before parting his lips. Do you have any idea how much it hurts to lose everything you hold dear? To feel powerless? To not be able to do anything but rot in a pool of guilt and regret? Wah! What does an old man like you know? Kai's face flushed red as he held back tears and a few red veins appeared on his forehead. Silence. He stared at the old man's back, a faint aura of loneliness and grief exuding from his body, but he remained quiet. Kai realized he had said too much, and his trembling lips parted as he tried to excuse himself. Elder, I dash, I know. The old man cut him off as he turned his head slightly, sadness visible in his sunken eyes. Once again facing forward, he beckoned Kai to follow him his voice lingering behind as he slowly made his way toward the camp. Come on, let's treat your wounds for now. Kai followed silently behind the old man, slowly making their way to the large tent situated in the middle of the camp. He curiously looked around, and noticed that the children had stopped running around. The skin of the older ones began to stick to their bones, and even the younger ones began to show signs of the blood rotting. The men were few and far between and those that were extremely sick had disappeared completely. The women weren't doing that much better either. A large number of them had vanished as well, leaving behind those younger ones whose skin had almost completely withered. Kai's face darkened, and he gritted his teeth in frustration. How have I not noticed this until now? His vision drifted toward the elder's hunched back, which suddenly seemed much larger than before. Elder! His lips parted. However, the old man cut him off before he could continue. Call me grandpa, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Kai halted his footsteps, taken aback by the elder's sudden request, but he quickly adjusted his speech before asking, Giari grandpa, if this blood rotting is such a horrible disease, why do these people? He cut himself short, not daring to continue however his question was obvious. The old man let out a heavy sigh, stopping as he straightened his back. Look around you, these people, the children and their parents. What do you see? Are they not in pain? Are they not suffering? Yet they still persevere, they still keep a smile on their face. Why is it so? Kai remained silent, pondering over the question however he was unable to find an answer even after a few minutes. The old man turned toward Kai, 
locking eyes with him as he parted his lips. They're hopeful. They hope that one day this curse will be lifted from our race, that maybe someone will find a way to free them from this constant suffering. I've been watching over them for a while now and none of them ever complained. He inhaled deeply before he continued in a shaky voice. When it was time for them to turn, they left this world with a smile on their face. After finishing his speech, the old man headed toward the tent, leaving Kai standing in the middle of the camp as he pondered over what he had said. He walked toward a large tree, and leaned against it as he sat down, quietly watching the camp's residents go about their life. The sun changed positions, and the darkness that veiled the camp deepened even further, as the cold night descended upon them. The wind blew in his disheveled hair, and a warm shive ran down his spine as his body attempted to heat up. Yet, he remained unmoving, watching the sickly residents prepare for a night that may as well be their last. The children, although sick and tired, still chased each other as they played. The women watched over them with a faint smile. A small boy who was about half of Kai's size approached him with caution, holding a small fruit. He tore it in two as he arrived next to him, and handed one half to Kai, who subconsciously grabbed it. His pupils suddenly enlarged as he broke out of his daze, and he looked at the boy who had already run away in fear. He stared at the fruit in his, slowly bringing to his face before taking a bite. It's bitter. The tense entrance slowly parted as Kai made his way inside, and noticed the old man sitting next to the fireplace. He made his way over, and sat opposite the elder who raised his head to look at Kai, the heat from the fire disorting the air between them. The buzzing of the cicadas and the owl's hoots broke the tense silence every so often, and Kai pondered the old man's words as he stared at the dancing flames of the fireplace. What do you mean to say? His voice cracked slightly as he turned toward the elder. To not lose hope? To keep fighting and moving forward? What is there to hope for? What should I do? His voice rose into a yell as he jumped up blood dripping from his clenched fists, staining the pelt carpet. The old man raised his head toward Kai, his sunken eyes revealing the sadness hiding deep within his soul. He shook his head as he looked at the boy whose eyes burned with hatred, and he sighed before his lips parted. What can you do right now? Do you want to give up? Your mana veins are crippled, your body barely healed to half a decent state, your mind is a mess too. You want to go and kill Hanyard? Do you really think that by swinging a sword randomly you'll get somewhere? Fool, the only thing you'll achieve is self-mutilation. You will only become weaker. You need to hold on to hope. Hope that you can heal your veins. Hope that you can become stronger. Hope that you will have enough strength to kill that bastard. Kai stared at the fireplace as the old man's words entered his ears and ingrained in his brain, and he softly whispered to himself as a glint of determination appeared in his eyes. Strength. That's right, strength. The old man took a puff from a pipe as he looked toward the ceiling, seemingly reminiscing about a long-forgotten past. I don't know how old I was back then, maybe fifty or sixty it wasn't that rare for me to wander the human kingdom, despite the restrictions imposed on us. It was in one of my outings that I saw her, a girl as beautiful as the full moon. Her eyes shone like the sun, and her smile made me feel something for the first time in my life. Back then I had no responsibilities or family just myself and a derelict home. I wasn't sure how to approach her, but one thing I know is that I never thought about the consequences. He paused as he sighed, taking another puff as he continued. I thought I could run away if push come to shove, after all the Inquisitors had no power in the Vampire Kingdom after all, but I underestimated their viciousness dash. Inquisitors? Kai interrupted with a confused expression. Ah, uh, don't worry about them. They're nothing but a legend now. The old man said before he continued his story. So as I was saying, I eventually had the guts to meet with her after deguising my eyes, and we immediately got along. She was shy in the beginning, real shy, couldn't even get a word out without her running away. But we did start to talk. A few words here, a few words there. It didn't take long for her to fall for me, and I didn't even to use our powers. Kai's lips parted, looking as if he wanted to say something. However, he got shut down quickly by the old man, who didn't seem to want to dwell on the subject. We had been going for half a year at this point. I knew a lot of things about her, but I had to make up things for myself. Lying to her like that didn't feel right, but what other choice did I have? It seemed like your usual day when I went to her house, ready to pick her up for another date, or to help do her chores and whatnot. However, when I got to her house I felt my blood boil, 
My temper got the best of me the moment I laid my eyes on her. She was crying. Her eyes and face were as red as the blood flowing through my veins. Her arms were held tightly by another's, a man that I had never seen before, dragging her away from her home. But I knew what that man was. His shiny black uniform decorated with red roses gave away his identity in a split second, an inquisitor. They were never up to any good. Besides killing and torturing vampires the only other activity they did was torment the population. At that moment, I didn't care about my identity anymore. I didn't think about the consequences nor about the girl. Anger flowed through my veins and before I knew it, the man was dead, laying in a pool of blood and scattered brains. My eyes had returned to normal, and I was surrounded by humans. The girl looked at me with her teary eyes, which were filled with a fear even greater than before. I knew I fucked up, I wasn't safe anymore. I panicked, and so I ran away. Kai listened attentively, almost sitting on his toes as sweat ran down his back. But the old man only took another puff from his pipe and leaned back, struggling to find his next words. What about the girl? Kai asked curiously, now intrigued by the old man's half-finished story. The girl? He sighed heavily before his lips parted. They knew I loved her, she had told them herself. Apparently she hated me now. However, she was foolish. The Inquisitors used her as bait. Of course I went, wishing to save her but there were too many of them. I could hear whispers from the bushes they were hiding in. Their silhouettes through the houses they stole and the girl's anxious expression gave it all away even more. I watched quietly from afar. From a bush hidden behind a rock, I watched her and the others grow restless. But I didn't expect what was about to happen. The old man's voice trembled as his tone turned heavy but he continued in a painful voice. Once the Inquisits grew bored, they attacked the girl. They did unspeakable things to her. Screams of agony, of terror, of despair rang in my ears, but I could do nothing except look away. I hid behind the stone until they were done. Counting the hours, it was no less than seven grueling and painful hours, not only for me but for the girl, who had probably given her last breath by the fifth hour. Kai gasped in shock at the elder's words whose eyes were red with tears. The awkward silence was only occasionally broken by the old man's soft sobs, and Kai could only wait in silence until he calmed down. What about that weird form? He asked after a slight hesitation, and the old man's eyes widened as he stood up, looking sternly at Kai. Don't ever use it again, he ordered simply, and refused to elaborate no matter how much inquired, but ultimately said something that sent shivers down Kai's spine. It's a secret tied to the Genesis. I don't know much about it either so I strongly advise you not to use it. Kai went to sleep after allowing the old man to clean his wounds, feeling perturbed but also slightly excited as he saw life with a different light. Zero. A hunt. Next. Leaves rustled under a young man's feet, his silver hair dancing in the wind as he maneuvered around the dense vegetation with a purple sword in hand. Blood dyed his clothes made out of brown pelts, turning them to a darker shade. The ground shuddered behind him. The sound of cracking branches rang in his ears as he glanced backward, where a huge bear-like creature bulldozed through the flora as it angrily chased him, disregarding any injury to his it may cause itself. Blood dripped from a shallow cut that ran across its stomach, and it let out an aggrieved roar as it gained ground on the boy. The chase didn't last long, however, as the boy stopped in the middle of a clearing where the grass has been flattened, and the ground dyed a dark crimson hue. Kai wore a faint grin on his face as he brandished his sword, which glowed with a faint blue light as the air around it distorted. The bear didn't think much about the situation as its eyes were locked onto Kai, and it let out an angry roar as it ran toward him at full speed. Kai retreated slightly, and took a fighting stance after stopping in front of a tree, watching the beast carelessly approach him as a glint appeared in his eyes. Thirty meters, his heart began to race like never before. An adrenaline cursed through his veins as he prepared to take on the strongest opponent he's had thus far. Twenty meters, he gulped, the sword's hilt trembling in his calloused hands as he clutched it tighter, his body curling up like a spring ready to snap. Ten meters, the huge creature snarled as it opened its jaw, its red fur glowing with an intense light as its speed increased. Five meters, the creature's breath inundated his nostrils as it rapidly came closer, the heat emitting from its fur distorting the air around it, and Kai's heart skipped a beat after being caught unawares. The distance between the two was negligible, as the beast would maim him in less than a second, 
his whole body curled up while waiting for the right moment to present itself. The bear's snout was now less than 30 centimeters away from his body, and the heat emanated from its first scent goosebumps all over his body as the pelt's fur burned slightly. Now, Kai kicked up a small cloud of dust as he jumped, barely avoiding the bear's ferocious fangs by a hair's breadth. The creature, surprised by the sudden turn of events, had no time to react besides trying to halt its moment. However, it was far too late. A loud thud echoed in the forest as the beast's head collided with the trunk of the tree, letting out a muffled, rage-filled scream through its now flattened snout. It jumped on its hind legs, holding its maimed face as it struggled to suppress the pain, and its bloody eyes locked onto Kai's position like an eagle stalking its prey. However, it felt something it hadn't in a long time, fear. In its eyes, this puny human should have been an easy kill, yet it was forced to chase him after its belly has been cut, and now it would need to heal its mangled face. It glared at Kai, who dashed toward it, aiming his sword straight at the wound on its stomach. The bear dodged the strike by a centimeter, and sent its claws flying toward Kai's back. Sparks flew as he blocked the strike with the sword as he turned around and his body trembled as he tried to push back the bear's heavy paw. However, the beast proved to be way stronger than he was. His boots glue with a soft light as they dug into the earth, providing him some much-needed balance, and his sword lit up with a purplish hue as the horrible sound of metal scratching on metal rang in his ears. Kai held the hilt and the blade, pushing it sideways in an attempt to free himself from its clutches. However, the bear was relentless and kept striking the sword faster and faster as its anger rose. It let out an annoyed growl as the mangled flesh that was once its snout glowed with a red light, and a small wisp of fire appeared within. The flame grew larger, until it was the size of a large peanut. Kai's pupils widened in surprise, and he grunted as he undid the enchantment on his feet. He grunted in pain as the bear slashed at his blade grabbing it with its claws and holding Kai as the fire and its mouth got ready to explode at any time. He quickly dashed out from under the bear, giving up on the blade, and the fire beam that shot out of the bear's mouth burned the ends of his hair as he barely dodged the hit. The beast, who had used all of its body weight to lock Kai down, fell to the ground in almost the same instant it shot the fire beam. Ash rose up from the scorched ground as it hit the floor. Kai took advantage of the opportunity and pulled out a short dagger from his waist, jumping on top of the dizzy bear and landing on its neck. He raised the dagger above its head, pointing the blade right between the ridges of its skull, plunging the dagger right in its weak point. Blood sprayed everywhere as the beast's defiant roar reverberated through the air. It jumped to its feet, swaying back and forth as life slowly left its eyes. It threw the bloodied Kai to the ground, and chased him around in a last-ditch effort to kill him, however it was futile. A small river of fresh blood formed in the clearing, bathing the ground in a crimson rain formed from its life force. Falling to the ground, it wanted to let out a last defiant roar. However, the only thing that escaped its mouth was a muffled grunt accompanied by a small surge of blood from its maimed snout. Silence. Kai's rapid heartbeat accompanied by the sound of flowing blood were the only things that could still be heard in the small clearing. He panted as he dragged his feet toward the bear waiting patiently for the blood to finish flowing before approaching the corpse. Another set of footsteps approached the corpse, and Kai broke into a joyous laughter as he retrieved the dagger. Well done, my boy! The old man said as he walked closer, his wand trembling in his hand as he put it away. You took down a second-rank beast with just your body. I never expected that. And trickery. Kai scoffed, but he couldn't hide the pride in his voice. Without using its anger for my own benefit I'm afraid I wouldn't be sitting here now. The old man nodded as his fingers ran throughout he creature's scarlet fur. But don't forget that we're at a natural disadvantage when it comes to bodily strength. Trickery is only natural. And besides, he coughed lightly as he placed his hands behind his back. This is only a cub after all, so of course it would be stupid. What dash? Kai coughed as the old man's voice entered his ears. However his shock was short-lived. His ears perked up as the sound of dragged feet reverberated through the air, and he snapped his head toward the source. Two yellow eyes approached their location from within the darkness, letting out a low growl as its massive frame slowly revealed itself. Crimson dark patches covered its snow-white fur, and its huge stature loomed over the duo. It bared its fangs as it cautiously approached them, walking with its head held high despite its hopeless appearance. Zero.